means is that government expenditure is extremely low. It's about 14% for Nigeria. Compared to other African countries, we're performing significantly worse. So other African countries, about 17%. OECD countries, about or more developed countries, about 19%. The, this graph shows the government expenditure as a share of GDP from 1990 to till date, as well as government revenue as a share of GDP from 1990 till date. And it's surprising to see, or not so surprising to see, that we were spending um, relatively more in the 1990s compared to, compared to now. We also see how expenditure is, um, th the gap between expenditure and revenue has significantly increased. So it's widening. And that's where the increased borrowing is coming from, you know, um, Professor Bayo spoke yesterday about how our central bank is now printing Naira to borrow the government. And that's aside all the external loans, the euro bonds that the, that the um, government is issuing. This shows the, the composition of debts and how debt has increased um, from the 1980s till date. So what we see here is that we've had basically three episodes of debt increase from the mid 80s to the early 90s, the mid 2000s and presently. At, at the moment, domestic debt constitutes a large majority of total debt, about 60%. Domestic debt is the blue block. Now, for external debts, we also see how the creditor landscape has changed over time. So we see how multilateral creditors, which is the red block, okay, I'll just speak until the slides come up. Okay, great. We see how multilateral creditors, which is the red block, now account for a significant majority, about 50% of total debt. And also private creditors um, account for about 35% of total debt. Bilateral creditors, on the, on the other hand, account for only 15%. And so, the, the, um, for instance, the debt service suspension initiative, even though we were eligible to participate, we did not because a lot of the creditors who we owe debts to, i.e. private creditors, did not um, offer debt treatment. Now, what does this mean for the government and also for the average Nigerian? Um, federal government's interest payments as a share of revenue has skyrocketed. So at, in 2022, it was 96% of of um, government revenue. So imagine earning $100 and then you're using, you know, $96 just to service your debts. That leaves very little room for education, health, or whatever development spending. Like I said, this is not the first time that we're entering into a debt crisis. Um, we've, we've had three episodes or two episodes of debt crisis before now. And in the past, we've sought debt restructuring. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but these are the amounts of, of um, debts that, that was restructured or that was treated. Um, but one that I want to point out is the 2005 um, debt, debt restructuring or debt treatments where the Paris Club wrote off $18 billion from uh, standing debt of about $30 billion. Now that will be almost impossible just because we don't owe as much to the Paris Club anymore. Um, again, bilateral debt only accounts for about 15% of Nigeria's total debt. Now, what are the ways um, the paper suggests for us to move forward um, in terms of preventing a, a default, 
in the future and also in terms of aiding restructuring um, if there is a severe liquidity crisis. First, um, states contingent clauses. Oh, okay, let me start with collective action clauses. So these are basically, like most of us know, then these are clauses infused into contracts where decisions made by the super majority of, ben of bondholders, um, say 75% to 85% of bondholders become binding on the other bondholders. So decisions of the, of the terms of the bonds, right? Become binding on the other bondholders. These um, uh, uh, propositions are basically to infuse um, transparency, predictability, inclusivity, um, fairness, uh, uh, speed into the debt restructuring uh, process if need be. The second are states contingent uh, clauses. So basically this means that um, debt obligations are, are tied to predefined triggers, right? Where if say for instance, um, which will be very beneficial to most African countries, they can be tied to a commodity price where if there is an increase in the price of the commodity that a country is dependent on, say oil or copper, what happens in that case is that, uh, you know, debt obligations or debt service payments are halted or depending on the agreements are reduced. The third uh, proposition is uh, growth linked bonds. So basically what this is, is a bond where interest payments and or principal payments are tied to the economic performance of the country. So say um, the predefined trigger is uh, 6%. So if the 6% GDP growth rates, if the country meets 6% um, GDP growth rates, then you pay more uh, 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 interest payments, more in interest payments or more in principal payments. But if you don't meet that growth rates, then you pay less, right? So again, this brings some form of predictability to the, to the entire process. And it also ensures for better debt debts management. Now we've heard so much about the international financial architecture and how it's flawed. And, you know, I, I joined my voice with, with um, the other panelists. Uh, yesterday, I learned more flaws about the system than I earlier um, uh, you know, um, realized. So basically, um, the 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 interests of developing countries are are not at par, or um, are not reflected in the in the international financial architecture. We've seen that we have with how slow paced the common framework is, um, uh, uh, and also with the amounts that are. Uh, eligible for, for debt treatments. Um, here I, I highlight um, seven main issues, um, which in my opinion are, 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 uh, 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 are uh, undermining the system. First, access to concessional finance is limited for a lot of countries, particularly um, middle income countries, lower middle income countries. Um, Second, uh, we talked about this yesterday, there's significant disparity in the SDR allocations. A lot of the SDR, uh, the SDR is allocated to developed countries and they don't use them, right? And at the same time, they don't lend them to, to, to countries who are in need of them. Third, credit rating agencies, again, this was touched on yesterday. Um, it, it was discovered that, uh, it was a UNDP report. It was discovered that if credit rating agencies are more objective in their analysis, they can save African countries about $74.5 billion, which is significant in terms of um, develop, development needs. 
Um, so the, the fourth is the common framework. It's operationalizable, but it's not delivering the fiscal space that African countries need. Fifth, the debt sustainability analysis. Um, it determines whether a country should borrow and also what size of debt relief a country should have, yet it does not fully account for all the country's financial vulnerabilities. And so in a lot of cases, it's, it's, um, it's, it projects that we are more fiscally stable than we actually are. Sixth is the issue of climate finance. Um, it was again touched on yesterday. Uh, but just to highlight it here, a lot of the climate finance available are targeted at mitigation, whereas the continent is in need of adaptation uh, uh, finance. And then finally, financing, particularly from official creditors, are uh, decentralized. Um, there's, there are several implementation channels, and this... Uh, uh, this has given rise to inefficiencies from poor coordination, overlapping mandates, and the rest of them. Now to conclude, um, what can Nigeria do to push the efforts or the discussion or the interventions um, in terms of reforming the international financial architecture? Here, I propose three solutions. First, to involve representative institutions. So what we want is that whatever consensus that is finally reached is inclusive, is representative, it has legitimacy, the results are sufficient, the results are sustainable. And so it's important that we involve representative institutions in the discussions, in the deliberations, in the negotiations, one of which is the Burroughs Club. So I remember a couple of years ago where the development reimagined uh, uh, um, organization started, you know, talking about the Burroughs Club. And I think it was also highlighted yesterday how we have the Paris Club, we have the London Club, but we don't have um, a group of borrowers that can share experiences, um, you know, and push our, our agenda, speak with one voice, push our agenda forward. Second, to promote regional institutions as strong complements to their international counterparts. So um, I remember when the uh, capital adequ adequacy framework um, the MDB's capital adequacy framework uh, reports came in on how the MDBs can increase um, the, the, the amount of finance that they deliver to countries. And it was suggested that SDRs should be lent to the AFDB, the African Development Bank. And the African Development Bank brought out a model on how they can um, multiply whatever SDRs are are giving to them, they can multiply it by four and then unlend it to, to countries, right? So this is just one example, the African Development Bank, the African Finance Corporation as well, the African um, Exim Bank, Afri Exim Bank. Um, and then finally, to advocate for increased availability of information and strengthening surveillance. So data, um, I did a research once and I and you know I found out that or we found out that about nine African countries are not monitoring their debts. They have no zero data on on their debt figures. It's difficult to curtail something that is not being monitored. Um, Nigeria, we, we have a sound, somewhat sound debt management office, and we can help in this regard. Also, analytical capacity. Um, we're talking about the debt sustainability analysis. Do we have a homegrown alternative or a local alternative? Um, credit rating agencies as well. 
can we develop a, a local alternative? I know there was a, there was one in Egypt or Tunisia, but it was bought over by one of the big threes. So that's the summary of, of the paper. Thank you. And I look forward to the successful deliberation. Thank you. Okay, Chit uh, Chitongi will just now be the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak today, and um, in particular, Ndongo and Charles. Um, so my uh, speech today is very straightforward. Griv set uh, the scene yesterday on the date uh, crisis in Zambia. So what I do in this presentation is just to three things. One is I try and put some numbers on the story that um, Grave told us yesterday. And um, I also have a, a lot of cartoons. You would imagine the cartoonists are celebrating uh, to capture the date uh, dynamics on the, on the continent. I also speak um, about the implications, but also the conditionalities. Um, what, what are these conditionalities that are attached to uh, this? Um, yeah, so first of all, to start with, I need to acknowledge that we authored this paper together with um, Howard Stein, uh, who should be around somewhere there. And we agreed that all the errors are his. Right, so the background. Um, of course, Zambia made... Um, you know, media headlines in 2020 as the first country to default during uh, COVID-19. And this was because it failed to remit a 42.5 billion, uh, so 42.5 million coupon that was due in, 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 in October. Um, and since then, Zambia's date has been classified as restricted default, uh, which is perhaps the worst class that you can you can have. But Zambia is not alone. Uh, there, are some, uh, there are six African countries that are currently in debt distress, and 14 are at risk of falling into debt distress. For Zambia, this is not the first time. Um, you heard from Griv yesterday that in the 1990s, Zambia's debt was completely you know, out of control, huge and sustainable, um, uh, with the debt ratio rising up to 500% of GDP and taking up almost 50% uh, of export earnings until the HIPIC and the multilateral debt in relief initiative in 2006. You will see just now uh, that it brought the debt levels uh, quite low, but we saw that beginning to rise again in 2012 with, with the first issuance of the Euro bond of 750 million. Um, yeah, um, but and, and the main argument we make in the paper is that we we need to understand the real causes of this, and there are so many explanations. Our thinking is that the fundamental problem is that across the continent we are still operating 
colonially structured economies. Uh, and those economies are not resilient uh, to any external shocks. Um, and so, you know, we can speak about debt uh, re restructuring today, but that doesn't solve the problem. The problem is, can be solved by transforming the colonial economy into vibrant, resilient African economies. It's a hard thing to do as the African experience has shown, but it can be done. And I think that we should be pushing for that. So we start with explaining four causes of Zambia's uh, debt uh, crisis. And one of them is a fiscal imbalance. Uh, the, the fiscal deficit, of course, was going um, in the opposite direction, rising to 13.5% in um, 2020, partly you know, driven by the COVID-19 borrowing. Um, but that has... Uh, been falling down, partly I think because of the sustained, suspended payments as, 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 as the country waits um, the decisions on the restructured debt. Liberalizing of the uh, capital accounts, this is a major problem uh, that has caused a lot of um, uh, you know, turbulency, particularly in, 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 in terms of capital outflow. And I'll speak to that in, when I come to uh, the categories of uh, creditors for the Zambian economy. The structure of the economy is what I've just spoken. Yeah, that this is the major cause. If 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 Zambia had a more broader production and export base, it was able. It should have been able to withstand the decline in the price of copper that led to the deficits and the crisis that we have. Um, there's also a bigger issue of non-concession uh, borrowing, which has increased. Overall, um, so that's the picture from Zambia's um, um, overall debt, including external debt and domestic debt. So the total debt, this comes from the Ministry of Finance report uh, as of June 2023. I should acknowledge from the beginning that one of the best things that has come out of the IMF engagement with Zambia, which uh, it's rare that you find something you know, good, is that they have forced the Zambian government to actually disclose the debt. And so they publish what they call the debt management report media. And they published, these figures come from the 2023 media report. Um, previously, two years ago, it was difficult to do any research because we didn't know how much Zambia was owed. But because of the, the IMF insisting on transparency, we are not able to access actually from, 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 from the ministry itself. Yeah, so that's what it comes. And, and the composition is about 60% of this is external debt and 40% is um, domestic debt. Um, and of course, uh, you know, Zambia's uh, uh, external debt has consistently been the biggest part of that uh, total debt. Um, and here is just to show that from 2004, we see a high you know, share of external debt, over 100, about 120. But that dropped to almost less than 7% in 2006 with the multilateral debt relief initiative. And we see that actually still remaining low, but we see it going up again from 2012, 2015, and um, external debt, as we speak, constitutes about 60% of total debt. Total debt, again, um, just to, to show there, has risen to about $35 uh, billion, which is uh, almost 120% of GDP. Um, we also need to understand the dynamics, just to show here that uh, external debt was actually, or has been falling down the green um, um, graph there, blind showing that it fell from as high as 80% in, or over 86% in 2012 to just about um, uh, 59, 58% uh, in 2023. And then the other side, we see domestic debt going up, um, again, from very low uh, levels to constitute about 40% of that dynamic. 
there's a cartoon there that, uh, that tells a story. And the story is that by the, the, the time that the new government came into, um, I mean, the, the, the new government came, was inaugurated in 2021, they opened the coffers and they found nothing actually but debt. And so you see the, the, one of the officials there, the president saying, no wonder this guy was so eager to concede defeat because he knew there was nothing left in, 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 in the coffers. Domestic date in terms of its uh, disaggregation, and this comes from the IMF staff report uh, at the end of 2023. Um, and basically we have two components of domestic debt there, the treasury bills and bonds. And the holding of tre treasury, treasury bills are predominantly held by banks and non-bank uh, financial institutions. Um, and the interesting part there, the second part, is, is how they are split. There is a red part there, which is the non-resident component of domestic hoarding of, of, of government securities. And that, at the end of last year, constituted 28% um, of, of total domestic debt, which is uh, actually very high. Um, and the IMF treats that as part of external debt, so they, they, they can't do that. The other point is that there's law hoarding of government securities by the Reserve Bank. The Bank of Zambia, uh, the law, the levels should have been higher, um, actually, uh, and um, in, in, under normal circumstances. The third, the second component of the graph there shows just the rise of domestic uh, borrowing, particularly the Treasury bonds. External debt composition, composition again. Um, so the report we had uh, last year indicated that we have a total of forty-six creditors. And out of those 46, the majority, of course, are private creditors. Uh, and then we have multilateral and bilateral uh, creditors. Uh, in terms of uh, the share, the large part of Zambia's debt is, of course, private debt. And that constitutes about 65% uh, of the total uh, external debt. Um, and, but, but interestingly to note also is the fact that the bilateral is now growing, particularly from 2020 after the default. And this is partly because Zambia is shut out of the um, our, our commercial um, capital market. So they can't borrow from there. And one of the condition, conditionality that I'll speak to, by IMF has imposed is they're they they are not allowed. There's a zero rating on non-concessional borrowing. Uh, there's a cartoon there also that is quite interesting. Uh, this is the Minister of Finance and there is and he's an officer and then he's got these bondholders coming to claim their dues. And he's saying to them, well, wait a minute, we will pay you as soon as there's a payment that we are waiting for. When it reflects, then we'll pay you. And this refers to the, the uh, extended credit facility by the World Bank that when it, 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 when it was um, dispersed, then you're able to uh, obey, sorry, uh, uh, pay out the, 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 bond, the bond holders. And for me, that is worrying because you are, as usual, you're borrowing actually just to service the debt. That's, that's the story behind that. Uh, and then the default. So we do um, acknowledge that there are two different explanations. There's the orthodox explanation, which focuses particularly on the mismanagement and poor governance, it's the internal affairs within Zambia. And our explanation uh, broader, we do accept the domestic uh, mismanagement and corruption, but the main issues are actually external factors, including the way Zambia is inserted uh, in the global economy. Um, and, and just to note there, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, and then we have an interesting also uh, graphic there showing the dynamics around the restructuring of debt, the negotiating with the different creditors. And as you can see from that maze there, that this is a nightmare. You don't know where you are. You, you're really going in circles, back and forth, back and forth. And up to now, Zambia is still hanging in the balance. Um, you don't know whether China will accept. There was a talk yesterday about, you know, having reached a deal with the private creditors. And, but that is very tentative. It depends on the official creditors because the main problem is that the official creditors are, are objecting 
to the terms that the country is agreeing with the private uh, creditors. And, and, and this comparability of treatment is in itself, you know, just an unviable um, um, principle because the, the different dates are negotiated under different conditions. To treat them similarly uh, or commonly is going to be a huge nightmare and we'll see a lot of setbacks. Uh, and then of course, on the other side is, you know, because you are getting this loan from the IMF from the World Bank, you're almost entering the mouth of the shark. Um, and I will explain to you that just in a moment. Then I come to perhaps the most important part of this is the conditionalities. One of the things that I noticed, and I was uh, speaking to Howard yesterday, is that you notice this, that the conditionalities haven't changed. For those of uh, us who have been reading this from the 80s, you can see that they're still playing the same game. Uh, in the 80s, the first one, and I removed there, is subsidy, uh, fuel subsidy and electricity. Um, and of course, you know, I think it's a tragedy for the, for, the, for, for the Zambian case that they actually reduced, forced the government to reduce the cost of the one, one, perhaps one of the most important intervention, which is the pharma input support program. Um, uh, that, that, that is a disaster. And I should acknowledge, as I said at the beginning, that the IMF, you know, accidentally by forcing the Zambian government to be transparent about that, uh, you know, have made it possible for us to analyze this. Uh, the information was just not available two years ago uh, in terms of what they were able to, uh, to, to do. Uh, there's fiscal consolidation, which is, um, again, another name for austerity. And this um, focuses on bringing down uh, by, by government spend, um, tightening of monetary policy, and then the zero uh, ceiling on, so you literally, you know, not allowed to borrow any concession, which in a way, it's, it's, one might say it's a good thing because you are in debt, but it also indicates that there is control. There is, um, that, that the policy is now being controlled by somebody else because we don't know whether uh, this uh, Zambia would have done this if they had the ability to choose among several options. Um, and then the interesting thing at the end there, which was in, in this uh, IMF staff report, at the end they see that uh, after this treatment of debt, and, and it's a three-year program that um, started in 2022 and is expected to end in 2025. And according to IMF, by the end of this, the Zambian government should be should become more prudent than they have been. And where is that? coming from, what's the basis for that? And, and the implications, again, I won't spend much on this, is that the cartoon actually tells us the entire story. You can see there that there's a foreign trip, has a little bit of money allocated, then there's education, has a little bunch, and then children rights, um, a little co few coins, and then research and development, zero. Where is the money going? Debt service. Uh, and then in conclusion, of course, that Zambia uh, at the moment is carrying a huge uh, debt burden, and that has several implications on not just the economy, but the entire Zambian society. Um, and, and, and I think for, as I indicated at the beginning, for us, the big issue is to how do we transform this economy to make it more resilient? Because uh, debt restructuring will provide some immediate relief, but it won't solve the problem. And if we don't solve that, we don't transform the economy, we will be restructuring debt in Zambia five years, 10 years from now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is Brian Campani online? Is he there? Okay. Brian, it's, if you can hear me, it's, uh, you can come on screen and begin your presentation.
Will you hear me if I speak through this mic? Are there? No. Okay, shall I go to the next speaker and come back to him? No. Okay, so then I'll leave that. So we have Ali Zafar now. Um, hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Um, thank you very much. I wanted to thank Ideas for having this amazing workshop conference with people from all over the world so we could share experience. Um, before I begin, I want to tell a story. Ten years ago, I was in Ghana, and I visited the port of Tema, and I saw an Argentinian ship called the Libertad. And I said, what is this ship, Argentinian ship doing in Ghana? And I was told that Argentina had uh, defaulted and the NML and the creditors were demanding to seize any Argentinian asset overseas. And the, sh and the Ghanaians were asked to seize the ship. So I thought this world is really complicated. A Ghanaian, sh Argentinian ship in the port of Tema. So I became very interested in the questions of debt. So my talk today is going to be based on the experience of Ethiopia. I am the UNDP economic advisor in Addis. And for the last one year, we are working very closely with government of Ethiopia in helping advise them on navigating the debt landscape. Um, Ethiopia is one of the countries, the four countries in Africa that have been part of the common framework. Um, Chad, Ga Ga Ghana, Ethiopia, and Zambia. We've heard the Zambia case. And I am going to present our paper, which is which we will share with the, um, the, the, the audience. I'm not going to get very much into the technical numbers, but I'm going to tell the story of what is going on from the ground level. Um, okay, a bit of co um, context. So first of all, um, Ethiopia is a unique country. Ethiopia is probably the only African country that was never really colonized. It has a very kind of inward looking model. And it is one of the countries that had the developmental state model between 20, 2000 and 2020, Ethiopia had one of the highest growth rates in the world. There was a very dramatic expansion of social safety nets under MELES. There was a big expansion in infrastructure and Ethiopia changed a lot. The problem was that the developmental model ran out of steam. How did it run out of steam? It ran out of steam because one was the financing became increasingly hard to get. Two was you had an accumulation of shocks. 2020, COVID. November 2020, Northern Ethiopia war. Ukraine war. Southeast Ethiopian drought. Suspension of ODA, IMF program. The combination of these factors led to a very difficult situation, macroeconomic situation. Ethiopia... What are the debt dynamics of Ethiopia? Ethiopia's debt to GDP is not massive. It is 50%, half divided by domestic, half by external. The problem is liquidity. Between 2023 and 2025, Ethiopia owes close to $8 billion of debt servicing. This is a country that has three or four billion of exports, 17 billion of imports, and a lot of it is the dollars are coming in from the diaspora at five or six billion. So it's an unsustainable structural current account. And so we will ask by government to look at the various policy options. So the UNDP, our proposal was that that a um, the, the the way the DSAs are done, Ethiopia's problem may not only be liquidity; it may be solvency. 
I will get into the lessons afterwards, that we need to kind of look at the DSA more rigorously. Two, that, that countries like Ethiopia cannot afford to put all their money on debt servicing. So what we propose to the government of Ethiopia is a cap on debt servicing and a ring fencing of social expenditures. And you basically, I under two scenarios, one is under the common framework, which is there's a bunching of payments. We propose a flattening of payments. Ethiopia pays less, they cap, and they pay longer term. Two, we propose a haircut, what Guterres and others have argued, the debt is un a certain way to handle the um the what you call it the comparability of treatment but fourth we talked about debt for nature swaps five we talked about bond restructuring now let me go into the 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 the, the six solutions the six key points that i want to make here today i plead guilty i was on the world bank side of the dsas <laughs> for a number of years. And I've realized that the DSAs have a major conceptual problem. They are plagued by an oval optimism bias. Um, the oval optimism bias has to do with exaggerated projections of growth. Some of them sent by the governments also. Two is that they do not incorporate climate shock. Three, the DSAs are done secretly and the private creditors are not involved. So the amount of, 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 of the analysis, what Jayati Ghosh said yesterday, I'm in full compliance, full agreement with, the DSA systematically underestimate the haircut that is needed for countries to go to a stable solvency situation. They did treat the, 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 the common framework is like what in high school we learned the Holy Roman Empire. It's not holy, it's not Roman, it's not an empire. The common framework has nothing in common and there's no framework. Now, so we, the, the fixing of the DSA. Number two is the fiscal adjustment. I'm in big agreement with my friend from Zambia that the IMF is imposing very tight fiscal adjustments. And our proposal is these countries like it you cannot pay, you need to stretch it out. You need at least five, six, seven years of gradual fiscal reduction. All you're going to do is by creating this tight fiscal thing is you're going to have a second problem, a third problem. It is no solution. And you know, even Olivier Bonchard at the IMF has said, we fiscal consolidation does not solve the problem of economic growth. The third point I want to make is on the comparability of treatment. The creditor landscape is not only heterogeneous, but there's an acute trust deficit between the four players. The multilaterals, China, who is the largest bilateral, the Eurobond, and the governments. And no one can agree. In Marrakesh, they tried to find a formula, and the private creditors said, we want a discount rate of 10%. The official creditors say we want 5%. We have come up with a framework to say that look at the total debt service needed and break it up by each of the creditors in proportion. But there's a fundamental philosophical problem, which we see in Zambia, we're going to see in Ethiopia. China and the Paris Club are actually on the same page now. Why? None of them believe in haircuts. They are burned out by HIPIC. They feel that countries overborrowed and they are in favor of maturity extension. 
which means that when Ethiopia went to China and said, can you reschedule the Addis Djibouti railway to 3 billion? China said, we won't reduce the principal, but you can pay us in 30 years rather than 10 years. Um, the private creditors, as we've seen in Zambia and in Ethiopia, they owe $1 billion in euro bond in December 2024. They don't have the money. The question is, the private creditors are willing to take a debt write down, but in return, they want upfront cash, which was the big debate in Zambia. How much upfront cash do you give and how much debt write down do you do? And that formula has to agreed, be agreed by the official creditors. In Zambia, the mathematics of that is unclear. In Ethiopia, the mathematics of that is unclear. Each of the people is scared to pay somebody else. China is scared that the Eurobond people will take advantage. Multilaterals are scared China will take advantage. China is scared everyone else will take advantage. We have an acute trust deficit and Africa is suffering. That, that is the third point. Fourth point is on China. Um, China, is China the global south or the global north? And the question I'm going to ask is, China gives debt to Ethiopia, Exim Bank gives a 3% and calls itself an official creditor. China Development Bank gives a 6% and calls it a private creditor. The Ethiopian government official told me we are negotiating with different parts of the Chinese government. How do you get A, a consolidated Chinese position, B, Chinese willingness to see Africa's problem as a problem of solvency, not of liquidity. The common framework was designed not as HIPIC, but as a framework to give maturity extensions. The, 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 the only in extreme cases do they say solvency is the problem. But we know from looking at the data that solvency is a much more serious problem. It's not only liquidity, even for Ethiopia, I believe they have serious solvency problems. So how do you address the China-Africa? Should it be addressed by all the African countries together with China? This is a puzzle and it's affecting Ethiopia. Five is moral hazard. Um, I am 80% sympathetic to debtors. I understand one creditor concern, which is when HIPIC was done, it was thought to be a one time. There's African governments that have spent the money well and African governments that have mismanaged the money. How do we differentiate between the two? And the, the question is, the rate of return, the rate at which African governments borrowed was five, six percent at a time when capital was very, very cheap in the world. And their investment returns have been one, two percent. In Ethiopia, they invested in industrial parks, sugar companies, and many of these projects have not come to maturity. Many of these projects have not delivered. Is there a, a problem on the borrower side, on the financial modeling, on how you use the money, even assumed as a haircut? How do we assume in 10 years, we don't have a third debt crisis? So that's more hazard. And the final point I wanna make is um, on, on the UN and the oversight. It's abundantly clear that the international financial architecture is failing Africa. Part of the problem is that the IMF, which is at the center of it, is, too, is not able to be a neutral party. So uh, we are proposing UN or some other body to be able to be a repository, A, for all, all the information on debt of countries, B, of trying to reconcile claims between China and the multilaterals and others, um, because the, the IMF is very, officially they can't say it, but de facto rescuing private creditors is part of the IMF MO because of the shareholder structure. So how do we get uh, oversight 
of independent academics, UN, other people, to make sure that we have an international system that is neutral and fair between debtors and creditors. And so our work in Ethiopia has been really to A, to help support Ethiopian government in protecting themselves from some of the parameters of these discussions, and two, to kind of advance away moving forward. We're in a quicksand. The more we try to get out, the more we sink. Zambia, endless discussions, Chad, Glencoe refused to accept the parameters. Ghana, there's inconsistency. Ghana had a haircut um, for the domestic banking sector. In Zambia, the, lo the foreign currency, the foreign owners of local currency debt were exempt. So if we're going to create arbitrarily political parameters, we lose the element of neutrality. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So, um, is Alameyu there? Alameyu Geda? Yeah, yes, I am. Yes, I am. <clears throat> ah, okay. So, uh, um, we have Alameyu Geda now. Please, if you could. Uh, can, can, I, can I share my slides with you, please? Yeah, I think you should be able to do it in a minute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are we ready? Yeah, I'm. I'm ready. If you, if you allow no, me no, to I'm share not, that. Oh, no, no, you can try and share your slides, please. Okay, we can see yeah. it. Thank you. You can see it. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I should say thank you very much for the organizers for allowing me to present this paper. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually lucky that uh, uh, Ali has already given you a good idea of the Ethiopian debt. What I, we did a comprehensive study on Ethiopian debt one on the drivers of Ethiopian debt, and the second one on the, the gross impact of the debt, and this, the third one, the institutional challenge of the debt. And what I will present to you is basically based on this uh, Ethiopian case study, detailed case study, as well as uh, the African literature uh, on the drivers of African debt, I will try to give you <clears throat> What are the major drivers of the African debt? Pretty much, you know, Emma said in, in a presentation that there is a lot of similarities across the continent. So I'll try to summarize those major drivers. And then I'll I'll show you that the DSA analysis, which is which is very central, the debt sustainability analysis, as well as you know, the policy prescription that followed. In short, as the Zambian colleague said, austerity policy doesn't take really these drivers into account. Therefore, it has a problem. That's pretty much my presentation. So uh, um, the first part is uh, profile of the date. So I don't want to uh, bother you about the uh, profile to save time. But basically, I have a profile of the date here. And the slides will be, and the paper will be presented. So let me... I did it for the whole the whole Africa. I generalized it to the African level. Uh, so I will just jump the profile and go to uh, the drivers. Now, based on Ethiopian case study and this literature, the African data literature, as well as analysis of the macroeconomic trends uh, across the continent, uh, what I learned uh, is that the fundamental, one of the fundamental drivers of the African days in the last couple of decades is trading in primary commodities and shocks. And as you see here, African growth basically systematically goes with uh, commodity price growth, terms of trade growth, 
as well as export growth, value value of export growth. So on top of that, when there are shocks, you can see here the global economic shock 2009 and you have the COVID shock here. Whenever the shock happens, uh, you know, the, the growth goes down and every, every macroeconomic variable goes down and the debt burden indicators go up. So one of the major drivers is trading in primary commodities as well as shocks. This is from the whole literature uh, on African debt. The second driver is the changing composition of the African debt, uh, both towards China and also to private creditors. And the Chinese debt, as Ali mentioned, it's difficult to get the perfect information. Uh, uh, it's not transparent, but usually it's very expensive. Usually LIBOR plus three, very in Ethiopian case, uh, limited grace period to three years and limited uh, maturity period about 12 or 15 years compared to uh, you know IDA loan of 0.7 interest rate Ten, about 10, great, 10 years grace period and 35 years uh, maturity period. So uh, Ethiopian debt is shifting, uh, the African shift debt is generally shifting toward this Chinese shift, Chinese debt, as well as private debt, which are expensive, as you can see from this graph. Uh, and again, when you see the private debts, bondholders across the continent dominant. And the private debt is about forty percent of about forty two percent of African debt right now, uh, and this is the expensive. So this changing composition uh, uh, is also creating a huge the major driver. And not only that, there is also a growing domestic debt. So when we say composition, we have three things: to China, to private creditors, as well as domestic debt, including domestic debt owned by foreign. Uh, entities. So this is the second driver. The third driver is the significant investment saving gap. As you see here, uh, this graph basically shows you the investment saving gap in sub-Saharan Africa across the continent. Uh, uh, and then you know, this is basically every country wants to grow really at high rate and fast, you know, owing to this huge poverty and therefore, everybody wants to raise that poverty significantly. But the saving, both private and public, is low. The private because of low income, low poverty, uh, high poverty, and the public because of state capacity. So the tax to GDP ratio that Emma mentioned is across the board. Right, the African average is about uh, when it is good, it's about fifteen percent. In countries, it goes as low as six percent, like Ethiopia. So that. Basically, also show you not only low saving but also low state capacity. So this is again uh, the other uh, driver, the third driver. Now the fourth driver is related to institutional capacity. You know, uh, like um, growth forecast, rosy growth forecast, which shows you know debt carrying capacity, but when they not realized, uh, they become a problem. Uh, debt management, uh, although like in Ethiopia, for instance, we have a nice, excellent uh, debt management department, the staff, the capacity to forecast, to make analysis, as Ali said, to do a DSA by, by themselves, usually I made that for them, uh, is, is, is a problem. So that capacity. Now, geopolitics also matters. Like in Ethiopia, this pretty much summarizes what I call fundamental cause of politics related to governance problem, corruption. Uh, Ali, may, Ali, Ali forgot to mention that. You know, I had a paper, a whole paper about that, chronic capitalism under developmental state model. So that corruption also means, you know, you borrow money and before you start paying, uh, you, you didn't you know, follow the project properly and then uh, you reach a time where you have to pay the date, but you know the sugar factories or, or all those investments are either run down by corruption or cannot be completed on time. So that cronyism also matters. So governance is an issue related to institutional issue. Geopolitics also changes the composition of debt uh, as well as the level of debt, as well as the source of debt. 
Like, let me give you an example, just one little example in Ethiopia. When the Malas government came, the pr previous government, initially the IFAs were behind him and gave a lot of money. In 2005, there was an election and that government became violent, killing a lot of people on the street. Then they hold the money. The moment they hold the money, uh, the government shifted to China and private debt. And you would you would uh, see a huge jump in debt from the central bank and domestic debt, uh, as well as Chinese debt. Uh, and it, therefore, you know, this geopolitics also shifts the composition of debt uh, and is another, another driver. Now, commodity exports import dependency, significant import dependency. Uh, like in Ethiopia, for instance, as Ali said, we import 17 billion, but sell 3.5 billion on average annually. Uh, that means if you want to reduce those importers, 85% uh, um, of them are in elastic demand. Fuel alone is 20% of those importers. Fertilizer is close to one, 2 billion, 1 1.5 to 2 billion. Medical food, so the, almost 85% are. Uh, strategic or necessities. So that kind of import dependence uh, gives you unsustainable uh, trade deficit or balance of payment deficit. Now, on the right side, you see some ameliorating factors like remittance, uh, foreign direct investment, and concessionality of the debt. And if, there is, if you manage also to get high tax and less spending, which is difficult in most countries, that could ameliorate the, 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 the debt problem. But uh, pretty much that's the fundamental driver. Now, we did uh, in Ethiopia, and uh, I don't, I, I don't want to bore you with the details, but pretty much we found statistically significant uh, confidence, which means we proved you know those fact, those drivers earlier were fundamental drivers of debt, like trade deficit, terms of trade, deterioration, the saving investment gap, the geopolitical factors, the fiscal deficit, growth, all these factors, we found them statistically also significant explainers of debt in Ethiopia. So like in this graph, you can see this is a jump. You can see a jump on the right hand side. You can see a huge jump is after 2005 election when government for geopolitical reasons shifting to domestic debt and uh, Chinese debt. Before that, you can see here, you know, the IFAs, the moment this government came, the previous government came, actually uh, loan from IFAs jumped by 140%. So now that's pretty much the drive. Now, does the, my second question is, does the DS, the debt sustainable analysis framework, as well as the policy that follows uh, when a country is in found in debt stress, capture those fundamental drivers that I found in the African debt literature and also in the European case study. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It doesn't. Like, uh, you know, the standard, uh, I don't want to bore you again with the algebra, but the standard debt uh, uh, sustainability analysis based on this uh, framework, this formula that you have at the top. And, you know, the graph below shows you the African Development Bank application of that for African debt, uh, basically saying that you know the fundamental, they call it the the date dynamic the date dynamic arithmetics, and you know IMF and World Bank an excellent tool to, to produce this stuff, but theoretically, theoretically speaking, they are derived from what is called the date dynamics that I gave you at the formula at the top. I don't want to go to the details of the discussion in the paper I have discussed in detail uh, how this thing is computed and what have you. Now, the point is, for instance, that the African Development Bank latest analysis of drivers of public debt dynamics in Africa shows you, you know, the fundamental driver re recently is exchange rate depreciation. Uh, and then, uh, as you said, this one, uh, the brown one, it, primary fiscal deficit, and then uh, GDP deflator, and interest expenditure. These are the primary, but the, the significant one is the exchange rate depreciation. So that's how they do. Uh, this is what IMF does. This is what World Bank does. This is what African Development 
development does. That means they don't talk about the drivers that I showed you earlier. And then they come up, when you go to the details of DSA, they, they do what they call country classification scheme. They classify countries as weak, medium, strong. How, the, how do they do that? You know, they do what we economists call a Tobit regression. But basically from that regression, when I examined it, basically the biggest weight is derived for CPI indicator, the World Bank uh, policy and the capacity indicator. I think 42% of the weight is next is reserve. Now this, when you deeply examined it, what you understand is that it is systematically internally biased toward, toward this external debt and extern, external debt payment because reserves got something like 43 weight in this, in this computation of weak and strong. Then on the base of this, they map that with a debt indicators in the, as, as shown in the in the lower table, and come up, you know, the the debt burden, uh, the debt uh, risk assessment, and they come up, they give you this uh, uh, low risk of external debt distress, moderate risk, high risk for external, and again they do low overall risk for public debt distress, moderate overall risk. They give you this classification, and invariably, all African countries uh, fall by the structure of this computation uh, on on uh, on the weak uh, on the weak uh, category. <clears throat> uh, now, what is the weakness of this thing? Just, I mean, uh, I got details in the in the in the paper. You'll see, but. The three major weaknesses that I witnessed is one, in the light of the Africa's major drivers of debt, the DSA rely most on symptoms and liquidity condition to service external debt. Hence, uh, it focuses on short-term solution and not in comprehensive, including domestic and private debt, not in a comprehensive way. So as a result, you know, given their uh, assessment, even if, the whole African date is canceled today because they don't address the root cause of the problem. We will end up having a decrease, you know, in the 10 years uh, or so. Second, related to the point one, the, the proposed policies derived from this debt sustainability analysis have failed to address the debt problem in the last man. That's why we'll have this repeated crisis, uh, even if we have debt relief like he peak. The third, the IFS prescription solution, uh, as the Zambian colleague showed us, the austerity basically also invariably lead to led to contraction of the economy, depreciation of the currency, and depreciation of the currency usually leads to inflation, narrow fiscal space, including reduced public investment and reduced public spending. So, you know, the solution is focused more on symptoms and liquidity, and therefore it appears bailing out the lenders, basically. Therefore, you, we end up without addressing the, the root causes. Now, when you go to technically, the weakness includes, the weakness includes the central role of CPI and the reserves in the composition, what they call composition index. Uh, you know, the CPI has a particular way of perceiving the economy, usually liberal ideology, liberal economics, you have an alternative economic, say, heterodox policy, uh, it, it, the system punish you. The competition system punish that country to be a weak, a weak data. Second, coverage. It doesn't cover, for instance, domestic and private, which are becoming more important, despite, uh, uh, despite together, you know, the claim. Could you, could, you, could, yes. could you take two minutes more? How many minutes? Two minutes more? Yeah, I can. I can do Second, the structural drivers and the structural policy solutions, disproportional effect of shocks are not taken on into account. Treatment, treatment of diverse African countries in one category, treatment of state owned enterprise as a problem. What is the implication? I think, uh, according to my analysis, it is imperative to reform the debt sustainability framework uh, and to carry out a comprehensive critical study 
and to develop a policy direction informed by the reality of African debt. It doesn't according to me captures the reality of uh, African debt. Second, shocks are important. Therefore, shocks should be treated differently. Like for instance, altering the, the rules when shock happens or emergency credit facility. Third, the associated policy prescription need to be also uh, to take into account diversity of Africa and open to uh, other heterodox policies. And finally, uh, the reformed uh, debt sustainability framework need to focus on improving and building government uh, capacity and institution. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, I'm done. Yeah, thank you. Speakers in this session and three speakers in the next session. So can I leave one of the speakers for the next session because we haven't yet got him because we've reached the end of the time. So I wanted to have some discussion. Yeah. So um, I think we can take about um, 10 minutes. Yeah. 10 minutes for some comments, questions, uh, arguments, whatever. Okay. Shall we start from here? Thank you. Good morning. Um, well, thank you very much for the very interesting presentations. Um, I think that especially um, the presentation on Nigeria made me, and, and I think it's it's um, a commonality across every country, and believe it or not, for some Africans, also Latin America, we are all suffering from similar diseases. Uh, which are some of them self-inflicted, some of them are, and, but most of them also uh, come from abroad, yeah, from, especially from the north. I was trying to reflect on, on your presentation. You were talking about great rating agencies and their impact, and, and I was wanting to add as well some, some questions we were having in Argentina with MDBs, great ratings, where MDBs are all aiming, even including the African Development Bank to the AAA, the best uh, credit ever, rating ever, and how this also has an impact on, on our countries and on, on the funding of our countries. Um, also on, on climate finance, what we see is that most of it is uh, for mitigation. Even the African Development Bank some time ago, I'm not sure it, it really still developed uh, on, that, on that part, but was adopting GAG emission uh, measures for those projects which were environmentally more risky when Africa only has 4% of the world emissions. So even your own institutions and our own institutions, our regional institutions are adopting this framework, which is for mitigation rather than adaptation. Um, and also, um, I, I was just wondering, uh, what space do you all see? I mean, this is like a common common framework. I was working a part, a small part of my life, I was working on South-South cooperation and seeing how few cooperation there is between Latin America and Africa and how we can all talk about, we can all see that this North is cooperating amongst themselves. Uh, maybe not so much uh, with China, China's a different, but, um, uh, and, but yes, uh, how can we start really for real cooperating uh, uh, in, a, in a positive way to really try to confront because the challenges are the same for all of us, uh, all of us global how of course each country has its commonalities its, uh, and its particularities, but we have, we all face very similar challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Can I start right at the back, if you don't mind? Yeah. Thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. My name is Bismarck Adungo Ayonpo. I work for a civil society organization called Northern Petros Research and Advocacy in Ghana. I'm sure before and after the structural adjustment programs, the economic recovery programs, the program of action to mitigate social costs of adjustment. And after the HIPIC initiatives, 
where, in my words, our debts were forgiven and were asked to go and sin no more. We knew the drivers of our external debt. My first question is, what are we not learning to be able to see these drivers of our external debts as the structural causes of it and to address it once and for all so that 5, 10, 15, 20 years time, we don't come back here to talk about African debt crisis. My second thing is, question is, in the analysis of the drivers of our external debt, how will we rate corruption as a driver or a contribution? Um, here in Ghana, there is available literature that says that on an annual basis, after every 12 months, we lose 3 billion US dollars to corruption. And we decided to go for 3 billion from IMF. One can make a simple, conclusive statement that we are simply going to borrow with conditionalities to come and replace what we are willfully losing out. My last one is... Yeah, can you please... Uh, because we... Okay. So the last one is, we are left with six years to achieve the sustainable development goals. In the midst of this African debt crisis, what is the best way forward that Africa will still be able to achieve that? Since we're all singing the song, leave nobody behind. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yeah, read... Rich. Oh, can I, because he's been putting up his hand for set quite some time. No, uh, can, yeah. can, can we keep it? I'm, I'm sorry to be like that, but only because we don't have more than 10 minutes. We already crossed. But I thought he, he was going to... Yeah. Come back. Thanks. Uh, my name is Rich Nkosi from Pretoria. Um, Nigeria, just a quick one. Uh, are there ways in which you can increase your uh, tax regime? I mean, tax system so as able to widen the net. Uh, on Zambia, uh, Oman, uh, can you just give us a sense, a deeper sense? You you argue that debt destruction does not solve our problems. Can you just uh, deepen our uh, the conversation in there, Ali? as well as uh, Aliyehu on Ethiopia. Uh, major conceptual challenges uh, with DSA. Um, again, if you can just clarify that. For you, Aliyehu, you put a mathematical um, formula uh, on the screen there. Obviously, you didn't talk to it and began to elaborate the weaknesses of, uh, of the debt sustainability analysis. Uh, perhaps if you can talk to um, the assumptions behind that mathematical formula, in my view, it is that formula and the assumptions of it that is so central to the challenges that we face here in Africa and perhaps in the rest of the developing world. Please just uh, uh, give us some assumptions there and, uh, uh, and also see how we can begin to, to, to resolve the problem. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I can only take one more, maybe, or two more. I, uh, there's one person who's been putting up his hand there, then I come to you, then I, three more. Yeah. Okay. Because I, they also need to reply. <laughs> Thank you, moderator. My name is Canton Salif Yusuf. I think the conversation here has been very deep. And for me, the discussions that I, uh, that I have had this morning tend to focus more on the international financial architecture. And they both looked at the, uh, the low tax mobilization and a host of things which, in their view, probably has contributed to the debt crisis. I want to find out. We have, this is not the first debt crisis. We have been on a trajectory for 
couple of decades. Beyond these issues that we're bl blaming the international financial structure, we're blaming, is it really the case that we are African countries are incapable of mobilizing the needed resources? What we are mobilizing is not enough or the international architecture is not working for our interests? Or we have a peculiar issue we have not figured out? Because I have heard one of the uh the discussions suggest that even if we wipe away African debts to zero today and give ourselves the next three years, we're going to pile up debt again and the debt probably will be much more than we have seen. What is the missing? What are we missing out? And how can our discussions here not focus on only externalities? but also look inward within our own selves, our systems and structures, and how we do things as a people. What can we do differently so that even beyond this generation, we will not continue to have a debt crisis that we cannot figure out how to deal with it? Thank you. Um. Ok, bonjour, je vais m'exprimer en français. Donc, euh, euh, je remercie encore euh, Aïdias pour cet espace, euh, mais je voudrais faire euh, des suggestions. Euh, quelle est l'interaction entre Aïdias et les structures de base qui travaillent sur les thématiques de la dette comme nous, par exemple? Afrodad est là, peut-être le, le représentant de l'Afrodad qui est là, moi je ne le connais pas. Mais Afrodad est présentement à Abidjan, en Côte d'Ivoire, une formation à l'intention des journalistes économiques sur la thématique de la dette. Mais c'est moi qui ai fourni la liste des journalistes économiques à Afrodad, la formation qui se tient actuellement en Côte d'Ivoire. Alors, euh, les étudiants sont dans cette salle, ils sont nés endettés. Nos universités sont en train de fabriquer des chômeurs. Alors, la dette est très technique et politique. Je suis sûr et certain que les étudiants n'ont pas compris l'essentiel de ce qui se dit ici. Qu'est-ce que c'est qu'une dette Qu'est-ce que c'est qu'une restauration Qu'est-ce que c'est que le club de Paris Qu'est-ce que c'est que le club de Londres Etc. Etc. Les intervenants doivent donner eh, la définition de ces concepts-là, en tout cas pour les étudiants qui sont dans cette salle. Ça, c'est très important. Également, il euh, y a un intervenant qui a dit que le FMI n'est pas neutre. Je suis d'accord avec lui parce que nous, on a dit que le FMI ne peut pas être jugé et parti. On ne peut pas confier la résolution de la crise de la dette au Fonds monétaire international et au Club de Paris qui sont à la fois jugés et partis. Impossible. Can, can we, can... Impossible. On voit aussi que tous les États africains sont en train de s'endetter à un taux d'intérêt supérieur à celui de sa croissance économique. Tous les économies qui sont dans cette salle le savent. Et économiquement, lorsqu'on s'endette à un taux d'intérêt supérieur à celui de sa croissance économique, on ne peut pas s'en sortir. Impossible de s'en sortir. Donc, j'aimerais aussi proposer qu'on puisse donner beaucoup de temps au débat. Parce qu'on donne beaucoup de temps aux interventions, nous, nous avons des choses à dire. Nous sommes là pour régler les problèmes de l'Afrique. Parce que nous sommes dans un monde où on aime l'Afrique sans les Africains. C'est ce qu'a dit Samir Amin. On aime l'Afrique sans les Africains. Et il faut sortir dans ce paradoxe-là. You know, may Merci. I request you? Yeah, thank you. Um, are you willing to wait till, to pose your question later or, or quickly, please? Very quickly. Euh, je suis Taoufik Ben Abdallah, je fais partie d'un think tank GI40 euh, à, à Tunis, sur les politiques euh, publiques. Euh, ma question s'adresse à l'intervenant qui, qui est intervenu par, euh, euh, par vidéoconférence. Euh, sur, euh, quand il a essayé euh, de de nous donner un aperçu sur la dette d'un point de vue euh, continental. Je m'interroge sur euh, deux aspects et j'aimerais bien qu'il m'éclaire 
euh, là-dessus. Est-ce qu'il voit une différence fondamentale euh, entre la nouvelle dette africaine et celle qui avait existé euh, dans les années 90 et 2000 euh, Le contexte a totalement changé et on peut s'interroger euh, si euh, la formation de la dette obéit aux mêmes règles euh, et si les réponses euh, à la dette par le continent sont du même euh, ordre. La, la deuxième chose à laquelle je, je, euh, je, je m'interroge, je vois, je vois que dans les années 90-2000, you know, to... oui, yeah, I, I will finish. Euh, actuellement, on voit bien que euh, le rôle de la Chine est plus important, que la dette privée est plus importante que par le passé, que la dette intérieure aussi joue un rôle euh, très important. Et j'aimerais vraiment qu'il me donne une réponse là-dessus. Et je finis par dire, la mondialisation est passée par là. La mondialisation est passée par là. On a connu tout un mouvement de dérégulation, de libéralisation, qui ont, un, qui ont eu un impact certain sur la, la capacité des États à accéder euh, aux ressources. Et j'aimerais aussi qu'il m'éclaire euh, sur ce phénomène-là. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't, you know, we don't have so much time, you know, maybe three minutes each and uh, otherwise later you can meet up with people and give them the answers. Uh, thank you so much. Really great questions. I'll respond to the questions directed at me. Um, With regards to the potential role of South-South cooperation, I do see um, so many opportunities for collaboration. Um, if you notice in the recommendations that I put forward, I didn't put out a brand new agenda or a brand new um, uh, proposal, right? Um, I identified ways where we can push existing proposals. One of the proposals that I think works is the Bridgetown initiative that was proposed by Mia Motley. Um, and then um, I, other areas for collaboration includes information sharing and um, provision of technical assistance. With regards to the AFDB putting up um, uh, GEG emissions targets in their uh, 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 agenda or their proposal to curb um, carbon emissions. What I would say to that is, I know the bank works on adaptation finance, provides adaptation finance, but at the same time, they also have to, to an extent, get in line with global practice. Um, again, they have international shareholder, shareholders that are non-African. Right. So that's what I think is, you know, going on yeah, at the background there. And then um, with regards to the credit rating agencies, we're not saying we should scrap credit rating agencies because they do perform a vital role. So they assess risks of um, financial institutions, countries in order to know um, what institution or country is eligible for finance, um, the amount of finance, size of finance, and then the interest as well. Um, these regional institutions, whether it's the AFDB, like you pointed out, they want this triple A status so they can get finance more cheaply and then on, on lend to, to countries. So what we're saying is there should be Um, objectivity and a sy systematic revision to their whatever model they are using, right, which is basically unknown. And then finally, to the question on tax, um, how the country, how Nigeria hopes to improve its abysmally low um, tax revenues. The Ministry of Finance out some initiatives in the past. One um, was a tax amnesty program where previous tax defaulters were asked to come um, uh, uh, put down how much they owe and then uh, the, the, their debt obligation or their tax obligations 
will be reduced. Um, what I would suggest is to move that forward. It's important that we bring micro, small, medium enterprises into the formal economy as much as possible, and then follow that up with improved data and technology in order to effectively monitor and enhance tax compliance. Those will be my two suggestions in addition to what is already been done by the Ministry of Finance. Thank you, over. Three minutes. Okay, great, three minutes. Um, first question is how can Africa avoid a return to debt? I spent a lot of time in Asia um, in the last five, 10 years. And you look at countries like India, you look at countries like Vietnam, you build your indigenous capacity. The, the um, Indonesia was a rice importer and they became food self-sufficient in rice. India is the world center of BPO and services. Um, Vietnam, which was nothing 30 years ago, makes 240 billion in exports. So you build, you industrialize, you build an economic base that's more than commodity price fluctuation. Commodity prices are not controlled by African governments, so they are victims of volatility. Two is you negotiate. Um, Mauritius negotiated sugar protocols. When African government signed the Eurobond, at a world when the capital was 0%, why pay six? Why not pay three or two? Um, and the third is um, work together. Like was said, the EU is a block. The gain, we have strange splits in the continent, Francophone Africa versus Anglophone Africa, the North versus the South. Africa needs to become more of a unified block. So that's the, that's the first thing we can get into that. The second point is, um, on the DSA. The DSA is a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets are very sensitive to parameters. If you say that your exports are going to increase a lot and your growth is going to increase a lot, your debt service to export becomes lower. When your denominator is inflated, the numerator the ratio is lower, so you don't cross the threshold. It's a formula that if you cross the threshold of the, the many thresholds, then you're considered at a rate of debt distress. But um, the problem in the DSA is everyone inflates the denominator and makes the countries look like they have a problem of liquidity when the problem is of solvency. Um, we can discuss afterward with a spreadsheet. Um, je veux répondre en français sur la question. Je suis entièrement d'accord avec vous que le système doit changer. La famille ne peut pas être le centre. La famille peut faire l'analyse technique, mais on a besoin de quelqu'un de neutre pour vraiment faire un rapprochement entre les créditeurs et les détenteurs. Et je veux revenir sur une autre question parce que moi, j'ai travaillé beaucoup en Afrique francophone. On voit maintenant en Sénégal, on voit maintenant dans le Sahel, on voit des changements de asymétrie de pouvoir. Ça veut dire la négociation entre le monde international et les pays africains commence à changer. Il y a des nouveaux acteurs dans le monde. Il y a les Chines, il y a l'Arabie Saoudite. Nous sommes dans un monde qui est changé. Et les pays africains doivent, okay. les pays africains doivent trouver leur solution indépendante dans ce monde qui change. Merci. Thank you. Just uh, two comments on the rating. I think we now know that the credit rating are biased against African debt. That's the starting point, and they'll never really do a good job. We we have literature that is showing that um, we we pay a lot more debt, you know, comparable to other countries with similar, you know, uh, microeconomic fundamentals. I won't go into the details of that. Um, the African premium, which is uh, now you know part of the literature, 
has shown that um, we are biased from the beginning. It's, it's, it's a perception bias that we face. So graduate ratings are a huge problem for the African day. But that's, for me, that's just a symptom. The bigger issue, and to respond to Rage's question, is we have to look at um, how does the continent get into a situation of debt? They get into a situation of debt because our earnings are lower. And our earnings are lower because we are only exporting commodities. And as, as Ali said, we don't control the price of commodities. So how do we solve that? We have then to build productive capacities for us to process, to manufacture. And, and that's what I mean by transforming the colonial economy. The colonial economy was set to treat Africa as a source of raw materials. And it worked because that's the logic that you transport the raw materials to Liverpool for processing of palm oil and into soap, right? Now, that benefited, of course, the European countries, but it never benefited the African countries. And yet, we are still doing the same thing. We are, we are transporting gold for polishing in Israel, into Israel and Germany and India. And, it, and by just polishing that piece of stone, India captures 65% of the value chain. Why can't Ghana polish that gold? Cocoa is an example. It's a, it's a, it's a $2 billion business. Ghana gets 2% of that. If Ghana was to grind the, 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 the cocoa bins and, and, and add, even just grind it, you, you increase the value that you get from there to about 16%. If you actually go into even manufacturing chocolate, you increase the value share to 30 35%. And that cautions you from being vulnerable by selling just cocoa. So, so that's the logic I'm, 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 I'm arguing for, that uh, we need to transform the colonial economy because it's not working for us. It was not meant to work for us. Thank you. Uh, Professor Geda, three minutes for you, if you're there. Uh, good. Uh, yeah, I'm there. Uh, I think um, I will just focus on one of the questions. Uh, the assumption behind the formula of the DSA. Um, according to my opinion, actually this formula theoretically is meant for developed countries with convertible currency. Uh, so one of the assumption is, you know, basically, if the real the real interest rate and the growth of the GDP as well as primary deficits are the core variables in the equations. So if you do good there. It shows you you are carrying your debt carrying capacity is fine. If you're not doing that, it shows you it is bad. And what does that mean for Africa? It means that non convertibility of our currency is not taken on board. Number one, number two, it doesn't take into account the problem that the Zambian colleague just mentioned: our dependence on commodities and the vulnerability of uh, these uh, commodities to global. Uh, price, global commodity price. If uh, in 2012 and 13, when the commodity price collapsed, African GDP growth collapsed by 50%. That means your debt carrying capacity deteriorated as much. Uh, that doesn't take into account. It doesn't account the diversity of countries in the continent, you know, fragile countries, import, uh, uh, resource rich countries, resource poor countries. Uh, all are or factor driven countries, investment driven countries, all are lumped into one category. And finally, uh, it also doesn't in take into account the fundamental causes like significant investment saving, stagnant export, and structural trade deficit. So, what my proposal was let us modify it, let us do a critical study of this and modify it in such a way that it takes on board these fundamental factors. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so that brings to an end this session. We will have a 15 minute break for coffee and be back at 11.15. Uh, I've tried my best to, <laughs> to be on time, but uh, there's an announcement uh, for those of you who are fasting. If you give your name at the counter, the hotel is willing to pack some food for you to have later. So you just can go and meet people at the counter and put in your names in case you'd like to avail of that facility. Thank you.
Yep.
me. I'm having the same problems as Jason, so I was told to stand to the right of the podium so you can see me. Uh, welcome to the second set of case studies. I have on the screen Brian Kampanje, um, Yan Liang, but she will come up in a second, Howard Stein, and Raymond Frempong. So we'll start with Brian, who's on Zoom. Brian is a visiting professor in accounting and finance at Malawi Assemblies of God University, but also founder and managing director, managing editor of Mergers, Acquisitions and Disposals Journal. Um, his focus is on publishing commercial and sometimes social matters affecting Malawi by bringing out practical solutions and novel ideas. He will be speaking to debt restructuring in Malawi, and we will invite him now for his 15 minutes. This is the last session between now and lunch, so it's a tough one. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit tough. Howard has pleaded for mercy, <laughs> um, but I will be a little bit tough so we can keep time also for people online and that we can have you fed. Brian. Brian, uh, please hold for a little bit. We can't hear you. They're just fixing the sound. Okay. All right, over to you, Brian. Sorry, Brian, give us one minute. We still can't hear you. Hey, can you speak up? 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 Can you check your mic, Brian? In Zoom settings, you may have to increase the volume of your mic. In Zoom audio settings, we can't hear you. So Brian, we're really sorry about that, but we will now ask Howard to come up. You don't get Brian's time. <laughs> but Howard will be presenting on a Green African Development Bank. Howard Stein is a professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies and 
and the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Michigan. He's a development economist educated in Canada, the US and the UK. He has published more than a dozen books and edited collections and more than 125 journal articles, book chapters and reviews. He has held various academic appointments at the University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. He taught Tsubashi University, Japan, Sussex University, Trinity College, Ireland, University of Lisbon, and many others. Um, and welcome him to start his 15 minutes. <laughs> Uh, Chris, Crystal, for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, they, they originally gave me uh, 12 minutes, but I bargained hard for 15 minutes, which after you listen to this, perhaps that's too much, but we'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking Ideas and uh, thanking Charles Abugre and Don Gosila. And, and also, of course, I think which is also important to mention uh, is IDEN, the newly launched uh, Ideas uh, Africa Network. Uh, to promote alternative economics. Um, I, I want to begin by, uh, first of all, uh, acknowledging my co-author, Michael Albisi. Uh, he couldn't join us, which is really good because he's not here to defend himself when I accuse him of the source of the errors. At least when Horman accused me of the source of the errors, I was here to defend myself. So, uh, And then uh, I want to actually point to uh, a second issue, which was left out of the discussion of Zambia. And it very much uh, points to what I'm focusing on here, which is Zambia was hit uh, in 2015 with a major drought, which had a big impact on electricity uh, and agricultural production, and was also a, sh a shock of, uh, of enormous uh, consequences, uh, you know, uh, along with the declining uh, price of copper. And so it's important as we go forward this thing, how, how, how much the uh, we're seeing the increasing standard deviation to the mean of rainfall. In Zambia's case, it's now gone from a, a, a terrible flooding situation, partly leading to a color outbreak, uh, and now uh, into a very dry season and the shortage of rainfall. And that gets into, I think, the bigger issue, I think, which is the whole issue of how we deal with climate change, which is enormously central and important at this point in time uh, along with, of course, the issue of how that relates to the structure of African economies, its capacity to deal with it, and the financial consequences. So I have a lot of slides, but there, it's big print. As you get older, you got to increase the print size. So I apologize for this, uh, but hopefully everybody will be able to follow it a little more systematically. So the entire planet basically has an enormous climate change challenge. One sign of the climate change uh, pa pattern we can see uh, is increasing disaster losses, 28 in the United States itself, and we still have this climate change denial, uh, and, over, uh, uh, and also a global count in 2022 of, of flooding, drought, and extreme weather disasters uh, worldwide. Um, perspectives basically may vary on how Africa can be involved in a global solution to climate, but the need for Africa-based resources for most solution pathways is undeniable. The question is, how can we build on that to transform the structures of African economies? Solar panel in Africa is worth a lot more than a solar panel in the United States uh, for very technical reasons. Uh, but unfortunately, it's something that has uh, not been sufficiently recognized. Uh, the issue is also now new forms of infrastructure and the ability of Africans to begin to manufacture the goods necessary to deal with the challenges, not only of mitigation, and we've heard how much that has been focused on, but also the challenges of adaptation, which are huge in Africa and often neglected. Uh, the other speakers have also uh, focused on uh, the question of structures uh, and finance. Finance and the structure of, global fin uh, of, of the global financial architecture has been, as we know, a major obstacle uh, uh, in Africa. And it's absolutely central and partly explaining the challenges now of dealing with climate change. So to achieve a global transition uh, that includes Africa, we're proposing uh, a new bank, an African uh, Green Bank, that will support uh, and stimulate a full range of activities needed for transitions to renewable energy and a sustainable economy. The bank would not just be a financial institution. 
it would be a focal point of industrial policy or an IPO, uh, industrial policy organization that would help design and support activities for a range of mining and industrial production of energy generation, storage equipment, to low carbon or, or green manufacturing in Africa. A key advantage really uh, that derives from the structuring of the, uh, of the bank would be to support a full value chain of activities and the transition to a green economy, uh, potentially dealing with the structural weaknesses that have held, as we heard from Horman and others, uh, held back uh, the transformation of Africa. So I have uh, five sections, which I wanna go through very, very quickly, you know, making some key points. Uh, we, we generate a longer paper, uh, so I can only hit sort of some of the highlights. First is the issue of the critical reflections in African polls for climate change. We have had a growing recognition of its centrality in Africa, including the 66 point Nairobi Declaration last September 2023, which is really the first African based climate change summit. Uh, Africa, and they focused on what I call, you know, pretty from a climate change perspective, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, uh, apple pie and motherhood. Uh, Africa focused investment to catalyze new industries to transform the planet. Uh, leapfrogging the traditional progression of industrial development to foster green production, strengthening the continental collaboration, uh, basically, um, uh, to enable and advance green growth and uh, expand energy intensive industries to create a virtual circle of green energy and green growth that adds value to Africa's natural resources. The proposal, however, largely focuses on giving $100 billion to the African Development Bank. The problem, as many of you know, is the African Development Bank is hardly an agency specializing in climate finance, has a tendency, and we can get a long debate about, to emulate neoliberal agenda. I'd argue sometimes it's been more neoliberal than the World Bank and the IMF, and has a really poor track record at promoting industrialization in Africa. Uh, and hence, uh, one of the problems there has been, I'd argue, and others have argued, is the structure of the voting power, which gives far too much weight to Northern countries uh, in decision-making. Clearly, I think what is missing is an organization that can focus and uh, coordinate finance and industrial policy, begin to transform uh, the continent to deal with climate change. This uh, green industrialization was also a focus of the second round of meetings on December 2nd of the COP28. One head of state came up with a solution which said restructure the national financial architecture. And I was excited, that's wonderful. And I, as I continued to read what was the main proposal and, and I, I bet not, best not mention who this was, uh, we have to empower the World Bank and the IMF for more concessional funding, funding to young and developing countries in Africa. I don't think there's here anybody, particularly after uh, the last two days of discussions, that would think that's the way to restructure the financial architecture. Uh, the meeting highlighted and focused on one of the main reports uh, coming out of the UNECA, uh, the Greening Africa's Industrialization. The report basically recognizes the importance of industrial policy, but the real problem and it was a problem I had as well when I was writing the 2000 key author in the 2014 report on uh, institutions and industrial policy, uh, is that uh, it, they were kind of forced to write in a market imperfections and failure analysis uh, using a neoclassical economic framework. Given that the real world, as we know, are shaped by wealth, power, and ideas, which tend to uh, be excluded in neoclassical economics, I would argue, and others would argue, that the greening industrial uh, needs to draw more than one set of economic tools, including things like structural economics and original institution economic theory. Taking basically uh, uh, a theory to challenge as broad as green industrialization in Africa runs the risk of really creating solutions that falter because the actions of governments, uh, corporations and households do not match expectations based on models of individual last rational choice applied to collective action. That's a longer theoretical discussion. It also proposes a five-point plan, which I don't, again, uh, it won't get through in much detail, but a lot of it very problematically focuses on individual uh, state actions, uh, basically. Given what I call as the stark variations uh, in the capabilities, politics, natural endowments, financial resources across African countries, including the paucity of country development banks dealing with industrialization. And what I'd argue, of course, as I have elsewhere, is the erosion of the ability to intervene with industrial policy, industrialization, has never been a very high priority of the international agencies or neoclassical economics, you know, uh, which has come as uh, some of us have argued to dominate uh, the thinking here on the continent. So what about the existing nature of the national development banks, uh, basically? 
Uh, we know that and national development banks, including industrial banks, were absolutely central to the state-led growth and transformation of the 1960s and the 1970s. But the institutions failed, were closed down or privatized, often as structural adjustment conditionality. In some cases, uh, they were transformed uh, into commercial banks. So what are these remaining development banks up to? One key issue I think has been focused on, particularly in a recent article by Ndukumina and all, uh, are, is the issue of the uh, length and the terms of the loans. Uh, basically, uh, they, they, they argue that government-sponsored financial institutions are concerned primarily with the provision of long-term capital. As we know, as we've heard in other talks, the huge problematic nature of lending, which tends to be very, very short-term, and generally not really interested in supporting manufacturing enterprises, which are longer term and have higher risk. They use a bank-focused data to actually then compare the terms of 49 national development banks to 50, 543 private and uh, commercial banks. And they determine that indeed uh, the medium and long-term loans are 22% higher among the national development banks, and hence they're fulfilling some of the role that they've been asked to do. But the problem is that it really fails to, uh, to look in a systematic way at what precisely these banks are up to and what the terms are. And one can turn to another data source, which is the uh, Beijing Base uh, New Structural Economics. And of 74 development financial institutions, three, 33 African countries, which they have data, and it's also incomplete, uh, six only, six were focused on industrialization, and three were focused only very narrowly on small and medium sized enterprises. There's only one country that even listed that they're dealing with the problems of the environment. So <clears throat> let's move then to close and talk about some ideas of how we go forward. Um, basically, the expertise or the institutional knowledge needed for unlocking the potential of the entire value chain uh, tied to renewable energy is really not the strong points, as we argued, of regional banks, international organizations serving African governments. And few of the key institutions are currently uh, in place to be able to deal with that within in specific uh, African countries, in part uh, leading to the erosion of the capacities to deal with industrial policy. And so, in essence, uh, it leads to maybe time for thinking about a new organization. What we'd argue is that the African Green Bank has the potential to design, transform the strategies, national, regional, kind of level, secure financial resources, concentrate scarce capacities in engineering and organizational design, uh, business management, environmental sciences, financial expertise, lawyers, and perhaps uh, of great importance, dear to my heart, economists that are not doctrinal neoclassicals, those that are open alternative uh, economic tools. Um, our Green Bank basically vision, just to summarize quickly, of key attributes. Uh, partnership with the AU, absolutely central to the highest level of political support. Managed capital and voting structures management completely controlled by African countries to avoid the problems we've seen with other pan-African organizations. Capital accounts, uh, 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 contributions by African countries uh, based on the size of GDP, being a mix of both uh, their own currencies uh, and hard currencies. Loan based on a multiple of the capital base, uh, basically both in local currencies uh, and foreign exchange. Uh, utilizing of the uh, promised uh, Paris Accord funds uh, to help expand the capital base for other purposes, which I'll talk about. The ability to issue bonds in and out of Africa to finance green projects, allowing the African Green Bank uh, loans to be paid back entirely in local currency to avoid foreign exchange exposure and potential downward pressure on currencies, uh, basically. Uh, and uh, at the same time, what would happen is the bank would have sufficient reserves to deal with uh, currency risks that would be associated with. Along with the Japanese main uh, system, a uh, big bank system, and I spent some time in Japan studied it, uh, has been the idea the African Green Bank would actually take ownership, small amounts of ownership in projects and companies uh, that receive the loans that would allow not only much more careful monitoring those from partial ownership. At every opportunity, uh, the Green Bank basically should be aimed at building industry. So countries supporting green manufacturing can import products from other African countries. One of the ways you can do that is facilitating uh, the utilization of domestic currencies in exchange. So in some senses, the bank uh, can become a clearinghouse uh, for currencies, minimizing uh, the use of hard currencies, uh, African currencies. 
high income countries may be skeptical uh, about how uh, climate finance, finance funds are going to be handled by African countries for a variety of reasons. And so the Green Bank then provides a potential uh, uh, transparent channel for finance that can be accountable to the people affected by climate change and can report on climate actions basically undertaken in support both of uh, uh, the players in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, the bank also would provide monitoring services for delivering compensating uh, compensation payments meant to repair damage and losses in line with the COP27 agreement. Like the Taiwanese manufacturing extension, we always talk in Africa about the need to expand agricultural extension, but it's also something which was developed in Taiwan, which is manufacturing extension. And the Af African uh, Green Bank ha will have the largest concentration of experts in engineering and science and industrial policy in the continent available as a green manufacturing extension service. In general, we see a number of divisions uh, that we could organize the African Green Bank, basically. Uh, first unit would look at uh, the green energy production. The activities of the bank would be to encourage uh, wind, solar, geothermal. Second would related value chain activities that employ green technology, basically. Um, a, a third unit would support downstream processing and manufacturing activities that uh, flow from the mining of metals needed for renewable energy. In other words, keeping everything on the continent and uh, using them for forward linkages to expand other manufacturing. As well as uh, basically, and, and we can think about minerals, including aluminum, cobalt and lithium, as well as rare earth metals like uh, dysprosium and terbium, uh, and basically moving systematically towards the halting of unprocessed raw, uh, um, uh, raw materials, which we heard about in the last session. A fourth area is also related uh, to the need to develop goods and services to deal with climate change uh, adaptation. So for example, one can think of supporting companies that manufacture and install what is a you know growing, I think, very useful te technology, which is a solar-based African manufacturing drip irrigation system, which could help deal with climate change droughts in many parts of the continent. A fifth unit then uh, uh, could serve as an investment intermediary that attracts and arbitrages foreign investment in green industry. A sixth uh, will be in this green extension service, which I talked about. And the seventh will be a division of a holding company that specializes in the monitoring, reporting, and functions uh, described. So, in the paper, what we tried to do, and I'm, I can only throw this at you very briefly, uh, I know Hook is coming to me soon, so I've got to finish quickly. Uh, uh, and so um, what we propose is a new institution to, uh, to address the multiple challenges to coordinate effective climate action, building manufacturing uh, agricultural capacity, including maximizing value added through building continental wide value chains, helping Africa and the world transition to green energy while building domestic African monetary systems that strengthen local currencies, while helping to facilitate the de-dollarization, while at the same time moving the continent away from the export of raw materials. So in conclusion, uh, perhaps these proposals sound capricious or speculative or whimsical or utopian. So I will quote uh, perhaps uh, somebody from a book, perhaps some of you heard of, who basically stated, uh, the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping the old ones. And this was absolutely central here. So it's, in some senses, time to boldly challenge uh, the old ones and the vested interests that keep it in place. Unfortunately, given the state of the world and a rapidly changing uh, climate, uh, it actually leaves us with no choice. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Sometimes threats work. <laughs> um, I will now call on Raymond uh, Frempong. Raymond studied economics at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana and a PhD in economics at the University of Beirut, Germany. His research interests are development economics, health economics, the economics of child labor, rural and agricultural development, food security, and regional integration. He has authored several scientific publications in peer reviewed journals like Energy Economics, Development Policy Review, and many more. Dr. Frempong's research has been funded by grants from several organizations and institutions. He worked previously as a postdoc researcher at the, at the Chair of Development Economics at the University of Bayreuth. Welcome, Raymond. You want to come here? Yeah. I, would like to, I would like to squeeze my laptop here.
I think I can drag out. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, and of course, thank you to IDS and uh, Dr. Sila and um, Charles for the opportunity to discuss this topic and also organizing all this all important and timely conference on debt sustainability in Africa. So when I got the invitation from Dr. Zaila, I was really um, thinking about what exactly I could say about natural resource and debt sustainability that every one of us here has not heard before. So it was really um, a difficult one for me to decide. And uh, having heard what Having had the presentations today and what was discussed yesterday, I think probably I made the right choice to um, discuss what I'm going to talk about today. Having said that, I just want to make a disclosure that I am not really a big fan of natural resources. Uh, and this is basically because um, over the years, uh, there's more than enough evidence about uh, the best ways to wrongly manage and run natural resources in Africa, but we seem to be making um, the same mistakes, discoveries after discovery. So these days when I hear of new mineral or resource discovery in Africa, I am not very um, enthused. That said, I think natural resources still um, definitely um, have a role to play in the economic health of sub-Saharan African countries. Um, especially given um, its share volume in the GDPs of these countries. So I will then make an attempt to talk to you a little bit about resource mobilization in the sector and how um, African countries and sub-Saharan African countries are a little bit below par when it comes to resource mobilization and how this is important, especially at this moment when most of these countries are struggling with debt. All right, so as I said, there are so many entry points uh, that one could take when you want to relate natural resources to the sustainability. And most of it we have already looked at by indirectly in the previous discussions by way of encouraging borrowing and also the fact that 
it actually makes most of the economies, uh, resource producing economies are tied to the movements and the up and downs of commodity prices such that Anytime commodity prices are going down or are hit by any shock, it affects these economies. So I will not dwell so much on the borrowing aspect or the effect of resource or commodity prices and how these affect the sustainability, but I'd rather look at how African countries are mobilizing um, taxes and revenue from this sector and how this could be improved. So in the current discussion, there are two um, entry points that I'm going to look at, and that will be the contribution or the potential contribution to government revenue of natural resources. And as I indicated earlier on, revenue mobilization in the sector by many governments over the years has been a little below par. And a lot of this has to do with the within and without factors uh, that we have already looked at in some other presentations, and especially from our discussions yesterday. And these factors affect the capacity of governments to really um, mobilize revenue and the amount of revenue that is realized from the sector. So here I show uh, um, a very crude um, graph that I generated with self um, self reported revenue data at the EITI, which is the Extractive Industry uh, Transparency Initiative by countries. So, what I'm doing here to look at how much countries are re realizing in terms of corporate tax revenue and profit tax revenue as a percentage of um, natural resource rent or mineral rent in Africa. So the straight horizontal line you see is that of the rate for the whole world. The dotted line or the dashed line is for Sub-Saharan Africa, and then you have the bars for the respective countries. A note here, I am a bit cautious with the data set, but I think it's the best that one would get. So I would proceed to discuss it and also talk about it. And also promise that I really did not touch on this data set. So I'm only presenting um, what is there. So basically what do we see here? A uh, number of African countries and we see their performance in terms of the effective tax rate in the natural resource sector. And you could already see that two of our star countries when it comes to um, debt sustainability or unsustainability in Africa, Zambia and Ghana already are featured there. The difference is that Zambia seems to be performing a little bit better than Ghana. So you see Ghana's effective tax rate or corporate tax rate falls below both the international world and sub-Saharan African tax rates. And then you have a bunch of South West African countries also there below the two rates. So the question is, if you are poor, do you, or can you afford to give out um, that much? Now to put things a little bit in perspective, I try to compute how much we are losing in terms of the revenue if those countries that are below were to charge the international rate, which again is low, because again, if you look at the tax books of these countries, then you realize that in the books, tax rate, corporate tax rate falls be between um, 20 to 35%. So again, it's not only a problem for Africa, it's international problem, but um, you realize that um, ours is also a little bit um, worse. So here, what I do is to take the difference between the respective rates for the various countries and that of the world rate, and then try to multiply it by the natural resource rent to see how much these countries would realize if they were at par with the global rate. Here you will see that one important country when it comes to natural resources and its role in GDP is missing, and that is Nigeria. I had to drop Nigeria to give the other countries chance to show up, right? So once you bring Nigeria in, then you realize that all the others are 
um, where you can't even see some of the bars, right? So just to mention a bit about Nigeria, the difference is just uh, it's about 600 million. This is only for 2016, I should say. So here, what we are seeing is what how much countries are losing in terms of potential tax revenue um, in the green bars and the blue bars reflects what they reported on the EITI um, framework or, or, or yeah, the EITI uh, in 2016. Again, you see where Ghana is, and uh, I want to highlight Ghana because of the obvious reason. And definitely, you see that we are losing almost 60 million US dollars in 2016 alone. Now, if you put things a little bit in perspective, today I read on my Joy Online that 300 million rate uh, has hit Bank of Ghana's account. So if we lost 60 million in 2016, this is already about 20% of what we are getting from the World Bank and we are so happy about. If you want to uh, compound it a little bit with the interest rate at which we are borrowing and see how much we would have realized from this 60 million, then probably it might have gone up or it will go up a little bit. I also want us to realize that here we are only dealing with only one aspect of tax and only one aspect of revenue that um, countries could potentially benefit. And this is corporate income tax and profit tax. So there are some other taxes and some other sources of revenue that in the paper you realize that again, Africa seems to fall short. So in actual sense, how much we are losing or how much we are not mobilizing um, is far greater than what we see here on the ground. Now, so what I say here is that given the current crisis, it's clearly unjustifiable and countries definitely cannot afford to lose, lose such revenues, especially when in the case of Ghana, citizens and domestic creditors are receiving haircuts and then we tend to give out this amount of money to mostly multinational um, companies. So why and how does this happen? And I will highlight just two courses because they are uh, interconnected and, and I think they are also relevant in terms of our discussions so far. So, I scanned the literature a little bit and the, the, the concern that is coming up is really the, the kind of competition between resource producing countries and also countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to compete among themselves in terms of who is providing which tax incentive and uh, which tax break in order to attract FDI. So, as I said, even though you have in the books, most of these countries have corporate tax rate between 20 to 30%. If you pick a standard contracts in the mineral or mining sector, you realize that countries are really giving these tax breaks in the form of concessions and other conditionalities in the specific contract. And this is really not only the case for, or for Africa, it's really global, and I think this is also what is informing the global tax reports. Now, the other aspect that leads to what we see on that graph is that multinational companies, especially in the money sector, are becoming more and more innovative in terms of the way they are able to shift their profits and also the way they are able to game and cheat the system, especially for sub-Saharan African countries that have uh, low capacity in terms of tax mobilization. So given these two factors, again, we go back to what was said yesterday, our back is already against the war and we are already also giving these tax aways in terms of contracts. So if we ignore the usual uh, lack of transparency and the usual corruption that has been um, cited a lot uh, when it comes to the natural resource literature and its impact on economic development, then you realize that being more a bit more effective would be um, would help these countries to realize a lot more revenue than they are doing now. But I see a situation where it's going to be a little bit a little bit difficult for 
sub-Saharan African countries to do it alone, as I said already, they are competing. And so one estimate put it that a 1% increase in the tax rate of a country is associated with about 1.5% reduction in the pre-tax um, profit of the company. So companies try to shift their profits, find different mechanisms to shift their income to countries where um, tax rates are already low. And the literature actually finds uh, Mauritius uh, guilty of, of this because if you look at the literature, it really doesn't add up that Mauritius has already about FDI uh, to GDP ratio of more than 2,000%. And this is simply because it has a very low corporate tax rate, about 5%. So how do we deal with this situation and how do African countries uh, deal with uh, this problem, especially when they seem to have a problem of coordination and lack of coordination and also they are kind of in a form of um, a prisoner's dilemma game where clearly cooperation is good, but it cannot be achieved. So the argument is, well, there's the need for um, regional bodies like the ECOWAS and the AFDB and of course the African Union to support some of these countries to build their capacities. There is some hope from what is happening in terms of the global tax reform, but the question again, as was asked yesterday, is who is leading it and how are we participating as Africans? So in the end, I see a situation where, once again, Africa will become the end user of whatever comes out of um, that reform. And even if it succeeds, because I, I, I see the target of, of, the, of, the, of the reform is basically targeting corporate tax. And once the incentive and the motivation for African countries to outdo each other with tax incentive, probably even if we succeed in achieving a certain level or minimum level of corporate tax for countries, I see a situation where countries are going to switch to some other forms of incentives that would um, they hope to attract FDI, even though the argument for the efficacy of FDI, I mean, the efficacy of tax incentive for FDI is quite uh, limited and doubtful. Um, so this is, is from me today. Thank you very much. And we have a presentation. Okay. okay. We're multitasking here. Thank you. We now have Yan Liang, and she will be pre presenting on China Africa relations. She's a Peter C. and Bonnie's S. Kremer Chair. Thank you. Professor of Economics at William Met University. She's also a research associate at the Levy School Economics Institute and a research scholar of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. She specializes in MMT, economic development, international economics, and the political economy of China. She publishes in various leading heterodox journals and contributes to a number of heterodox books. Yan is elected member of the Association for Evolutionary Economics and immediate past president of the Association for Institutional Thought. And she currently serves as guest editor for the Chinese economy. Welcome.
Mirror, how do you mirror? Mirror, Arun, Arun. Arun, mirror, Karo, yeah. not windows, mirror. Ek, 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 just. Sorry. All this. Go back to the first slide. So. Okay. Can you hear me okay? All right. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Hopefully that doesn't count towards my time. But thank you so much for the invitation, dongle, and ideas. Oh, okay. Can you hear me okay? All right. All right, you didn't miss much yet. <laughs> Just want to thank uh, to all the uh, guests here and also for dongle and uh, colleagues uh, from ideas for the invitation. Um, so I'm talking sort of from a lender's perspective, and I will highlight, you know, China as the lender. Uh, I know that we have heard a lot about China uh, so far. Um, so hopefully this presentation will give you a little bit more highlights uh, in terms of, you know, how China sees the debt issue um, and the approaches and, you know, how the collaborative uh, sort of uh, efforts, right, that China and African countries can do. Um, so the title uh, is about, you know, China as a banker, the also the debt collector, um, also the res rescuer, um, as far as the African debt that is concerned. First thing that we know, of course, is China is a big lender uh, to the African countries. So when we look at between 2000 and 2022, the cumulative lending uh, of China to African countries reached $170 billion. Um, and we know that a lot of the lending goes into the infrastructure and capital projects. So as you see from the chart to the right that, uh, oh, sorry, actually I'm ahead of myself. So this is basically the uh, country uh, composition of the Chinese lending. So as we know, the Chinese lending is very much concentrated. The top 10 countries account for over 60% of the Chinese lending and the top five countries 
um, as you can see, including Angola, uh, Ethiopia, Zambia, Egypt, um, and Nigeria, uh, these five accounted for over 50% of the total Chinese lending. Um, some other characteristics. Uh, one is that, as we know, that the, a lot of Chinese lending goes into um, transport infrastructure, also energy. Um, the right side of the panel shows that you know China is the single largest country in terms of the source of financing uh, for Africans' infrastructure project. Um, so this is just to keep in mind um, that a lot of these loans are supposed to finance infrastructure projects, which will uh, hopefully bear fruit over the long period of time. And so that differentiates China's lending from many other the MDB's lending. Um, so here is to take a look at uh, sort of the, the, the terms of lending uh, from China as a comparison with the World Bank. So first of all, what we saw here that China is a big lender. Uh, in the time period between 2000 and 2014, China lends about 86% of what World Bank lends. The average loan size, China's is much larger, triple the size of the World Bank. And again, that is because a lot of this lending is for infrastructure. So it's pretty large project in nature. Um, it also comes with a pretty high level of concessionalities, especially if you compare that uh, with the private creditors. So um, to your Right, um, that table is to look at a subsample of 28 countries, mostly our low income countries. So again, you can see that uh, China's interest rate is much more generous than the uh, private creditors uh, with better uh, loan concessionalities. So those are the loans below the market rates. Um, next, if I can make this work. Okay. Um, one of the critiques to the Chinese lending is that it's often lack of transparency and that to some degree is true. So when we look at this chart is um, how many of Chinese loan contracts include the confidentiality clauses. So what you see here is China's loans are much more um, in terms of you know, including these kinds of con confidentiality clauses compared to the traditional, uh, the so-called benchmark lenders. And that's pretty much 56 different types of lending institutions compared to China, okay? So as you can also see that uh, it's increasing, right? In terms of the loans contracts that include that clause. So just to, uh, a quick sort of summary, right, of the characteristics of China as a lender. So first, um, there are a lot of diverse lending institutions. Uh, there are about 39 different lenders from China that includes government agencies, uh, state-owned de development banks and commercial banks, and also uh, state-owned enterprises, as well as private commercial banks and private um, enterprises. Uh, size of the loans are usually large, um, speedy disbursement. Um, as we know, the former uh, Senegalese president Wait, right, famously put that uh, when they negotiate with World Bank, it takes five years for the contract negotiation for China, that's three months. Um, and we also know, for example, the signature project for Kenya's railroad, uh, it was completed 18 months ahead of schedule. So the Chinese are known for um, their speedy disbursement and uh, launch of projects, but that comes with some pros and cons and we can talk about. Um, also, as we mentioned, it concentrated in few countries, it focused on infrastructure, it's less transparent. It also local, utilized a lot of local resources as well as local you know, labor and uh, environmental standards. Again, there are pros and cons of that. And I think also bear in mind that you know, China does utilize a lot of local resources and that point uh, to a very interesting dilemma. And I think also irony later, which is you know, how much really African countries need, right, this, this kinds of external financing. If 47% of some of these resources that go into the project are actually sourced locally. Um, then I think uh, also the other, um, you know, uh, characteristics is that uh, China's lending is much more of a demand-driven approach, right? Instead of, you know, China going in and tell these countries what you need, right? China is more of a demand, uh, responding uh, to the needs of uh, these African countries. 
proposals. And so I think that reflects uh, a very different, I think, principle that China upholds when it comes to development finance. China sees this as a South-South corporation. Um, it is about, you know, uh, building projects and um, instead of you know, imposing sort of changes, right, onto these African countries. So um, I'm not going to read through this, um, but we'll come back to this point later. Oops. Um, okay, so just very quickly um, about these positive impacts of the Chinese lending. Um, so I know that, you know, China boasts itself of building 6,000 kilometers of railways in Africa, 6,000, more than 60,000, 6,000 kilometers of uh, roads and also 80 uh, major power generating facilities in Africa. So all of these have tremendous developmental implications and benefits. But again, you know, so the, this, these projects usually take a long duration, right? Gestation periods are usually long for these projects to bear fruit. Um, that said, I think we can also find many counterexamples where you know China has been facilitating the buildup of some so-called white elephant project. At the end of the day, I think as Brautinken, Brautinken um, this very well-known um, development um, economist put it, in the final analysis, um, the developmental impact of China's finance will most likely uh, you know, uh, vary country by country and sector by sector. The deciding factor in here is not China, but more of the local governments and the countries. Um, now we move on from uh, China as the banker, right, to the debt collector, which I think is the main theme of this conference. Um, so, you know, the Western media has been, you know, sort of ridiculing uh, on China, right, that used to be a banker that holding a bag of money. Now it is the largest debt collector. Um, so this is a chart that shows um, this, this data is taken from the World Bank, the International Debt Database. Um, so it's a little different from some of the ones that we have seen so far. But nonetheless, I think what this shows is that you know, the African countries have accumulated close to $655,000 um, of debt. And China is one of the largest bilateral uh, creditor. And so if you look at the China's bilateral and also private uh, Chinese uh, lenders, China account for about 13.5% of the total debt, according to this data. Um, so as we know that this debt service has constituted a major drain uh, on the fiscal coffer of African countries. So we have already talked about this extensive Lidens conference. I'm not gonna go too much, um, but it is estimated about 26% of the debt service goes to China in the next few years. And of course, this average debt service to fiscal revenues numbers don't really capture the severity of the problems. Like for example, Ghana, right? Uh, 2022 debt service constitute or consumed 70% of the government revenues. Um, so the situation is rather dire. Um, as you can see here, the debt service, according to UNTA, has already surpassed the house expenditure. It's also catching up with the educational spending. Um, so who is to put the blame? And I think, you know, many of us have already talked about this in this conference. Well, time goes fast. Okay. Um, so the private creditors. So of course, you know, when we looked at the developed countries, right, their uh, low interest rates uh, basically allow them to, quote unquote, borrow very cheaply. But, you know, African countries don't enjoy the same luxury. Um, so as we can see here, um, Right now, the bond yield average uh, for African countries has reached a 9.4% compared to advanced countries that's close to 1%. Um, and Zambia's example is also very telling, right? Their euro bond rate has gone up from 5.6% when they first issued it uh, in 2012 to now 9.4%. And we also have heard about the rating agencies, um, you know, consistently uh, sort of discriminating against African countries in terms of their ratings. There are two countries only that enjoy the uh, investment grade and all the rest have the so-called high yield status. 
Um, and we also heard earlier this morning that, you know, if the rating agencies can be fairer, this could have saved African countries $73 billion. Um, and also what is very interesting when you, uh, when you think about it is that when you borrow in the euro markets, uh, borrow in foreign currencies, you're not only subject to these interest rate costs uh, that is not under the control of African countries, but also exchange rates. So under the S uh, DSSI, African countries have postponed close to $11.2 billion of debt services. But because of depreciation of the currencies, right, over 60% of depreciation, uh, sorry, 60% of the African countries currency have depreciated. This basically created more loan payment down the road um, in the local currency. That's $25 billion extra. Um, so all of these, I think, are very important to keep in mind when you borrow externally. Um, finally, it comes to you know, China as the rescuer. So China um, has participated in the multilateral sort of system, right? That it has given 8.3 billion out of the 11.1 billion debt service deferral uh, under the uh, G20 common framework. Uh, but China, of course, ex excuse, sorry, China is, of course, accused of holding up the process of the debt negotiation at the multilateral level. And that's because there is, of course, the conflict of interest. China does believe that MDBs and also private creditors should also partake in, you know, these kind of debt restructuring and take on haircuts, right? So the Zambia negotiation is a very interesting example, right? If you remember last November, um, they were happy about, you know, the private creditors are willing to come to the table and take the haircut. But China and France refused that because the private creditors' willingness is only 18% of the haircut. That, according to historical precedence, is by far too insufficient, right? We're looking at in the historical levels, you know, 39 to 64 percent of haircut. So for China, only 18 percent. That means, you know, a lot of these will be taken on by these uh, bilateral lenders, and so they, you know, were not happy um, about that uh, negotiation. So right now, I think, again, uh, we just heard from November 19th, right, that some of the private creditors, again, are willing to come to the table and negotiate about $3 billion out of the $13 billion of the euro bonds. And so it remains to be seen how that negotiation will pan out. But again, there are a lot of differences, I think, in terms of how China sees uh, this debt restructuring and the nature of that compared to um, other lenders. So... Um, as I mentioned earlier, China has signed a contract in such a way that includes an unusual clauses that would protect China's interests. For example, preventing you know, China's debt from restructuring uh, in the Paris Club of, uh, of the negotiations and other collective negotiations. Um, and also uh, the insistence that MDB needs to take a haircut. Again, that is controversial, but some see this as a excuse, right? That China just doesn't want to take a haircut and that's why it has been uh, blocking kind of the process. But others believe this is the way China is, uh, you know, sort of uh, combating, right? Against the sort of the current Western led financial architecture. But uh, going back to the uh, point, um, I've been reading a lot of the uh, Chinese official and also scholars uh, accounts in Chinese. And what they say thinking is that they're really seeing, um, you know, debt as a very different nature. This is this is going to generate productive revenues uh, down the road. So giving time, right, these kinds of uh, lending will become viable, you know, through generating positive cash revenues from these projects, from infrastructure projects. So what they're much more willing to do um, is um, to extend the loans. Um, as I think someone mentioned this morning, I think it's Ali, right? They talked about in Ethiopia's case, they extended their loan by 20 years, from 10 years to 30 years, and believe that you know, some of the different structures will help to generate the revenues. Um, and also, you know, there are also blurry lines between the official versus commercial, which is profit driven kind of lending. So that also, in a way, uh, made the Chinese government hesitant to completely just cancel the debt. Although, you know, there are cases where um, canceling debt is a possibility. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to just be very quick here in terms of. Aside from participating in the multilateral resolutions, China is also lending rescue loans um, to developing countries. Uh, one way is through the swap lines, uh, where South Africa, Nigeria, and um, 
uh, Egypt uh, have established swap lines with the Chinese central bank. Uh, China also has lending uh, has also been lending through uh, state owned banks and also companies uh, in a way to sort of uh, resolve some of those liquidity issues as we heard earlier this morning. Um, so also China is considering and they have been working on various different approaches um, how to relent the SDR increase uh, the increase in F, uh, the SDR, uh, which is, you know, China get about 40 billion of the increase of the SDR uh, when the IMF issue another 650 billion. Um, African countries at, as, a, as a whole only receive about 5%, which is th 33 billion. So China has made a pledge that they will relent 10% of the increase, which is 10, 10 billion. So some of these are, you know, sort of the bi bilateral, right, in terms of how China consider um, to help with the African debt issues. So what can we do going from here? So one is, of course, uh, there are various ways that we could try to, uh, you know, uh, reduce the net present value of the loans, and that could come from either debt cancellation or restructuring. So there is various ways that have been put on the table, and I know that some of the Chinese scholars and uh, even at the official level will be willing to consider some of these plans, um, such as a Brady light bonds um, to swap out the, the, the loans. Um, also, the uh, as we mentioned this morning by uh, the scholar from, I believe, Nigeria, right, talk about the state contingent uh, debt instrument, especially the commodity price linked, commodity linked uh, bonds. And finally, also uh, the possibility of distressed debt buybacks with uh, green finance. And I can go into more of the details uh, if we have time for Q and A's. Um, but I also hear the common question here is that, you know, it's not just the problem of resolving the current debt stock problem, but also the flow, right? If we don't uh, have a new way um, of providing development finance, we are likely to go back to the old way, which is borrow externally, and we'll end up with the same problem again and again. So one of the first problem, I think, uh, one of the first thing that we need to consider is this idea of development finance should primarily come from within. Um, I think Keynes made that point, and a lot of developmental economists have started to realize, really, do we need that? external financing. And I think my friend Dongo has published, uh, you know, in the Project Syndicate, a short piece, but it's very profound. Um, I think he talked about, you know, when we think about, you know, all these development finance, right, it's not, the it's not that we have scarcity of savings, right, because all we need to do is to create a credit to mobilize resources. Um, so there's a question about how much do we really need to borrow externally? Um, like I said, the example of China's, uh, Kenya's railway is that 47% of the resources are sourced locally. So if we're able to really find the resources domestically, right? Why can't we set up domestic bank? I'm so glad to hear the Green Bank, right? African Green Bank. So I think that's the way to facilitate credit flow, to create credit, to mobilize local resources. And unless we really need to buy from the international market technologies and capital, right? Why can't we do things from, um, you know, based on our own uh, resources? Um, but in terms of the Chinese lending, and I also hear a lot of the discussions about, you know, the lending from China is going to go down, uh, which I think when we look at the trend, uh, it's, again, I think too early to tell because of the pandemic, um, because of China's own economic slowdown. But I think the internal logic, uh, the push and push and pull factors uh, from China still remain. China still has, you know, large amount of foreign reserves to recycle. Uh, China's uh, current account surplus due to start to rise again. And China is st still seeing this as a productive capacity at home that they could build elsewhere. Um, China still is in very large need for resources and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, it's likely that China is going to pivot towards a small but beautiful, smart yet smart uh, kinds of uh, projects, which I think is out of major the concern of the Chinese, uh, of the borrowing capacity of the African countries. So final thoughts here. Uh, again, I think uh, this probably will be addressed by uh, Professor Lee uh, later in terms of the comprehensive blueprint or architecture plan going forward. Uh, but one of the things, again, is uh, we know that current international financial architecture simply uh, provide a very, uh, has done a very bad job, right? Very ill service um, to developmental needs. And so I think the real sort of solution lies in, first of all, how African countries should look more inward for development finance, but also, of course, the collective actions to reform the current system. Um, with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. Um, we had a few technical issues, but I think we have Brian now ready. No, we don't have Brian ready. Okay, so we can see him, but we can't hear him. Brian, we're really sorry. Um, Brian, we still can't hear you. Is is there by any chance? Are you muted? Uh, no. Okay. We ask him to send. No. Brian, please say something. Let's see if we can hear you. No. No, we can't hear. Okay. All right. So we're so sorry, Brian. It would have really built this rich tapestry of of case studies for this session. Um, Dongo tells me that he will distribute your presentation to everybody in the room, and maybe we can record a presentation to distribute as well. Um, so Dongo and the team will be in touch with how to do that. And we're really, really, really sorry that we're missing you here. Thank you so much for being so patient, for your grace and spending so much time with us. Um, we will now pan to a question and answer Sir, I'm also under strict time guidelines, so I will open up and hopefully end for 1 p.m. because we have another session after this and lunch will be at 2.15. Uh, so we'll open up for about four questions. There's some... No, don't go. Are you okay? Yes, okay. So I'll start with Chennai, a boat, and the two questions here. Um, hello, is it on? Okay. Um, thank you so much for the presentations, all really interesting. My name is Chennai um, with the Tax Justice Network Africa. I had a question around, um, I think it was uh, Dr. Frempong, if I say that correctly, um, I really enjoyed your 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 presentation, and I just had I think one question because I I think you're completely right in the hello, okay. I was saying I think you're completely right in the sense that we we do have an issue um, around our tax system that we need to address that's potentially. Um, um, not resulting in us being able to generate as much revenue as we could from natural resources. Um, and then you made reference to, I think, what's happening within the global tax system. Um, and so specifically pillar two that could help us um, find ways to address this issue of tax incentives and exemptions. Um, what I wanted to sort of prod is, you know, when you take a look at pillar two, it actually excludes extractives. Um, from the different sectors that um, it it points to trying to address this issue um, of of tax incentives, tax exemptions. Um, and so I just wanted to know what your thoughts are around how we could um, have an African response to addressing this issue, because I think the solutions that are coming at the international level, and you alluded to this, are insufficient um, to help us address the concerns that we have at a continental level. Um, so just wanting to hear some, I guess, alternatives that we could proffer as a continent um, to address the situation that we have in light of the global solutions, not really helping us address some of the issues that we have um, in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chennai, about, no, you're good. I had two questions at the back. Thank you very much. I mean, um, Professor Horstein, I think uh, his presentation on the Green Bank was actually uh, a novelty that I just felt there's a need for him to actually comment on. 
I don't know if you are aware that I've actually, some is my name, Sabdansi, and I work for ISODEC in Ghana here. I don't know if you are aware of uh, African Women Bank, Green Bank Initiative, and there are about four of them. Uh, after COP27, 20, I mean, uh, green financing was actually a key issue that came up in Africa. And then um, they actually, the, the bank actually started with uh, Morocco and Egypt, I think. Their targets will actually mobilize a paltry $1.5 billion within a year. That is actually different from your $100 billion expectations. So I want to see, you know, if maybe in your literature you actually chance this. Uh, to a very large extent, if African World Bank is actually championing four different green bank initiatives in Africa, this remains siloed and uncoordinated. And I don't know the intentions of ADB, given the 40% of those who actually owe shares in ADB are the US, Canada, Japan, and other countries. So there's a need for us to actually put that in perspective. So I just want to ask you know, whether this your proposal of the Green Bank is actually linked to the African Women Bank Initiative of looking at four different banks, uh, uh, green banks altogether. And I also want to actually link it to the fact that with the emergence of uh, BRICS, are we actually looking at the, the influence of BRICS going forward within the entire international financial architecture? Thank it's you. It's good for us to take within that context. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm actually going to close the questions there. We're really behind on time. And I'll ask panelists to try and sum up in about two minutes each. We are so behind on time. I can see Howard smiling. But we have lunch and we can engage you further and this evening as well and tomorrow. Um, so I will start with Raymond. Thank you very much, uh, Chennai, for your question. And um, yeah, exactly. This is what I was also struggling with. So uh, to really solve the problem, we need to understand the causes. And as I try to explain, at least we we could look at it from three broad angles. The first one, again, is uh, the lack of transparency and corruption that sometimes arise in some of these shady deals that completely um, undercut the tax rate that probably would require a more holistic approach in dealing with uh, the systemic lack of transparency and corruption in the system. The other cause is really the motivation behind when countries find economic reasons to cut down the tax rate for these multinational companies. And the idea is to provide incentive and reduce the cost of production for uh, these companies, again, the literature on this subject is really not uh, enough to support that argument, and it's really doubtful if it's really effective. Then the other point is the lack of capacity, which I think something could be done. And here, I think countries are the countries are clearly struggling with their tax capacity and their effort. So here, I I suggest probably the ECOWAS and the African Development Bank could support countries in terms of training and um, uh, um, providing the right um, tools and tax engineering to capture as much tax as possible. And of course, we can also take a cue from the pillar two once it's, it's, it's a exclusive the extractive industries, but we can take a cue from that and probably engineer a tax system that will be more um, favorable for African countries and uh, resource producing countries. Thank you. Howard? Let me uh, respond really uh, quickly to that question. What I'd argue is that, yeah, sure, there's lots of uh, initiatives going on on the continent. They're very fragmented. They're not centralized. They're not coordinated. There's none dealing with industrial policy, industrial transformation. There's none that's trying to actually deal with uh, altering the whole nature of the value chain and trying to keep it in this country. None trying to deal with the issue of finance. 
uh, you know, and how we begin to deal with the, the underlying vulnerabilities associated with the current financial regime. There's a long list of things. And the idea basically is put it behind one group that's going to begin to deal with the interface between the challenges of, of, of transforming production on the continent, dealing with climate change, both adaptation and mitigation, and dealing with financial dimensions of, it. you know, and so that's that's the key. You need the expertise for everybody to have a conversation. It's not just economics, it's not just bankers, it's finance, it's science, it's technology. And this is what really needs to be done. Uh, I, I want to very quickly, I, I'm allowed one more minute. So I want to ask a question to both to my colleagues here. Uh, uh, first of all, Ian, um, there are two issues here. One is, how does the Chinese uh, system, uh, how is it linked to the collateralization? Because we know in a number of cases, it's resource-based collateralization. You know, for example, uh, it's uh, oil flows coming from Angola. Uh, in the case of Ghana, one loan was uh, actually linked to uh, cocoa exports and production. The second thing is, how does that fit into the existing structure of trade in which China so overwhelmingly uh, is importing resources from Africa and exporting manufacturing goods in a way and manner which is not much different than the rest of the world? Uh, the second issue, actually, I want to come to very quickly to Raymond, OK? Uh, and I have a couple of questions. One, one, I think, key issue is the degree of ownership. So we have this long trajectory of mining laws that it came out of the 1992 World Bank report on mining, which then was adopted by, 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 uh, by, by Ghana. And it was based upon a Milton Friedman style Chilean mining law, which was incredibly neoliberal. You know, and that began to get adapted in uh, one country after the next. And that trajectory is really important because it was part of the conditionality in some cases in some countries from the World Bank. The second issue is the contrast uh, of the opposite case, the success case, if some could say, in Botswana. And where we're not really talking about taxation, we're also talking about majority ownership in diamonds and, and the transformation of the revenues. And it becomes really important to understand uh, the models of control and ownership uh, and, and, and the flows of income that are associated with it and the trajectory of the transformation of the legal structures associated with, with uh, how mining is handled in the continent. Thanks. Okay. I know I went past two minutes. Um, thank you for the question. I, I do have a plan, and I think this plan is going to solve all the problems, but I don't want to stand between you and lunch, so let me very quickly. Um, in terms of privatization of resources, I think, you know, definitely, again, it takes two to tango. I do think that the African countries need to have a say in terms of, you know, the, the loan contracts. And again, we see examples after examples when the countries, the recipient countries take agency, right? They can get things done. And I think for China, there is some kind of misconception in terms of sort of resources for loan kind of uh, arguments. I think what China really has been doing uh, in many cases is they set up the escrow Count and require export revenues uh, to be deposited in there in order to make the loan repayments. I don't think, you know, this debt diplomacy kind of arguments that China is coming in and trying to collateral uh, to take the collaterals and seize the assets when the loan cannot be repaid is in China's own interest. Um, and then in terms of the terms of trade, I completely agree. You know, um, China Africa runs two hundred eighty two billion dollars of, of trade. Um, China has been, you know, Africa's largest trade partner, but we know that the trade structure is not in favor. Of, uh, of African countries, but I think you know we need to take one step at a time. When you do not have roads, when you do not have sufficient amount of power and productive capacities, it's very difficult for you to move up the value chain. Uh, but that should be done step by step. We build infrastructure. Um, we also need to start gradually, you know, moving up, right? Building more processing facilities in order to not just export the raw materials and and so on and so forth. So I think we all know what needs to be done. Um, the matter is, you know, can we negotiate the debt contracts? Can we, you know, really build from within uh, to build that productive capacity um, to be able to move up the value chain. But of course, one other problem is, you know, a lot of these processing uh, industries are also having a lot of environmental and social consequences. So I think it takes, you know, coordination, it takes a lot of planning um, to be to, to be able to make that happen. Um, so uh, that, that would be my response. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have one more speaker. The program's changed a little bit. We're a little bit, uh, no, I'm okay. We, we, we're managing time and to make sure that we 
have fairness for everyone. We're going to have one last speaker, Naomi Levy, who's online. Um, I'll invite her to make her presentation in 10 minutes. We will then break for lunch and come back at Dongo 2.15, 2.15, and carry on with the next sessions. Can you see the presentation? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well, I'll go, I go, I will go very fast. I want to speak about what has happened in Mexico in the last presidential uh, period. And I will argue that there is a possibility of growing with no debt. Uh, with some limitations. Uh, I will start stating that a common problem of Latin America and Mexico is the production imbalance is carried account deficit, which mainly financed by international capital, in this period, private capital, driven by class alliance led by national uh, capital pledged to the interest of uh, international capital. And in this, in all these periods, popular classes were excluded from economic development. The situation is worse in the export-led model because the comparative advantages have been based on low wages, large uh, capital subsidies, and um, to, for FDI to be attracted to the Mexican economy. Um, Usually the monetary policy are aimed to uh, attack foreign capital with limited or non fiscal policies, overvalued exchange rate, and spend investment spending has been very low, so was productivity. Uh, in two, from the 2000 onwards, more or less, um, a lot of Latin American countries moved away from neoliberal governments. These experiences were short-lived. Uh, Argentina, Ecuador, uh, and other countries. And one major problem has been the resistance of international capital to alternative policy. Mexico was quite late in adopting different type, uh, a different type of government. The economic program of AMLO's government did not follow the traditional uh, guidelines of the easy pre uh, period. Actually, uh, it didn't want, it didn't incur in public deficits and it limited very much its external debt. What were the main uh, axes of the uh, of the actual government? First, the pools, I wouldn't explain it. I sent a paper, you can read it there. Uh, a frontal combat against corruption and a very bad name to the reorganization of public spending, which has been called here a uh, Republic Austerity. Uh, Another important part of uh, this president pro uh, program has been health finance with financial stability. This has been very critical, especially from the left. And its main objective has been to prevent external debt accumulation and stabilize and overvalue the exchange rate in this sense to control inflation. Uh, I will uh, I will argue very shortly here that in a country which has been heavily disindustrialized as Mexico, this is a second best choice because it limits inflation and reduces the cost of external debt. There are external there are, there are adverse effects of this policy which high interest costs that affect small and medium enterprise finance. And obviously, as industrialization proceeds, this policy will need to be adjusted. What have been the results 
I think very briefly, I would argue that economic growth, despite the big, the deep crisis of 2020, has uh, recovered very uh, strongly against uh, all international prediction. And this has been done with, uh, without consumption uh, dropping and maintaining the pillars of the previous period uh, growth. This means that export to GDP has been the main push of economic growth without collapsing um, consumption as in the previous period, particularly after the 1994 debt crisis. Here we have that private consumption gone very up, gone, had gone very up after the 22 crisis, and obviously it has uh, reduced a bit, but that stayed very high. This is a the very important difference because this crisis for the first time has not been paid by the poor people uh, through a large public deficit that will uh, help the big, uh, big capital. And here we can see that also, uh, even though public deficit didn't help big capital, private investment is going up. And only last year, sorry, private investment is very high. And in the last year, public investment also increased. What has been the mechanisms for these economic results? Here you can see that a public spending, especially current account spending, Increased very little, however, its change, its composition change. And capital expenditure, although stopped the downward trend that it had since 2000, um, <coughs> since 2014, it started to increase again. If we go further, we see <coughs> that public income in the crisis did not go down and did not go down because non-oil revenue surged actually in the middle of the sanitary crisis, particularly to big uh, capital tax recollection. So as I said, even though there was a crisis, uh, big entrepreneurs or big capital had to pay what they were required. Here we see that after the 2020 crisis, there has been a deficit that was around 3% uh, in these years. It, uh, so although the crisis, it did not explode, something very different from other Latin American countries. If we look to take a closer <clears throat> look at, so at social protection spending, we see that here is the change of composition of the current expenditure. More social spending yeah, that has increased drastically in this period. Let's see where it goes. Naomi, as we see where it goes, I'm just giving you a time check. We have two more minutes left. Okay, okay. Uh, here we see that the beneficiaries of social protections has gone up very much. Here we see that the poor region's rate of growth increased above uh, uh, um, at the average national growth rate. This policy has made some change. And here we see that the average wage manufacturer, minimum and average wage manufacturer went up because of the negotiation of the government with the public sector. Poverty indicators has improved. I'm not going into that. And here and here in terms of the, the discussion that you have had in the conference, 
we can see that after the 2022 2020 crisis debt has increased it has low has lowered particularly its, its composition changed domestic debt increased and external debt diminished here i put it in a different way yeah how external uh, total debt has increased again external debt has gone down uh, internal debt has gone down and it has been led, obviously, by private debt. What are my conclusions? The COVID-19 crisis was very big, but the costs were not bear by poor people. Economic policy did not follow the standard textbook. Internal market was put in the forefront of economic and social policy. Uh, one of the pro AMLO's government is, has been extremely aware of the political problems related to development particularly from rate in international rating agencies. And the negotiations with private capital sector were positive for the poor, especially high wages <clears throat> and limiting outsourcing contracts. Uh, public spending is still very low. Uh, public capital spending and to continue to grow with people's well-being, a progressive tax reform is required. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi, and thank you so much for waking up so early. Um, we will now go to lunch. Uh, we'll come back with questions. Naomi, thank you very much. We'll find a way to collate any questions and send them to you and find a way to open up a conversation and engagement. We'll go for lunch. Dongo says we have strict instructions to be back here seated at 2 p.m. And a have big a thank nice, you to the panelists. Have a nice, a good lunch. Thank you. <laughs>
Good afternoon, everyone. We're quite late, so we're going to start the, the, the next, well, it's a session that was somehow started by Christelle, the first um, speaker. I don't know if Noemi Levy is still online. If she's not, she already made her presentation, so we can move to the next uh, speaker. Um, can I ask Andrea Molinari, Ahilan Kadi Gamar, and John, I hope I'm not shopping, yes, to come to come to the front. Can I also ask for a roving mic, please? We need one or two roving mics. It will be more efficient. There is only one. We need a second one. Yes, yes my mic. Okay, hi, Ahilan. How are you? It takes seven and a half minutes each, yeah, right? Yes, we were going to, you guys go, yeah. And yes, that's Andrea. Hello. Thank you, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming back. Uh, we will not have that much time this time around. Good afternoon. Um, we, the first speaker actually made his, her presentation. I am not sure. Um, yes. yes. Oh, thank you very much. I'm sorry. I thought you were hearing me. No, I was saying the first presenter made already her presentation before lunch. Uh, that's Naomi Levy, unless she's online. Uh, I know Crystal didn't have time to present her. That's fine. All right. But I, just to, to say who who was who made the first presentation. Um, and if you allow me uh, to do justice to some of the room, um, I, some of us who are here and are francophones, maybe I will speak. Not that I defend French, but uh, just to make sure that we can also communicate in the in the language that half of the continent uses. Hello, Noemi Levy. Um, no, nobody, nobody French, right? <laughs> okay. Donc, Noemi Lévy, uh, Lévy enseigne uh, l'économie. C'est une Chilienne, hein, la dame qu'on a entendue avant, la présent, avant le déjeuner. Et sa recherche se concentre sur uh, les politiques financières et économiques de développement, surtout les, uh, les théories hétérodoxes. Hein. Um, so, we will go... We have maximum one hour, and um, I think we will try to manage it. We have, what, three more presentations, right? I don't, so I normally on my panel, I had Andre Molinari, yes. Ahilan Kadigamar, yes. And John, oh, they have added you too. All right, sorry, okay. All right, so in which order do we go? We start from the left? All right. Yes. <laughs> so you wanted to go first. We have about a sub. We'll give you seven minutes and a half. Sorry? Seven minutes and a half to make your presentation. I've, I've been hearing that you like the word haircut. So yes. I have to get my. All right, so we move. All right, so it's going to take a little bit of time to load the presentation of, of John, so we can move to Ahilan. Are you ready? Do you need a presentation as well to be loaded? So please, please remain here. It will be more efficient. Oh, you, is it? Oh, they want, sure, go ahead. Oh, you're going to make the two presentations at once. Go ahead, please. Hello. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Devaka Gunawardna, um, and I'm presenting here today with Ahilan Kadirgamar. And we just wanted to, you know, briefly say thank you to the um, ideas uh, conference organizers and our Ghanaian hosts. Uh, we're really, really grateful to be here, and we hope to continue the discussion after our presentation because we've uh, already learned a lot through. Uh, the previous days. So I guess as, you know, as I just jump in here, is that everything okay? 
Oh, oh sorry. yes, of course, yeah. No problem. no problem. So as you can see up here, there is an image of uh, the July 9th uprising in Sri Lanka that occurred on 2022, uh, sorry, 2022. And it was um, a major revolt against the government led by Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who was accused of mismanaging the economy and essentially uh, sending it into a tailspin. Um, and this was a, a popular struggle that, you know, again, I kind of kind of put Sri Lanka on the map because Sri Lanka had already defaulted a couple of months previously in April of the same year. But there was a response, right, from people who were suffering, um, you know, for example, having to stand in kilometers long fuel queues, right, because of the shortage of foreign exchange. And so this uprising really represented, you know, a critical moment in the country's history, but it also dovetailed with, I think, a larger global response to uh, the kind of debt distress that we're talking about here, um, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. So as part of that, I just wanna briefly outline some of the reasons why uh, Sri Lanka went into default. Uh, so after COVID, the pandemic began, um, the country was locked out of the international capital markets. So it wasn't able to roll over its existing external debt. Um, because foreign exchange uh, sources like tourism and like migrant remittances had collapsed, okay? And this will be very important when we talk later about why external debt is such a critical issue, right, for understanding um, where Sri Lanka ended up. There are long-term origins, though, as well for the Sri Lankan crisis. And I think, you know, as we, we discuss this, we're going to also try to frame it in a way that we draw comparative lessons as well from what we have learned here so far. But the key thing to note is that Sri Lanka was actually one of the first countries, first country in the South Asian region to liberalize in the late 1970s, even though the country also had a very strong legacy of social welfare, especially free education and free, uh, free education and free health care. And that allowed it to achieve major, uh, you know, goals and human development indicators, right, compared to the rest of the South Asian region. But with liberalization, uh, you know, Sri Lanka undertook uh, agreements with the IMF and with the World Bank. And by the 1980s, there was already pressure to begin privatizing, right, state-owned enterprises, and continuing the liberalization process, right? Devaluation of the exchange rate, um, you know, cutbacks to subsidies, right? Deregulation, all these other uh, criteria. But Sri Lanka also had to deal with a civil war, right? And that really intensified in the early 1980s. And so that actually disrupted uh, the kind of capital that was flowing into the country, right? So even though liberalization occurred, you know, there wasn't necessarily as much capital flowing in as was expected because of the civil war and because of the instability. Now, I also wanna make a emphasis or a difference here that, you know, again, Sri Lanka's situation uh, differs to some extent from the countries we're talking about here at this conference, you know, in terms of what you all have really emphasized the commodity price dynamics, right? Minerals and natural resource extraction. In Sri Lanka's case, that doesn't, that doesn't really apply, but it is still very dependent on a narrow basket of exports, especially in garments and tea, plus, as I mentioned, tourism and migrant remittances. So after the war ended in 2009, there was actually a post-war boom because it also coincided with, as we've talked about, this flood of speculative capital into emerging markets, right, after the North Atlantic financial crisis of 2008, right? And, you know, Sri Lanka was actually, again, considered a success story, right? I mean, it had already um, uh, conducted quite a bit of uh, liberalization 
you know, capital markets, uh, you know, and, and in terms of the convertibility of the capital account, plus it had started issuing sovereign bonds. And this will lead to the complicated creditor profile where by the start of the crisis, meaning in 2020, about a third of external debt was in sovereign bonds. You know, people typically talk about China's role, but really China only constituted roughly 10, depending on your criteria, 10 to 20% of external debt, whereas sovereign bonds, again, made up roughly a third. And this, these sovereign bonds, again, they were given without conditions, but also much higher interest rates, right? Roughly 7.5% interest, so that on average, bondholders extracted the equivalent of their investment in the form of interest earnings in 10 years, okay? So you, and, will, you, you will wrap up in one minute, right? Sure, yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. So as I just want to mention, the key point here is that Sri Lanka didn't default during a war, right? It was after this flood of speculative investment, right, that occurred. So I just want to conclude my part by saying that now, even though there was this tremendous revolt, it is seen as kind of another test case for an uh, IMF agreement that is imposing extremely harsh conditions and even leading up to the IMF agreement, which was signed in March, 2023, the country followed recommendations like interest rate hikes, like devaluing, devaluing the rupee so that people's real incomes roughly have and then now, even after this tremendous popular upsurge, another government came into power, not through elections, but through maneuvering, and they're continuing to implement what we call an IMF solution. So I will hand it over to my colleague, Ahlan Kadir who will explain a bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the kind of uh, IMF solution that um, uh, Sri Lanka is, uh, implementing now, it has two uh, major demands. One, that Sri Lanka should progress on debt restructuring. And two, that Sri Lanka should very quickly show a primary budget surplus. So in 2022, we had a primary budget deficit of 5.7%. This year, we are expected a surplus of 0.7%. By next year, a surplus of 2.3%. Right. So what does that mean? I mean, if you look at our budget the last couple of years, public spending is down to zero. Right. I teach in a university, nothing in terms of capital expenditure. We are hardly paying the salaries in, in, in state institutions. But at the heart of this is the conflation of the fiscal deficit and the current account deficit. Right. I mean, I think that's common to all. IMF programs, even though we defaulted on our external debt, there was considerable uh, pressure to look at both debt together. And, and in terms of what is happening in Sri Lanka now, I have a small research project where we're just following what the IMF calls their benchmarks. We went to an agreement uh, exactly a year ago, and which is a four-year agreement. And then the World Bank country partnership framework. And together, I mean, there's no other policy in Sri Lanka right now. If you just follow what the IMF benchmarks are and what the World Bank, uh, the World Bank is going to support the implementation of these, uh, uh, of the IMF programs. So what is the government doing? They are bringing about additional laws, measures, basically repression to be able to push this forward. So Sri Lanka's economy for all purposes on autopilot controlled from Washington, right? So, and 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 what the uh, president in the last budget said, and this is an election year, he's going to rush through 60 laws and amendments. And then the World Bank and the IMF are extremely supportive of it from agriculture, fisheries, public private partnership, you name it, 60 new laws and agreements that they're trying to rush through, including an anti-terrorism act, so, th so that's what's happening in um, Sri Lanka. Now, this conflation of the external debt and domestic debt meant that in the IMF program, they have what they call a gross financing uh, needs for Sri Lanka when we come out of the program. 
of 13%. So they, the IMF always says they don't take a position on debt, domestic debt restructuring, right? But they have this requirement of 13%. So what effectively happened last year, we are still very far from achieving external debt restructuring because the bondholders are holding out. Negotiations are even going on this week. But the government preemptively, pressure from bondholders, decided to go to domestic debt restructuring. And what did they do? They did not target the banks. They did not target the finance companies. They did not go after wealthy individuals. They went after the retirement funds. So and in, in Sri Lanka, by law, you're required if you're in the formal sector. So pea pluckers, garment workers, these are the bulk of the people who own uh, employee provident fund. So they went after it. And because they want to bring down 0.5% of our GFN by going after these retirement funds. It's over a 16 year period. And when I calculate it, the net loss on the average for retirement funds is going to be 47%. In other words, the opportunity cost 16 years later, if, you, if you're going to retire 16 years later, you would end up with almost half in terms of your retirement fund. And they've pushed that through already. So this is uh, the way. In. And then if you look at the IMF's DSA, you know, we had a debt with the crisis and the devaluation going up to about 125%. They're only going to reduce it to 95%. And the IMF DSA itself is that the next shock could probably risk Sri Lanka's uh, debt sustainability. The, the external debt servicing that they are looking at is 4.5% of GDP. According to the IMF program from, you know, not now, once we so supposedly stabilize, our GDP growth is going to be only 3%. But 4.5% of GDP worth of external debt servicing is going to go on. In other words, 30% of our revenue, if you achieve the revenue targets that the IMF says is going to be for uh, external debt servicing. Now, not only that, if you look at the end point of the IMF program, it's a four-year program. How do we um, become the good kid or gain the right marks? They say you will be then able to float another 1.5 billion US dollar sovereign bonds. So it's the sovereign bonds and the, and, the, and the huge indebtedness through sovereign bonds and commercial borrowing at some point went up to 52% and sovereign bonds on the order of 34%. So what are we working towards all of this? So that in three years time, we can again float a sovereign bond. I mean, that's the logic of this uh, current IMF uh, program. Yesterday we were talking about narratives. In Sri Lanka, these narratives have been powerful. There have been two big narratives when it comes to the external sector in terms of debt. The Western media has been painting it as a Chinese debt trap, even though as Dervaka mentioned, Chinese debt is somewhere on the order of 10 to 20 percent if you look at uh, which of the Chinese actors. And then the domestic narrative has been one of corruption. So it's corruption and the Chinese debt trap. That's been very powerful and kind of absorbed by the, the Sri Lankan population as well. And another factor to take into consideration as, as this is moving forward is that um, now, even though Sri Lanka has not gone ahead with you know, completed debt restructuring already, strategic assets in Sri Lanka, given its geopolitical importance and the competition between China, India, and the US, the strategic assets in Sri Lanka are for the picking. Even before debt restructuring is over, um, China is adding another $1.5 billion to the port city, $4.5 billion to uh, gain up a uh, petroleum sector. And then India, they're using private actors like Adani, also funded by the U United States to take over our ports and wind power in the, in the power sector. So in, a, in, a, in, a, in its most vulnerable state, there's a grab of these strategic assets, which is going to affect Sri Lanka's future. Sri Lanka is, uh, as Dervaka mentioned, you know, 99% of our population has connectivity to the electricity grid because of the sort of social welfare gains. In the last two years with market pricing of energy, one of the conditions of the IMF agreement, one out of 200, I mean, sorry, out of 20 million population or about five 
million households, one million have been disconnected from the grid. So you can see the, the pace at which this whole thing is going. So in the last minute, as I uh, wrap up, I think the, the important thing now, I mean, putting it in kind of global context is as the kind of establishment, the global establishment starts to reframe this from a solvency crisis to a liquidity crisis, right? I mean, that, that framing, how is that going to affect countries that have been, that have defaulted? Would it isolate countries that have already defaulted is, 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 a, is a question I'd like to uh, pose to you. And in, in this kind of, you know, the, there's a lot of unsaid logic, as I mentioned, to this debt restructuring process. How is it going to change the uh, agrarian question in Sri Lanka? This is going to have long-term impact. We have one of the we have small holding producers, and it's been very successful in terms of livelihoods. All that is going to change. And finally, I think the kind of uh, uh, challenge for us is Sri Lanka is even within South Asia isolated. We don't see the sort of African solidarity in South Asia, right? It's, it's if, if anything, the solidarity is between the ruling regimes in terms of neoliberal policies and uh, the security apparatus. How can we think of yes. solidarity in this sort of context to be able to address the debt crisis? Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ahila. Thank you. We, we are trying to keep up with so John. You can you can go ahead. John est un professeur de, à l'Université centrale de l'Équateur pendant qu'ils sont en train de monter sa présentation. Et il, sa recherche se concentre sur, le, sur la politique économique, économie du développement et le commerce international. Okay. We, we've been facing a few All problems right. uploading the presentations. If the presentation is not ready, we can, we can move to the floor there. Is, is any presentation ready to be uploaded? Uh, or is, okay. You're ready? Okay. Um, no. My presentation All right. is here. So maybe while, while we're dealing with the technical glitches, um, any, any burning question to Ahilan on the case of Sri Lanka so that we can endeavor, <laughs> sorry. Because they bounce you from another from another panel, I didn't have your name. I'm sorry. Any any question at this stage for the first on the case of yes, please go ahead. You can take my mic. We will use the time effectively that way. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the. I mean, interesting presentation, but um, we didn't get much time to discuss some of the issues. I just wanted to find out, can you comment on the securitization of strategic asset in the debt uh, dynamics in Sri Lanka? You can take, okay. No, go ahead, please answer yeah. this question so that we can move to the next presentation. Okay, so the, what's happening now in terms of um, the new wave of grab for strategic assets that are coming in, it's, it's through kind of private finance, right? So it's seen as investments backed by these powers, right? So um, there was the, uh, the Hamban Tota port, which was converted into a long-term 99-year uh, lease, right? So uh, at a time when we were having balance of payment problems earlier in 2016, but with that restructuring not completed, a lot of governments are not coming into a G2G kind of way, but they are putting up private actors to play that role. Thank you very much. Someone asked for the floor. Please hold on the question. We will come to you. Uh, John, you can move with your presentation. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. Uh... I'm glad to be here. I thank Ideas for the interest on in discussing um, debt and dollarization from an Ecuadorian perspective. Okay. Um, well, what's the main idea of this presentation? I want to discuss with you about full dollarization, understood, as you can see, as an unilateral adoption of a foreign currency as a legal tender and official monetary standard. 
it means that dollarization does not only mean the adoption of the US dollar, but also other kind of currencies in order to replace the local currency. So uh, focusing on full dollarization, um, uh, economic literature has a lot of problems. Uh, some of them are existent or contrasting uh, theories and uncertainty around uh, the empirical studies. For instance, uh, you can see the work of Korab et al. Um, you may have access to the paper. And uh, basically they say that some empirical studies about dollarization suffer some problems. For instance, institutional and publication biases. So in general, the discussion about dollarization is quite complex without clear consensus of what are the effects. So in the concrete case of dollarization and debt, there are some favorable interpretations. For instance, you have the work of Arjan and Hedko, who claim that dollarization discourages defaults due to exclusion from debt markets. That is, a dollarized economy, for instance, Ecuador, um, has no, ins no incentives to default because of the high cost it implies in terms of being excluded from markets. So this creates some kind of improved repayment incentives that enhances financial market confidence. So there is a reduction in country risk premium that allows countries to access to better debt in terms of interest and maturities. But also, as always in economics, you have a contrary or unfavorable interpretation. For instance, you have the work of Misaglia, uh, who basically claims that, well, in dollarization, private banks continue generating deposits through lending. But now deposits are recognized as equivalent to US dollars or any other foreign currency. And what about central bank? So dollarization, um, the debates on dollarization sometimes focus too much on how the central bank is constrained to issue local currency, but we do not discuss what happens with private banks. It seems that private banks can still create, or well, it depends on interpretation, but they can modify money supply without discussion. So local banks, in addition, uh, can become real strong, particularly if they can access to external funding, to international funds. And also, um, Ms. Aglia and other authors claim that in dollarization, it happens that there is a high preference for cash. And when we talk about cash, I mean physical currency. Why it happens? It happens because individuals, or well, in general, economic agents claim that, well, dollars are a secure asset. Rather, it's, it's like currency becomes an asset by itself. So people, at least for this interpretation, uh, want to hold their assets in dollars or hold dollars themselves. So this creates a lot of problems because the payment chains of local economies become highly reliant, highly dependent on external cash flows. So in the rice economies, it happens or it seems to happen that high external debt, there is a high external debt demand and some susceptibility to debt traps, particularly when we have strong external negative shocks. So given this interpretation, I will jump over this. Now I want to talk with you about the Ecuadorian case. Um, first of all, it's necessary to, claim, to explain to you that in Ecuador, we dollarized the economy, well, the government dollarized the economy, not because of account decision with planification and technical studies. In fact, um, there was a severe banking crisis between 1998 and 1999 that forced the Central Bank of Ecuador to issue uh, a lot of sucres, the local currency at that moment, to provide significant bailouts to the banking sector. In fact, between 1998 and 1999, the local currency, the sucre, lost around 75% of its value compared to the US dollar. Also, we had inflation, well, not hyperinflation, but we were close, and as a form to keep its power, the Ecuadorian president at the moment, at that moment, announced 
the official full dollarization of the economy on January 9, 2000. What happened? 12 days after the announcement, the president was deposed. The dollarization continued and it was completed by a new government on September 9, 2000. Why I told you about this? Because it is important to understand that dollarization, in the case of Ecuador at least, was not some planificated or some technically discussed um, policy measure. It was like some political measure trying to save someone in power. Okay, so now uh, briefly, which were some of the results of dollarization in general terms? Well, we have a fall in the inflation rate uh, some literature accepts that dollarization was important, but we do not have important influence on the growth rate of the GDP. And also, we have to say that even with dollarization, Ecuador faces a lot of problems, including an stagnation of per capita income or the deterioration of the labor market. Now, in terms of what's going on with debt and dollarization, it's necessary to comment that during the first years... Can I years... give you two more minutes? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I will jump all this and just claim that during dollarization, it is possible to have debt crisis. That's maybe the most important point. That is, even with dollarization, Ecuador was not able to deal with the problem of the big shock associated with the global financial crisis in 2009. What was the main way to deal with the crisis? Debt, as you may have seen with other countries. But in addition to debt, and also you may see that Ecuador has suffered with high perception of risk from international markets. That is, dollarization didn't change the perception that Ecuador is a risky country. But also, and I will jump just to what happened during the COVID-19 crisis, because it is, my, for me, the most illustrative point about how dollarization can influence the chains of payment. What's the idea? The idea is that if you have dollars and if you have an informal economy that depends on physical currency for these transactions, if you do not get external debt, it can happen that payment chains can be several disrupted as it actually happened in the Ecuadorian economy in 2020. We have severe disrupted payment chains, resulting in general delays in wage payments for public employees and various public services. And those problems with the chains of payments were partially solved when Ecuador could access to an agreement with the IMF. That is, if Ecuador was not getting dollars from the IMF, it was not able to sustain its chains of payments. And well, we have other problems. As you know, other countries have a lot of problems. But in general, what I want to say to finish my presentation, let me go to the I am policy recommendations. I'll give you two more minutes again, so you Thank can go you. ahead. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Well, so um, in general, um, you can have the slides you want and the paper, that's no problem. The most important thing for me is the policy recommendations. What can we say from Ecuador for you? And the first thing is that experience tells us that there is no, there are no size fits all monetary regimes. Monetary regimes need to be understood based on concrete economic characteristics, like concrete economic studies. We need to conduct technical studies before implementing drastic monetary schemes. Maybe dollarization was the most important monet um, monetary policy that was adopted in Ecuador, and it implied a lot of distributive uh, problems. The minimum wage in Ecuador fell to around $50. That was too low for the Ecuadorian standards for living. The next year after dollarization, it was required to uh, multiply by two the um, minimum wage. Also, we have to think about monetary flexibility, that is, we have to think how we can include um, monetary schemes more flexible to avoid several real adjustments. The IMF recognized that Ecuador needs to, um, needs, to bar, uh, needs to charge a lot of adjustments in the real sector, particularly in the labor market, to compensate the absence 
of a nominal exchange rate. So this is a real huge problem because Ecuador has a lot uh, of difficulties to face external shocks. So what's the answer? More unemployment, less wages. In addition, the discussion about the role of the central bank and private banks. And this has to be also with monetary flexibility. For instance, in Ecuador, we discussed the idea of include alternative electronic currency when we have those problems with uh, dollars. What happened? The central bank was not able to implement electronic currency. It became another business line for the private banking sector. So we have to discuss the nature of money and how um, some institutions like the central bank lose power, but others like the banking sector do not lose power. And well, finally, <laughs> we need to discuss alternative institutional um, international institutions, international financial institutions that today even support the idea of de-dollarization, no dollarization. I think that it's interesting to think about how we can consider the construction of economic blocks where we don't deal with the problems of what the, the Federal Reserve decides when the interest rate, for instance, or with no dependency of dollars for local transactions. And well, uh, I am not an expert, but as far as I know, Zimbabwe had a lot of problems with dollars when they were not able to get external debt. So these are some lessons from the Ecuadorian experience. And as I told you, uh, we can discuss more about this later. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you very much to join Andrea. Andrea Molinari. Someone will upload her presentation. Any question from the floor? We can take one while we are uploading the presentation so that we can use that time. Any question? Uh, well, Maha, take mine. How was it? Just I want more clarification, please, on the disruption of the payment chains that you know. Uh, okay, basically, there were no dollars in the Ecuadorian economy to pay people. There were no dollars to pay wages, particularly for those uh, people employed by the state. So the state, what did was just to stop paying until they get the external debt and pay people. Because what happens in Ecuador is that we have a lot of informal transactions as it happens in a lot of developing countries. And we require cash. We require physical currency to sustain a lot of transactions. So during the COVID pandemic, what happened was that a lot of transactions, physical transactions were stopped until we got the external debt. So that's the main idea. Of course, there are details, but that's the main point. Thank you. So we're still uploading that presentation. You can have a question for both join and and on, yes, so Ecuador and yes, you you have a mic, Reg. Yes, please go uh, ahead. Uh, thanks uh, very much. Um, the banking system. Is it for John? To John or Sri Lanka? Okay, oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll come to him just. Now. Sure. John, the banking system in terms of ownership, how is it um, uh, divided? The ownership meaning Ecuadorians and vis-a-vis -vis the foreigners. Okay. Now uh, for Sri Lanka. The sovereign bond system, you seem to have come up with, uh, you have mentioned rather, that the sovereign bond system has come up there. Now, again, within the sovereign bond system, what's the composition between foreign, Sri Lankan, as well as uh, uh, the foreign ones? It, it may be very helpful to understand how these uh, uh, foreign uh, institutions come to play their role using the domestic foreign uh, foreign bond, I mean, uh, domestic uh, government bonds. Thanks. OK, thank you. Uh, well, in Ecuador, the private banking system is owned basically for a few Ecuadorian families that almost rule all the countries since its beginnings. So what's going on is that we have these families, these private families, that usually decides um, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and so on. And after dollarization, they gained a lot of power 
in terms, for instance, of market concentration. You may have around just five private banks that can control 60 or 70% of all the deposits and the loans. So it's just like that. Uh, Ecuadorian families that concentrate most of the banking sector, and also they have clear influence on monetary policy. Um, shall I respond? Yes, please. Um, so the, the bulk of the uh, dollar-denominated bonds are foreign law. So it's you know floated in the, the US and London and so on, right? Only a very small share is floated locally within uh, Sri Lanka, and that went through domestic debt restructuring. I think the, the key is what, what we saw starting in 2007, and I think somebody mentioned Hyman Minsky, and I'm oh. wondering if that uh, is the kind of phenomena where the financialization takes its own logic, right? A lot of our major banks are state banks. Even they were encouraged to go and float dollar bonds in the global capital market. So there was this thirst because it also came in the trade liberalization. So it, in order to have this huge amount of consumption in terms of external goods and, and luxurious consumption, there was this push every avenue possible to get dollars in, and that's what's caused the crisis also. Thank you very much. Devaka, you wanted to compliment Mahina before we take, uh, and then Andrea, please go ahead. So maybe I can present you first to the, uh, so you're going to make the next. I was planning to speak in French, so I will switch to French. Um, Andrea Molianari is an economist, directrice du Centre d'études économiques et de développement, a professor at the University of Buenos Aires. Elle a travaillé pour le gouvernement, les organisations internationales, y compris la Banque mondiale et la Commission européenne. André, vous avez la parole. Thank you. Um, well, I'm sorry for the technical. Um, I'm going to go through this PowerPoint presentation uh, quite fast. I hope you understand my, my fast English. Um, I come from a country which I believe most of you know uh, to be always... Uh, standing up for uh, different as a different uh, experience, but it's not so different to what I've been hearing over the last uh, day and a half. So I just wanted to try to go as quickly as possible so that we can then focus on on the commonalities that I've been seeing uh, with what I've heard from Africa. Um, why is thank you. Why is Argentina uh, a relevant case study? Um, for those who, of you who don't know, we in 2001, we had the largest sovereign debt default in history. Um, we had a highly complex restructuring uh, period, which lasted over 11 years. And then we had another uh, need of restructuring in 2020 uh, uh, in the COVID crisis. So basically, this um, this this process was uh, characterized by a multi-dimensional uh, uh, importance, both political, legally, and economically. Um, it's also been uh, it's also marked by uh, domestic and international relations of the country for over two decades, and it also set precedents, which we hope. Uh, we can show to the world so that we don't see these kind of things anymore. Um, it also involves many disciplines, and this is also, although I am an economist, I've, I, I've been working multidisciplinary uh, for a long time, and that's why my presentations, although at the end has some graphs, I won't talk much about numbers. I will just try to focus on the concepts. Um, well, basically, we uh, we started with a with a 2005 debt exchange. Just a very very brief history. We had a, a new president in 2003 after a huge crisis. Uh, he was elected not very legitimate, not much of a percentage of the votes, but he very quickly gained legitimacy, and he managed uh, through a confrontational and game changer strategy. He managed to. Uh, advanced in a, into a very successful, at least until then, um, debt restructuring. 
the guiding premises of this government were grow to be able to pay. This is something our president at the time, Kirchner, said at the UN assembly, we need dead, dead people don't pay. So basically that was one of the main premises, let us grow to be able to give you back your money to the debtors, to the creditors. Um, and also uh, the balance, find the balance between sustainability and acceptability uh, in terms of the debt restructuring. This meant uh, asking for a haircut on the principle, longer maturities and interest rates, and also something that I uh, I saw that in Nigeria was uh, also to taking is uh, GDP linked warrants. That means if we grow, we will be able to pay you more of your of your credit, the credit you gave us. Um, so some of the laws and the contractual clauses, we can go over this at some point. I agree that we need to explain this more, but we don't have more time today. The lock law, the write upon footer offers, cross default acceleration, pari passu. These four clauses were trying to encourage greater participation and try to involve most, as most people as possible. The first exchange, that exchange uh, was um, uh, done in two parts. The first one was uh, dealing with heterogeneous and dispersed creditors. And, uh, and then also they were able to, the government was able to neutralize the uh, IMF during the negotiations. And also the US government had a hands of policy at that time. Um, they also had a strong domestic support. The government was very, um, had, had a, a people, people behind them to, to really try to solve this debt problem. Um, it included a, uh, a, a great haircut, uh, uh, which is 77% uh, of the haircut. If I have time, I'll show you a graph comparing other countries. Uh, big red reduction and greater autonomy in economic policy. Also, it involved the full payment to the IMF debt in 2005. In 2010, this was reaffirmed by an extra uh, uh, proportion of the of the creditors on board uh, we we sorry we had uh 71% uh, uh, of the bond holds uh, before and we added to get to almost 93% of all of the debt as holding yeah we managed to to enter uh, most of the debt restructure the problem was the 7 percent that was hauled out, that was not accepting the debt uh, exchange, neither the 2005 and 2010. And this is um, what we, part of it, what we call the Balter Funds, we and the international community call the Balter Funds. Balter Funds are uh, funds which buy the debt in secondary uh, markets to be able to just litigate against these countries. And against this, the, the sovereign debt of these countries. They buy the debt very, very, very cheap. They are not uh, original bondholders. They, are, they buy them in secondary markets and they only buy them just with the objective of litigation, of going to the courts where this, uh, the legislation of the bond is based and go and just litigate and litigate. My friend Ali here, he, uh, he even uh, said something this morning about a ship that we were uh, that was uh, kept in Ghana to uh, to guarantee some of these uh, rights that these uh, uh, bondholders were claiming to have. Uh, we have a lot of different stories about what happened. Even trying to they would try to seize our embassy in the United States, um, and they claimed it's very technical. But what they claim is that they needed to have a, a much better treatment than the one that had been offered until they, well, for different reasons and different interpretations, and also for legal reasons, the, the government at that time, uh, which was a progressing government, didn't, gave the, didn't give them the, the capacity of, of uh, arranging any, any, um, anything. That, of course, backlashed on us in order to, uh, to get what they wanted, they went to uh, the, the, uh, the New York court. They finally got uh, uh, lost. The, the, uh, the judge Griesa, which is uh, uh, our, the, the, the representative of this of this um, 
judicial uh, New York uh, law. What they did was um, they got this judge to give them uh, a positive, um, the, 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 uh, to rule a positive ruling. And a uh, long story short, it's a very long story, but what happened was that the judge was able to cut all the payments on these bonds from Argentina to any kind of the creditors. So Argentina again went in selective default. Um, and this is why Stiglitz, uh, one also convert uh, from, from the international organizations who also saw that this was very unfair, was calling this uh, all this episode the grief was not a default, it was a, a default because of a ruling. Argentina was paying the bondholders, but the bondholders were not getting the money because of this uh, in the New York courts. So this brought us to a lot of discussions about the different approaches for the restructuring. There are basically two approaches. One is the statutory and the other one is the contractual. The statutory basically is based on the on these basic principles on sovereign debt restructuring processes that I mentioned in a question that I did earlier. And a couple of you also mentioned in your comments and in your expo expositions during these seminars. Um, and basically, it's about uh, trying to see that these uh, debts are not really uh, hampering uh, like the sovereignty of the countries and the inclusiveness of, the, of their growth. The contractual approach is getting, okay, uh, maybe uh, anti vulter clauses, and they are okay, but since it's a very dynamic process, sometimes Balters are ahead of these, these clauses, and this has been showing uh, in some of the restructurings that these clauses can be uh, eluded. I'm not saying it's not illegal, but it's illusion in itself. Um, the Balter conflict closed with arranging the, 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 in 2015, we had a new government. At the end of 2015, we had a right-wing government who uh, saw that uh, this had to be solved to inverted commas, uh, returned to the international markets. And, the, and he, uh, the president, decided to give the return that the vultures were asking for. This was an almost 2,000% mistaken in my, in my commas here, almost 2,000% return. So this is how the vultures uh, stage has, uh, was closed by the Macri's administration. Also, long story short, um, what happened is that Argentina entered in a very, very quick, accelerated uh, uh, macroeconomic further deterioration and uh, a new accelerated indebtedness cycle. Uh, it had, well, it went, it decided to go back to the IMF. We had been out of the IMF as a debtor for, since 2005. Uh, and, and so after 13 years, uh, this, the, this right wing government decides to go back to the IMF asking for a loan, which is completely novel, completely uh, out of, the, of any kind of uh, limits that the IMF uh, has, has adopted, almost $50 billion for Argentina. This is something we are now trying to deal up until today. Um, of course, it dramatically increased the, our government debt levels and worsened our debt structure composition, increased our fiscal resources allocation. It was really not a good sign. Um, in 2020, well, 2000, the end of 2019, we had another presidential election. We had a more left, center left um, uh, government in office who tried to deal with the debt restructuring of the previous government. And uh, that it, with a similar premises of growth to be able to pay and achieving debt sustainability, but within a context of much of, of a much weaker position, COVID, also like the uh, global markets were closed, not for us, but for everyone. Uh, also the threat of Walter strategy uh, were there. Uh, a lot of uh, different uh, things that we can go uh, if you have questions. The results were, were that there was also a haircut, uh, also had a good creditor participation. We did have clauses for um, collective action clauses. And, uh, but again, uh, 
like the, the payment scheme was to increase uh, to, to in this year, 24, 24. So there were a lot of doubts about its sustainability. Um, so basically, um, Argentina swing in external and economic policies, reflecting on its sovereign debt management strategies, progressive governments try to solve some of the debt restructuring, uh, try to restructure our debts. More right-wing governments try to uh, well, try to solve it somehow else, which was with more debt. Um, and so some of the lessons I was thinking to to try to convey to you today were uh, we have we have found that there's there are diff two different trade-offs. One is uh, between large haircuts and then the risk of another that restructure in the short run. Uh, another one is between acceptability and sustainability of the debt restructuring. A second lesson is uh, the market-friendly restructuring does not necessarily reduce the debt burden or ensures for future sustainability. Another one is that the Vulture case is a powerful legal weapon for creditors to put pressure on debtor countries, and we ought to be very, very careful with this in every single restructuring that you do. And also, well, in, in, on these lines, perhaps the, to highlight a statutory approach, which brings me to what we uh, have seen as, uh, I've heard about the political uh, aspects of the, of the destructuring. Nobody owes us a living. Some uh, person in the, in the uh, said that some, some of the people who were here presenting yesterday, um, that IMF and the Paris Club are not the right fora for debt renegotiations because they are part of the of, <laughs> of the creditors, and uh, and also to be able to really try to mutual uh, mutually cooperate multilaterally cooperate over the global south to be able to really try to find a solution because we Latin Americans we Argentinians we Africans we Asians don't think we can deal with this by our own. I think it's something that we have to really try to solve uh, together. Thank you. That's excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm sorry I had to be biased to this only the lady in the afternoon. She's in red as well. Um, any question at this stage for any of the three cases? Argentina, so please, um, so I see two, yes. So three, uh, Minister Ocampo and four. Uh, girl. Well, there is a lady at the back, so we'll start with you. <laughs> yes, it's an auction. So okay. please introduce yourself and direct your question to the, we have three cases, right? Yes. Sure. Okay, please go okay. ahead. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sandra, University of Ghana, MSC Development Finance. So um, this is not uh, a question for a particular person, but basically for all the panelists. Throughout yesterday's conversation, there was the issue of common actions um, in maneuvering the conditionalities associated with financing from the IMF and all of these creditors. Today's conversation and the case studies have shown the unique challenges that each country faces in terms of economic regimes. And so my question is, how are we able to um, um, come together and um, form collaborations and common actions to be able to pursue interests um, of countries that are going to the IMF and all of these organizations for, for financing? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, one, two, and then we will come to Mr. Ocampo. Uh, can I go first? Yes, you can go, go ahead, ahead. Michael. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Samuel Mwangi. I'm from uh, Kenyatta University, Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, my, I'm directing my question to the gentleman from um, Sri Lanka, professor from Sri Lanka. You've mentioned that um, the government has now gone to the uh, pension funds. And uh, the other way we know that pension funds uh, invest their funds is uh, uh, through government securities. So can you make it clear if uh, the commitment that were made by pension funds to uh, in the government securities is the same thing or different when you mean that uh, the government is going for pension funds? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's at the same table. Thank you very much. My name is Julian Samboko from Nation Media Group. I have a question on Argentina. 
Argentina went from issuing a century-long bond to the IMF stand in a matter of months. And I think that's a peculiarity because if you can go to the market with such a long tenant bond and in a matter of months you're back to the IMF, it's interesting. What are the sort of distinctions you see between the Argentinian case, so the century-long bond versus the Austrian case? And what do you think could be done better by Argentina? Thanks. We, we can take the last question of the first round. Yes, uh, Jose Ocampo. The mic is at the front. Yes, he wanted to come. Uh, I, I, I want to, to know, uh, the, I mean, we, we heard the haircut of uh, Argentina, but what was the haircut of Sri Lanka? What was the haircut uh, of uh, Ecuador? Ecuador. Uh, and also, uh, there was this debt for nature swap in, in the case of Ecuador for uh, the Galapagos Islands. Uh, uh, how uh, was it part of the process? Was sub separate process? Uh, and how large was it? Thank you very much. So we start with uh, Sri Lanka first. We can take this first round of questions. We will go for a second round. We still have some. Um, yes, you can. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so the main issue in the case of this domestic debt restructuring in Sri Lanka is that, you know, 90% of the treasury bonds, right, are owned by the pension funds, government managed pension funds, like, uh, sorry, 90% of the, uh, is in uh, 90% of, sorry, 90% of the EPF, the Employees Provident Fund, the the government managed pension funds uh, are in these uh, assets, uh, the treasury bonds, okay? So when the government then decides to enact this domestic debt restructuring and you have the central bank that is the custodian of these assets, but it is also pursuing the restructuring. Uh, you know, it, it's it's done in a very undemocratic way, right? Because they're supposed to manage these assets, but they're also the ones who are then imposing essentially this type of reduction. So that's the main kind of issue that we wanted to point out. Thank you. The, the... Ahilan, you want to compliment? Yes, please. Yeah. Go. In terms of the haircut, what, what we think we are going to get out of it is about um, 30%. Um, but I think that the bondholders were trying to push for 20% and it's still under negotiation. So with, with such a small haircut, and maybe I'll kind of, you know, I, um, recently I, I, I got the opportunity to meet somebody who's on Sri Lanka's creditor committee somebody fairly senior and I said, look, this is not sustainable, right? If with this kind of a haircut, we are going to be in another IMF agreement in three, four years. We're probably looking at another default in three, four years. What's your plan B, right? Because this is just not sustainable. Initially, they said there's no plan B. It's the IMF way or no way. But eventually they said, it's okay. We'll have another IMF program you can go through another domestic debt restructuring process. The important thing now is for a middle-income country that doesn't you know, uh, come into the common framework and so on is to get China on board with debt restructuring. Right? So that's the kind of cynical logic that is working. So all this austerity and the suffering that people are going through, at the end of the day, we might be repeating this three, four years down the line and there's going to be a prolonged crisis. And I'll just say one more thing in relation to this, right? The, the way I think which is relevant for debt restructuring all over the world is, you know, Marx somewhere talks about the hidden abode of production. And I've been thinking about what is the hidden abode of debt restructuring, right? Because on the one hand, I'm thinking it's going to fail. In another way, maybe it won't fail for the reason that what's not on paper is they're also preparing for a fire sale of our public assets from the Ceylon Electricity Board the, to the water utilities, all of that. What has happened to our real wages? It's come down 50%. So suddenly now we're going to be competitive with Bangladesh in terms of the garment sector, right? What's, what's actually happening? Who's absorbing the, the social cost of it? Who's absorbing what is you know, being brought on as debt restructuring? It's the households. It's very gendered as well. It's you know, when electricity costs 
go fourfold, when bus fares are triple, malnutrition, school dropouts, that is how it's going to be absorbed. And, and you know, it's not like Africa where we have huge amount of natural resources, but one of those laws that I mentioned is also a new fisheries act, which is going to give licenses for foreign fishing vessels to come into Sri Lanka. And we have, in the, in the, just in the province that I'm from, a fifth of our population depends on small scale fisheries. The World Bank's agriculture modernization program. So, so what is not said on paper, but what we're going to see with this debt restructuring process is extremely worrying. And I think that's probably true for many of the countries here in Africa as well. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we will move to John, but in the meantime, can someone help me move the, the mic to the gentleman who asked the question on Argentina and Austria, because Andrea didn't get the question right, so we will ask you to repeat and clarify. In the meantime, John, you can address the the question on you. Yes, uh, it was from Ocampo, the haircut process. Okay, thank you. Um, well, and concerning haircuts in Ecuador, uh, first of all, I want to talk about the um, renegotiation of bonds during the um, global financial crisis. Uh, Ecuador, during um, the year 2008, achieved a renegotiation of bonds that uh, implied a reduction of around $2 billion in terms of principal and also a reduction of 50% in terms of debt service. In that time, it was like a, a nice deal because we, we achieved a considerable reduction of debt uh, justified by some audits that claimed that debt was in, fa in fact unjustified, injustice, and so on. The problem was that after the negotiation of those bonds during the financial crisis, uh, Ecuador was excluded from the financial markets, from the conventional financial markets. So since 2010, Ecuador um, uh, applied for loans from China. So during 2010 to 2014, more or less, Ecuador um, increased in a huge way, in a huge amount of um, loans from China, particularly to build high infrastructure, important infrastructure. Uh, however, uh, the problem with the Chinese loans obtaining during that time were that the loans had really uh, really short maturities and high interest rates below uh, 20 per 10% in some cases and less than 10, 10, 15 years. So what happened is that during 2014, Ecuador had to issue bonds again, but also the bonds had a problem with high interest rates and short maturities because of the precedent of the renegotiation of 2008 and 2009. That's the one. And the other haircut uh, was during the pandemics. In 2020, Ecuador uh, was not able to pay the interest of around 10 bonds, so they have to renegotiate those bonds, and it implied that for at least two months, Ecuador had to stop the payments of public employees, uh, public services, and so on, until the renegotiation was achieved. It was between April and August 2020. And after that, the IMF considered a new um, agreement to Ecuador, but also, uh, well, in terms of the reduction, it was around $1.5 billion, more or less. But the problem was that um, the renegotiation during 2020 only give, gave Ecuador a few years. In fact, since now, since this year, Ecuador has to pay some of the bonds that were renegotiated during pandemics. And the problem is so huge that in 2026, Ecuador has to pay around 7% of GDP only of those bonds that were renegotiated. So there is a huge burden of payments until 2030, more or less. So that's the, the, the issue. And only to complete the idea concerning Galapagos, it was a different process as far as I know. And it's most concerning, all comparing with all the burden of external debt is, is a minimum. So it's not, it's another process, not in the same, in the same logic. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, you're ready, please. And it, it's on the same question, right? The short-term bonds, but you were comparing the Austrian, yeah. the Argentinian with the Austrian, so that's what you wanted to know. Yeah. Uh, Can I just clarify? It? Yes, sorry. please. Yes, please. Um, let me make it shorter. So, and it's sorry. We're hearing you. 
Yes, Argentina got to market with a century-long bond and shortly is running to the IMF for a bailout. And maybe let me just clarify. So the question is, what exactly was the market missing in this case? Uh, was it closures on some of them? Was it a question of the disclosures made? Or was it the question of the markets banking on the fact that Argentina can keep going to the fund and getting a safety net? Let me just leave it at that and leave Austria out of it. Thanks. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to understand. Um, you're asking me between uh, uh, why Argentina had uh, first, uh, were, we were issuing a 100 year bond and then we went to the IMF, what was missing? Okay, yeah. Uh, um, we, the, the country was uh, supposedly going back to the, after, after our default and after uh, arranging with the, with the Balters, uh, the country was uh, struggling to uh, go back support, as, as the government at that time was qualifying it to the international markets. The problem is that they were not, uh, they were opening the capital, capital, capital account, they were opening all the trade uh, balance, uh, they were really open the economy, they liberalizing, and uh, the country wasn't really getting all the investment that were, they were supposed to get. Uh, on top of it, they were uh, investing in these uh, bonds. Uh, they were trying to get more debt than what they could afford. And this all brought uh, into a, a, another uh, age of, uh, of indebtedness and, and vulnerability and, and fragility in the financial markets. And that's also why they went. There's another explanation. I, I need to first make a disclosure. I wrote this uh, this paper and this presentation with a colleague who knows much more than me in, in debt restructuring. She's called Emilia Val, and uh, she was uh, working on her PhD thesis on this. Um, I'm not saying this to blame her at all. I, she's not here today, so she's uh, she's more than, uh, than forgiven for, for what I'm saying, but there's an, a completely political aspect of what happened with the IMF in 2018, which I think is much more important than the macroeconomic ones. Uh, this was a president who, was, who came with the markets, who came with the Davos consensus, and who came to take away the populistic uh, government that had been going on for 12 years before him. Uh, so the political reason behind the IMF loan is not just we were entering a debt crisis, we were entering a macroeconomic crisis, uh, we were having you know macroeconomic problems. But the main reason why uh, Argentina went to the IMF was to be able to continue these policies, the liberalization, neoliberal policies, um, and not only that, that didn't even work because what happened was that most of the lending of the IMF and even the IMF kind of, not very openly, but kind of uh, accepted, uh, blew away. So most of it is not that we have it in any kind of investment in the country. It's not that we were able to reduce our debt, all of the contrary. So it was mainly political. So that's why I think it's it's complicated to deal with this with these international organizations when you are on a weak side on a crisis uh, on the advent of the crisis and that takes me to to answer as well uh, the first question they made just one minute how do we uh, confront this is what I interpreted how do we confront these international organizations uh, together and I think that that's uh, that's a challenge that we ought to really learn from each other and I think that this kind of of, of seminars, conferences, and get together, which should help us to understand that we are all in the same boat to be able to really confront uh, these Northern powers. Merci beaucoup, Andrea. Alors, je vais sortir, du, parce que la question que la dame à l'arrière avait posée, la première question, um, est une question qu'en général, les gouvernements traitent. Je voudrais appeler, uh, demander à professeur Sheriff uh, de, de m'aider sur ça. Comment est-ce qu'on peut euh, vraiment s'organiser euh, Parce que on parle beaucoup de solidarité sud-sud, mais c'est une solidarité gouvernement-gouvernement hein, quand on parle de, 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 de ces questions-là. 
Est-ce que vous pourriez, euh, parce que ce n'était pas une question adressée à quelqu'un particulièrement, ce n'est pas un KPI non plus. Euh, je, je vous donne mon micro. <rire> Merci beaucoup. Merci pour la pression. Et je crois que c'est lié à un problème que je voulais soulever à la fin de la réunion, c'est-à-dire comment travailler solidairement, arriver à avoir une plateforme, disons, commune pour trouver des alternatives réalistes et réalisables, évidemment. Donc, nous sommes en train de lancer un think tank continental sur la, la comparaison des politiques publiques, monétaires et financières sur le continent, à travers des groupes. Donc, nous sommes les deux experts. Donc, on sera dans le coup et tout le monde. Je crois que c'est ce qu'il faut faire. On ne peut pas, euh, euh, disons, coopérer sans se connaître suffisamment à deux niveaux. Le premier, c'est le niveau culturel. Et moi, je considère l'économie politique comme une science culturelle. Vous ne pouvez pas bâtir une coopération si vous ne vous connaissez pas. Dans du culturel, connaître l'incidence de votre type de consommation, de la consommation des ménages, du panier des ménages, c'est-à-dire la prise sur ce qu'on consomme, et disons permet de dégager un certain nombre de choses pour avoir une emprise sur vraiment la monnaie et son usage, que ce soit pour s'endetter ou pour autre chose. Donc, très simplement, pour le moment, disons que travaillons au niveau régional, échangeons nos travaux et nous ferons ensuite la part des choses. Et à ce moment-là, on verra quels sont les axes sur lesquels, évidemment, on peut avoir des échanges féconds. Parce qu'il ne faudrait pas que quand on se retrouve quand l'Afrique parle, les autres sommes nuls. Quand, quand les autres parlent, les Africains sommes nuls. Je crois que c'est surtout cette barrière-là qu'il faut lever. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, euh, professeur Sharif. Alors, au niveau, je crois qu'on est sur la bonne voie parce que c'est ce que euh, Ndongo et Mara ont fait depuis des années, d'organiser de, de, cette conférence et l'autre, euh, qui est presque la sœur de celle-là, qui va se tenir peut-être à Addis Abeba hein, à la fin de cette année. Euh, donc voilà, c'est des plateformes. La plateforme existe déjà. C'est de, de continuer à, à, à l'entretenir. Euh, vous avez été généreux avec nous. Je crois qu'on a exaucé, sauf s'il y a une autre question de la salle. On pourrait prendre une question en une minute. Vous direz à qui vous l'adressez, si vous non, pouvez y aller. Je, je l'adresse à, à la dame de l'Argentine. Andrea, très bien. Andrea, euh, ma question elle est de l'ordre de la curiosité euh, politique euh, euh, en ce moment. Euh, on, nous connaissons la situation de l'Argentine, n'est-ce pas euh, ma, ma question est très claire. Est-ce que la situation politique en Argentine joue euh, sur la capacité de négociation de ce pays, en particulier avec le FMI Un. Deuxièmement, euh, est-ce que la situation politique en Argentine, euh, aggrave ou facilite l'accès aux ressources et l'accès au marché euh, euh, financier. Mon Dieu. OK, I will, I will have to go back in English. Pardon, mais mon français, c'est... Uh, are you talking... Vous parlez maintenant? Oh, no. Oh. I was afraid this was going to happen. OK. Um, We have a current situation which is very difficult. I just, um, I don't think I am able to assess the gravity of what's going on in my country at this point. Um, I was, that's why I, I just talked about the 2005 to, to 2020 restructurings. At the moment, I only hope that uh, this, Uh, government. I'm trying to be as diplomatic as possible. Um, at the moment, I only hope that our current government uh, doesn't get the means to get more debt. That's all I can say in public. We can, of course, inter share whenever we you want. Thank you.
Merci beaucoup. We have two more minutes. I give one minute to each. John, you want to start? Uh, you have a mic. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think the uh, taking on the, the last couple of questions, the, the challenge for us as economists, researchers, and so on is also uh, ideological, right? Why is it that with such a uh, difficult situation, so much suffering and so on, we are not able to translate our ideas to the working people, right? How is it that this sort of hegemonic ideas, not only Sri Lanka, I think everywhere, we know what's happened, but then we are still told that, you know, trade liberalization is the way forward. You don't touch trade. Why is it that, you know, we, we see the food crisis, we continue to neglect agriculture and food. How, how are we going to get these ideas up there? Or, you know, financialization poses another challenge because how do we, if, even about trade, it's easy to go and talk to trade unions to explain this. But when it comes to finance, financialization, bonds, we have to find the language to be able to get the message out to the people. And I think we need to revive concepts that have been there. I mean, even Keynes in the 1930s was talking about self-sufficiency. In the Arusha Declaration, it's there. In the new international economic order, there is. So we need to uh, revive these concepts. OK, thank you. Um, I completely agree that one of the most important things we have to discuss is ideology. Even when we understand how money works and how we implement some type of monetary scheme, and also when we enter into discussion about debt, without a clear discussion about ideology, about what we think is, even what is good, what's bad about the economy, about people, uh, I think without that discussion, we are not going anywhere. And to have that discussion, we need to hear each other. We need more spaces where um, I think Africa and Latin America and other regions around the world need to be need to expose their situations. We need to hear each other. We share a lot of values, a lot of problems, and maybe we can share some solutions, even radical solutions that uh, deserve to be taken. I think as soon as possible, because imagine that the emerging world has a problem with that. We are close to a global, uh, as, as I see it, a uh, global crisis with external debt from emerging countries. And that may be the most important or most oh, one of the most important consequences of COVID-19 pandemics. So if we do not agree to share our experiences soon, maybe it will be the circumstances and the crisis that will put all together in the same hole. Thank you very much, Devaka. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to speak very briefly this last point, too, about um, coordination. You know, at the start of this uh, crisis, you know, especially in the case of Sri Lanka, there was a lot of talk about debt distress and how there's going to be a coming wave of defaults, right? But as uh, my uh, colleague Ahilan mentioned, you know, now it's being reframed as a liquidity crisis, not a solvency crisis. But I think key thing is when we pull back and uh, all these issues like debt restructuring, we have to ask as well, who is the arbiter, right? Who is actually managing this process? Because in the meantime, the IMF is implementing these policies. And so when we even rate like debt, or whether there should be debt relief, or even debt cancellation. We're also thinking of the policy space for Sri Lanka to be able to pursue its own initiatives. So like that, I think we also have to come back to this question of the policies behind this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Devaka. Ahilan, Devaka, Andrea, John, thank you very much. For, we try to keep to the time. We were given until 3.30. We are three minutes over. We really thank you. Thank you for everyone for listening to them. Um, I hope we didn't do, we did justice to the time. Are we going for a coffee break or passing on to someone else? All right, please. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
ଅଛନ୍ତି So good afternoon. If I may call this session to order, welcome you to this panel on debt, gender, and social policy. It's a collaborative effort between ideas and the gender equitable and transformative social policy for post COVID 19 Africa, GetSPA project. GetSPA is a Pan-African research capacity building, policy engagement, and network building project to that fit for the ambitions of real structural transformation in Africa. I'm really pleased that we are having this panel soon after the panel we had before, because it's a very good fit and it completes the pivot from more technical economic discussions about debt restructuring and the international financial um, architecture. Throughout the um, yesterday and this morning, social issues have been rumbling in the background of our deliberations on debt restructuring conditionalities on questions such as austerity, the removal of subsidies and taxation. 
Some of the case studies we heard this morning, Nigeria and Zambia touched on these conditionalities and their implications. The Sri Lankan case study was very instructive in this regard, and I'm really grateful to Ahilan and his colleague for their presentation on Sri Lanka. I think as a project, we can learn a lot from, from, from the work that they, 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 they are doing. I'm really happy we are having this panel because I think the issue of social policy is very central to the debt crisis in the sense that social policies, social spending, social policy institutions, and even social relations can make an effective contribution to structural transformation, economic and social resilience, debt sustainability, and, and, and many of the issues we are talking about. I just want to offer a few examples of how debt and social policy inter intersect just from listening to our conversations and also from thinking about this project. So the effects of debt restructuring on the economy and on livelihoods and on social reproduction of working people, particularly when you think of the uh, economic contraction, you think of the wage issues that were being raised in the last panel, you think of currency devaluations and inflation, you can immediately see that, 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 that connection. A second way is the implications of debt restructuring on budget spending on social policy, social sectors, and social groups. A number of, of the presentations talked about this trade-off between spending on debt restructuring and, 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 and spending on, 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 on the needs for growth and, 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 for, and for, for, for social development. A third way is the implications of the increase in aggressive and regressive taxation. Again, several studies talked about taxation, and we know who is paying the taxes and which social groups are most affected by the indirect and consumption taxes that um, have become the, the staple of, of, of debt restructuring. A fourth way is the implication of domestic debt restructuring on pension funds and individual local bondholders. Again, we talked about domestic uh, debt restructuring and, 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 and its implications for, for the local economy, but for, for people holding government paper, but also for pension funds. If we attend to all these issues, it will deepen our analysis of the effects of the debt crisis and debt restructuring, and hopefully influence our recommendations for alternatives to austerity and the reform of the global financial architecture. So as researchers of social policy who are not experts on debt and finance for development, we are also very keen to understand in deeper ways the contours of the debt crisis and the global financial architecture in order to make our research more relevant to your work on alternatives. And we are interested in thinking with you around these questions. So there are two questions we, 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 we can consider together. One of them is which social policy approaches and policies would be most effective in growing and transforming African economies to protect them from future debt distress and, and, and debt restructuring. The second one is which approaches and policies will be most helpful for protecting citizens and economies from some of the most deleterious effects of the current approaches to debt re uh, restructuring that we've spent the last two days talking about. To, to begin to look at some of these um, questions and, and, and issues, we have a panel composed of scholars from multiple disciplines who recently began to engage with these issues in a seven country study on, on Africa and the global debt crisis implications for social policy, which has been commissioned by GetSPA. So the countries of study are Ghana, Zambia, Kenya, Egypt, Ethiopia, Mozambique, and Tunisia. And you will see that some of your, your the, the, the ideas case studies cover some of these countries. We, we um, this part, for this panel, we have four of, of the, of the countries to speak to us about the work they are doing. So we will have Ghana, Zambia, Kenya, and Egypt. Researchers from Tunisia and Mozambique may be online, and so they can contribute to deliberations. And please be aware that our discussions will be quite preliminary. 
because the researchers have only just begun work. And so we really would value your comments and thoughts on, on, on the work that, that we are doing. I'll first then like to in introduce our, our first um, panelist, and it's a joint, um, a, a, a jointly authored uh, research um, endeavor. It's being done by Kofi Asanti, who's to my extreme right, and then Emmanuel Koju, who sits next to him. Kofi Asanti is a senior research fellow at the Institute of Statistical, Social, and Economic Research, ISE, at the University of Ghana. And his work is at the intersection of political, economic, and historical sociology. Emmanuel a. Kojo is a senior lecturer and program coordinator of the Economic Policy Management Program, EPMAP, at the University of Ghana. So, colleagues, you have the floor. Yeah. And no more than 12 minutes. You know that already. Which one is it? Uh, All right, um, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to start our side of the presentation. Hello? Okay, so I'm going to... There's an echo somewhere. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so I will start and my colleague will do the second part. Our bet is on transformative social policy and the debt crisis in Ghana. So I'm going to start with a brief background and um, hopefully when our slides are loaded, it will be easy to follow. All right, so there's a lot that has generally been said about the debt crisis. We've seen all the experiences from up across the global south. And Ghana has also gone through a very expensive and I'll say very painful process fairly recently, particularly because of the domestic debt exchange program, which brought a lot of painful haircuts to many pension holders, as well as individual bond holders. But of course, our study is to explore the social policy implications, particularly because of the consequences of the, a few couple of years on the levels of poverty in Ghana. Based on some preliminary estimates, poverty is, I mean, those that are classified poor has probably increased by more than 800,000 in the last two years, which certainly is worrying. Now, the question which we seek to address is to work within the social policy transformation framework, particularly those proposed by Adesina and Mukandawere, regarding how governments can help address some of the social problems that confront not just Ghana, but many other developing countries. Now, in terms of the usual approach, which we normally tend to see, 
the IMF has its own program. And depending on whether you have a government that is favorable in terms of the IMF disposition or one that is willing to challenge that, you might have contrasting approaches to addressing a problem. Well, in the case of Ghana, at least the government has bought on to that and has implemented a range of policy measures aimed at addressing our domestic debt and external debt problem, although this is not completed yet. But nevertheless, there are growing voices of dissent, of worry, and of the consequences of such domestic debt problems, as well as external debt restructuring, which might impact on government's ability to effectively pursue social policy within its social policy framework, right? Now, unfortunately, because you can see what I presumably have on the, on the slide, it's only a minor comment I might add that there was um, one of our MPs who made, um, well, I'll say a statement on the floor of parliament concerning the choices that were to be made, not just by, shall we call them, those that are less privileged, but also those that are in the ruling class and the political elite. And he cited a lot of the largesse that they enjoy, which must be cut. But of course, the question that one will ask is whether there is real commitment to reducing the expenditures of those on the upper end of the income class, or it was just rhetoric. Now, there are a few things that I will just finally say before I let my colleague take um, um, over from me. Now, these broadly relate to the implementation and the consequences of the IMF program that Ghana signed on to, which broadly works towards increasing the tax net base and raising as much revenue as possible, using as many means as possible, which of course, based on, I think, what I just heard from Sri Lanka would imply, in the case of Ghana, increasing electricity tariffs, which already began for about a year, increasing tariffs on water, as well as other taxes that are being brought on board. Now, these certainly have implications, not just on existing poverty levels, but those who are also above the poverty line. Now, the other effect is on the real spending which would be undertaken for social policy programs. But this is where the next challenge, as far as the work that we intend to be doing, um, would follow. So I'll now hand over to my colleague, Kofi, to take over. Thank you very much. So um, I would quickly go over. This is one of the slides my colleague wanted to show, um, which shows the common sense uh, views on the debt crisis in Ghana, the diagnosis of it and the prescription. And we've actually uh, added some YouTube comments on the two species. One, as my colleague said, was asking for government to make sacrifices as well as citizens. And one of the comments was saying, uh, asking God to deliver Ghana and by implication Africans from wicked old men who refer to the politicians. Now, this common sense view in a way diverges from recent learnings from the IMF itself, right? In 2016, uh, three IMF staff members, senior staff members writing in the IMF publication, Finance and the, um, Development, actually spoke very harshly of neoliberalism in general and the austerity policies they push. Um, three of which we are uh, highlighting here because they are also linked to the debt distress, capital account uh, liberalization, reducing the size of the state, 
which of course has implication for the expansion of the productive capacity of the state, as well as increasing tax burdens on citizens. And they acknowledge in that uh, publication that these policies actually do not lead to increased growth, whereas they lead to increased inequality, uh, which has po political implications, you know, legitimacy and whatnot. And they also store structural um, transformation of the economies because they reduce the uh, ability of governments to actually make the kinds of investment needed to shift the, the uh, uh, economic base of the country. But then it seems the IMF itself is not learning from its own internal learnings because the current program Ghana is undertaking has elements of austerity, right? The government is supposed to um, limit employment to the public sector by just a half of a percent uh, to absorb just a half of the labor force into the public sector. Uh, there's supposed to be limits on uh, public wages, um, tax to GDP rates has to be increased. And we've talked a lot in the course of this conference about how wealth has to be taxed, how you know multinational companies have to be taxed. But in all the discussions about tax to GDP ratio, the focus so far has been on the informal sector, who recent publication research is showing that they are actually paying a disproportionate share of their incomes to tolls and fees and whatnot. Um, and of course, they're supposed to be quarterly adjustments. Now, what the IMF has done is to throw a kind of fig, fig leaf, as Oxfam calls it, you know, introduce social protections floor to protect the vulnerable. Um, and the country, um, the mission chief, actually speaking in October last year, said he was very pleased with Ghana's LEAP program. LEAP is the livelihood, um, livelihood empowerment against poverty. Um, it's a conditional cash transfer program. And scholars of social policy has, have, have pointed out that these conditional transfers are very stigmatizing humiliating because you really have to, um, I guess, humble yourself, so to speak, right, in order to qualify. Um, the money doesn't amount to much at all. Last year, it was increased uh, to between 128 to 212 Ghana cities, less than $20, uh, you know, uh, by, on a bi-monthly basis. This is double what was being paid previously. So you can, you can tell the uh, um, benefits that the poor are getting from it. So like I said, it's been discussed, described as a, a fig leaf of austerity because it's deeply inadequate, inconsistent, opaque, and of course, fail to achieve uh, its goal. On the broader basis, again, as scholars like Adeshina and Kandewere has pointed out, this social protection paradigm do not address the underlying cause of vulnerability, which is the neoliberal policies, which are pushed by the IMF itself, which also reduce the productive capacity of the state. And the goal of transformative social policy is the political need to link economic development to social development and to assure the targeted uh, focus. Of course, this goes back to the early years of independence when um, the founding African president actually pursued social policy as a means to you know, bridge the gap in development be between the advanced countries and the, the developing countries as well. And maybe uh, to say something briefly here because in the keynote address, it was emphasized that debt is also a very political problem. Uh, uh, a very political issue, not just a financial one, um, which requires that um, the kinds of expanded expenditure, social spending that we are talking about um, brings to the fore the need for developmental statecraft. Um, we know some people have argued the developmental state is impossible in Africa, uh, but there's no reason to, to think this is an impossibility. And again, uh, Tandika and Kandrewera have spoken a lot about this. Of course, talking about developmental statecraft 
brings in the issue of governance, right? And there's been a lot of talk about corruption and, and whatnot. I think from our perspective, there is of course a need for a shift in governance, uh, but in a way that will shift accountability to citizens rather than to the development uh, um, partners. Um, again, there's a lot of there's been a lot of work done about how reliance on donor funding uh, renders African countries into what is described as choiceless democracies, because it really doesn't matter who is voted for the uh, uh, financial institutions that the donors have the financing. And yesterday, Dumo mentioned how you have more African countries visiting Davos than visiting the UN because uh, uh, that's where they are getting, you know, they are there to negotiate for uh, uh, funding. So going forward um, would be really examining the options that exist within the austere pol policies that, austere framework that this death distress has, has caused, the options that exist within the co this context for the pursuit of transformative social policy. And we'll be looking at a whole range of policies from LEAP, which falls within the social protection framework, you know, very narrow and targeted to, you know, a policy like the free senior high school, uh, which is a universal, approach, but they're very expensive. And since Ghana's economic crisis, there's been a lot of political pressure for the government to abandon it. So we'll end here and uh, look forward to your questions and contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much for keeping to the time. I'd not, I'd not like to move to our second panel, which is online. Again, the panel has, has two um two speakers or rather the, the the panel is being represented by one of two persons and the authors to the zambia research are nkumbu nawemba who has a phd in rural research rural development and management from china agricultural university and researches foreign aid agricultural investments farmer input programs and agricultural insurance and she works at the Ministry of Agriculture in Zambia. And then the, the second author is Charles Masili Banda, who's a PhD candidate at SOAS, University of London, and a, a special research fellow at the University of Zambia in the Department of Economics. His doctoral work is focusing on the socioeconomic investigation of nutrition transition in Zambia and its implications on policy. So Charles, if you are online. Yes, I am. It's your turn. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure. So this is a work in progress. Uh, it's preliminary work that we have started working on. And um, we are looking at uh, a debt, gender, and social policy in Zambia. So basically, Zambia's debt has been on the rise. And Zambia has been a topic of discussion during this uh, conference. We have heard so much about Zambia. And uh, briefly, I would say that um, we are currently restructuring debt in Zambia, uh, which is over almost $15 billion. And uh, in June, uh, bilateral creditors agreed to restructure at $6.3 billion. Then this week on Monday, uh, Euro bondholders agreed to restructure 3 billion of Zambia's uh, euro bond debt and uh, some negotiations are yet to start with the commercial or private creditors and this is about 5 billion dollars or so meaning that only 75% uh, of Zambia's external debt has been 
restructured. So in the process of this debt restructuring process, and in the period uh, in which Zambia has had this debt, uh, what we have seen over the years, as we shall see later, is that poverty in Zambia has risen uh, between uh, 2010 and 2022, when the last living conditions and monitoring survey was done in Zambia. So over this period of time, Zambia has contracted so much debt, but at the same time, we have seen poverty levels rising. So a look, a closer look at the budgetary allocations to the social sectors, what we have noted is that um, uh, the social sectors we are focusing on is education, health, social protection, water, sanitation, and hygiene. And the allocation to these sectors uh, is one third, but there are interesting things uh, in this uh, in, in the 2024 budget. For example, um, if we look at the comparison with the uh, the year 2023, what we see is that uh, there is a nominal increase in the budget to social sectors of 18 percent, but in real terms, this increase is only 3.8 percent. The education sector, for example, has got a nominal increase of 18%, but in real terms, it is only a 4% increase. The same thing with the health sector, 20% nominal increase, but the, in real terms, it's only 6%. Then social protection, uh, which has a component of social cash transfers and food security packs, experienced a decline in real terms of 3 and 8% in real terms. So even the amounts that people receive in terms of social cash transfers uh, has been, uh, is more. What is quite shocking is that the issues of water and sanitation actually had a decrease in allocation uh, in the 2024 national budget for Zambia, for example. And this is in the process or in the period in which Zambia has been negotiating the debt uh, restructuring uh, process. So despite the positive reforms undertaken by the government of Zambia, the delays that have occurred with the, uh, the debt restructuring process have been compromising its ability to mobilize and maximize resources for social spending and the, the full realization of uh, human rights. For example, in the education sector, what we see is that in as much as uh, Zambia currently is implementing free education for primary education, the quality of education is somehow compromised in the sense that the average uh, teacher to pupils ratio is quite uh, um, high. The access to teaching aids is low. Support infrastructure like desks, for example, is uh, uh, in shortage in, this, in, in, in schools. So government, through its efforts of increasing uh, the constituency development funds, have been encouraging constituencies to be able to use part of the allocation to acquire things like desks that can support uh, uh, learning in schools. The health sector is equally not spared. We see that um, our hospitals in Zambia, and especially the rural ones, tend to be understaffed. So that's a challenge we have in the midst of uh, this debt that we have. For farmers in the agricultural sector also, we still have a huge challenge in terms of uh, extension officers, where uh, instead of one extension officer tending to 400 farmers, we have cases where one extension officers would attend to uh, 1,200 uh, farmers in some, some areas. So what are the potential benefits of this debt restructuring process? Government this week, after securing a deal with the, the euro bond holders, they did announce that um, the euro bond holders have foregone about 800 and 40 million dollars in claims because Zambia defaulted its debt in 2020 and uh, we could, we accumulated the uh, penalties or the interest that was not paid 
Then government also announced that uh, approximately 2.5 billion in cash flows uh, will be the relief through reduced debt servicing payments during the period in which Zambia is under the IMF program. So what remains to be done uh, or the benefits remains unclear because of the risks that are associated with the um, austerity measures that tend to emphasize spending on economic sectors rather than social spending. And from the figures I gave earlier, we can see that already in real terms, uh, the spending is not increasing as it should be. And in some cases, there has been a decline in, in social spending. So I did mention earlier that um, we have restructured 6.3 billion uh, from bilateral data, I mean creditors, sorry, then euro bond uh, this week uh, on Monday, uh, 3 billion, they agreed to restructure. The official, the commercial creditors, they are yet to negotiate. And it is uh, it is argued that the uh, government, like we, I, present, I mentioned in the previous slide, that there will be increased resources for social spending, then uh, improved service delivery, uh, more people be able to access improved health services. Government has been making efforts, of course, in the past uh, two years by gradually increasing or employing the number of health workers in Zambia. The same case has been the case in education where more teachers are being uh, employed. Safe, social safety nets, um, social cash transfer amounts, of course, have been increasing, but the risk has been that uh, the amount is too little and it tends to get eroded by the cost of living and uh, the inflation which has been uh, on the rise. The challenge is that uh, in as much as uh, it is uh, promised that poverty levels and inequalities may reduce, this may not be the case because of issues around growth because it is argued that there will be increased growth but the growth may not be inclusive given that um, the huge population is operating in the informal uh, sector. So there are risks that Zambia is facing uh, with regards to the debt restructuring process. Uh, these risks are mainly emanating from the exchange rate risks, for example. Zambia's currency has been depreciating and has depreciated more than four times um, from the time, for example, government borrowed money through the euro bonds and the debt they have contracted. What this means is that um, in terms of the domestic currency, Zambia's debt in terms of repayment of interest and principal amount, in the local currency, it has increased more than four times. In dollar amount, yes, you may say you have borrowed um, three billion, but in quarter terms to repay the interest on that three billion, you find that in quarter terms you need more quarters to service the debt. This tends to erode the uh, amount of money that is available for for social uh, spending. So the other risk arising from the same depreciation of the currency is the inflation, which has been on the rise. It's been increasing gradually and the cost of living has been going up. The situation this year is being worsened by uh, issues arising from climate change. Uh, Zambia is experiencing uh, a disaster uh, in terms of uh, drought. So this is threatening food security and the households will face uh, food insecurity despite having a uh, debt being restructured. So the growth, even the economic growth itself within the economy will be affected because agricultural sector its contribution will decline, meaning that uh, Zambia may not realize the full benefits uh, as planned from the debt restructuring uh, process. So of course, this is uh, just about what 
is being said about what is contained in the deal so far. I've mentioned these figures in the previous uh, uh, slides about what government is claiming that uh, there's uh, what $840 million which has been forgone and $2.5 billion that uh, the cash relief in terms of what might be available for Zambia to, to spend. Please, can you round up? Sure. So, all in all, we are saying that uh, in terms of uh, their reduced resources, the social services are strained, and uh, there is erosion of uh, the safety uh, safety nets. So, in conclusion, in terms of the gender dynamics. Uh, the poverty levels in Zambia, as we can see from this uh, uh, figure, is that uh, the poverty levels are high in uh, households that are headed by women. And we can see that uh, the poverty levels have gone up um, from the figures that were there in 2015 to the figures that we have in 2022. And the figures are higher in uh, female-headed uh, households. So, in conclusion, uh, the debt restructuring is an important step for economic restructuring and comes with several benefits as we are expecting. However, what happens to Zambia's economy will mainly depend on how the government uses the breathing space, especially concerning increasing spending on social services. As I indicated, the risk is on exchange rate depreciation the energy crisis we are facing, and uh, unemployment of women may increase, and mainly these austerity measures that are being uh, implemented impact women more, as they are the majority who receive uh, uh, social safety nets. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much for, for, for that story about Zambia. I now would like to turn to Amira Mahmoud Osman from Egypt. Amira is a social researcher with interdisciplinary interest in equitable transformation, sociolinguistics, and empowerment through art. She's currently studying for another master's in applied linguistics at the American University of Cairo. Thank you, Amira. Hello, I hope I am audible uh, and I apologize for not being able to attend in person. I know it's also been a, a probably a long day, so I'm just go, not going to take a, much of your time. Um, as Professor uh, Chikata mentioned, I was part of the GetSpa uh, project that was um, tasked with doing uh, a kind of a century long research on Egypt and um, the colonial legacy in terms of debt, social policy and gender and general macroeconomic situation. So the carryover from that project is that that is uh, a colonial legacy. Uh, this guy over here was the viceroy of Egypt under the Ottoman Empire and was the first person to decide to take uh, an external loan in the history of Egypt and that was in 1860. And then it spiraled into uh, 60 million francs from a personal loan of 28 million francs within just two years. And long story short, after a series of successions and a default and indebtedness and so on, this paved way for the British colonization of Egypt in 1882. The years that follow, uh, except of course for the immediate post-independence era, which uh, upheld uh, nationalism, socialism, and these kinds of principles, However, the, the trend of debt uh, loan borrowing and debt applications continued. And um, we began to see by the 1970s that external debt represents a, a substantial figure of GNI, which actually within just a couple of years rose to, again, unpre unprecedented levels. And what is kind of important here in terms of social policy making and the emphasis on the bottom up approaches and the people and so on, is that the, the first um, IMF and uh, World Bank rescue package that was introduced in the 90s 
proved to be very um, daunting in terms of the austerity measures and what the people had to, to wear. So when this was proposed again in 2012, it was actually tabled because of the fierce popular resistance that happened. Uh, until, of course, 2016 and the uh, draconian austerity measures when the brink, like we were on the brink of an economic collapse. What is interesting over here is that ever since, it's just been a cycle of debt and loops and then loans to pay off the debts and so on. So this, of course, affected the credit worthiness of Egypt. And as we will see when we fast forward to the contemporary times, the external debt has just skyrocketed. Uh, since 2014, 2015. And this has also coincided with extensive borrowing, extensive borrowing for mega projects. We're going to get to that in a couple of minutes. Moving forward from over here, this year alone, Egypt is required to pay um, over $32 billion just in external debt service payments. And this continues, of course, this is the trend up till 2028. So, these are all very macroeconomic terms. This is a conference full of economic experts. So I'm just gonna fast forward to, this is the breakdown of the multilateral entities that uh, Egypt is indebted to. And what we're interested more here is the consumer price index. So as we can see, things are skyrocketing. And if we zoom in on this consumer price index, there's um, a very, very um, interesting, beneficial and kind of groundbreaking study that was done by the uh, official authority for statistics, so the Center for uh, Statistics Nationwide. And why this is important is because generally Egypt as an authoritarian state does not um, appreciate, we can say, uh, research culture in general. So it's very difficult to come across studies that actually tackle the social policy implications of things and like do door-to-door -door surveys and so on. But anyway, there was this one very interesting survey in 2020, immediately after the COVID repercussions. And the one among the questions were, was the issue of consumption patterns, consumption patterns and how they were affected in terms of uh, food intake. So at the level of the family, uh, what people were doing and when, when having meals, did they eat more, for example, meat, poultry, fish, and fruits, did they eat less? Did their consumption patterns change and so on? And so in 2020, the figures were that there were food items, <clears throat> excuse me, there were food items that decreased, whose consumption decreased. And basically these are like the most expensive items. So meat, poultry, fish, and fruits. <clears throat> uh, of course, fruits being kind of like a leisure item. However, there were food items that increased, and mainly legumes. So legumes, cooking oil, and rice. And these were the prices per kilogram, of course, average prices, just to give an indication at the time when the minimum wage in Egypt was 2,000 Egyptian pounds, the equivalent of $126, at, at an exchange rate of 15.18. If we compare this uh, reality to what happened in 2024, which is where we are now, we find that things that people weren't able to afford and decreased by 14.5 to 25.7% uh, in terms of consumption, increase across the board and increased multifold times. So the prices per kilogram over here are just, just an indication of where we are in terms of uh, basic foodstuffs. And also, interestingly, the things that people relied on more uh, four years ago because of how expensive these other things were, actually increased also at multifold, multifold rates. So the oil price that used to cost maybe 17 Egyptian pounds per bottle is now at 80. Rice is now at 34 instead of 7.5 Egyptian pounds, of course. What is also interesting not to note here contextually is that the minimum wage increased to 6,000 EGP. Um, but if we look at the exchange rates, the exchange rate right now is about, uh, 1 USD to 50 EGP compared to 15.81 a couple of years ago. And if we convert the minimum wage in USD terms, it's not really the case that the minimum wage increased in a proportionate way to allow people to be able to subsist. In fact, I, if we look at the figures, the minimum wage right now in USD terms is less than the minimum wage four years ago, despite these price increases. So thing is that, okay, COVID was horrible, globally, but a lot has happened since COVID. And if
we look at Egypt geopolitically, definitely the war in Ukraine has affected the economy, but also there's a conflict in Sudan that continues to affect Egyptian food prices because a large stock of um, food items, especially meat and beef and so on, is uh, easily sourced from Sudan. But also recently, there is the war on Gaza. And the geopolitical situation is not at all one of stability and uh, economic uh, thriving and, and so on. So what we have now is a compromisation of social welfare. These are some cartoons that started to appear in uh, online newspapers recently. So uh, like this is, for example, price increases. Uh, this says like he's going to a magician or a sheikh or something, and then he wants and he is like I want to to use magic to decrease prices. Um, here we have a representative or an official giving uh, the equivalent of like a thousand five hundred Egyptian pounds to someone, so obviously as some kind of subsistence or assistance. And then he's asking him like how can you claim support or ask for support if you are already dead. So the general trend over the past couple of years and up to now is not one of um, optimism. And what are the pathways for, for alternatives is exactly what this research is supposed to find out in a couple of months. But generally some thoughts or directions that can inform what's going to happen next is there is this pattern of uh, a, like a legacy of debt for development. So it started with the guy we just saw a couple of slides ago in the 1850s, who borrowed this like first external loan, loan in Egypt's history to build the Suez Canal project, among other things. What we have since 2015 is a similar pattern where the president has uh, gone to external borrowing. Of course, this is a typo, but I think it also, um, like it, it's saying leaving internal instead of external is also indicative in its own way. Um, he's been, claiming these mega projects. So the second Suez Canal, the new administrative capital, all these infrastructural changes, buying weapons and so on. So within just the past few years, so bet between 2015 and 2022, Egypt's external loan actually quadrupled from 40 billion to a little over $160 billion. What we also need to think of when integrating the social dimension is to provide cheaper, cheaper, cheaper alternatives to necessary commodities. What we have now, just a very, very quick and probably like rough look of where, where things were, where people were price-wise a couple of years ago right now, means that there is an actual threat of people not being able to subsist. And if we talk about transformative social policy, then we are way, way, way beyond the starting point for that. One of the uh, important and brilliant remarks that was, was made in the conference yesterday is the concept of punishing for pain. So uh, countries like Pakistan would be punished by things that they could not control, like floods or that uh, floods where people like drowning, areas or towns ruined and so on. So what we're having here is people being punished for their pain in a similar way because not thinking of how people would be able to not only thrive but just exist in terms of um, and while making decisions and negotiations with the agencies and all of these things is like it's, it's basically a trap for people and their pain. And I think one of the important things that all of these uh, suggestions or recommendations cater to is the publication of data. So, for example, until now, a military budget is top top classified secret. There is no publication of any state budget or that has to do with any military intervention. However, the mega projects that cost quadrupled external loans include statements like buying weapons. So the provision of data, the transparency, the conducting of more surveys like the CAPMAS one we just saw, all of these things would mean taking research seriously, but also taking the people seriously. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amira, for that interesting presentation. Oh, is, is it not working? Is it working now? Okay. So uh, our, our last presentation is from Dr. Samuel Mwangi. He teaches and is a researcher at the Department of Sociology, Gender and Development Studies at Kenyatta University. Twelve minutes. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as you have been introduced, my name is uh, Samuel Mwangi. I am a lecturer at uh, Kenyatta University, Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, I'm here to talk about uh, uh, this topic. Uh, that's uh, debt, uh, public debt crisis and its implication for gender and social policy. Uh, I think most of the presentations that uh, we have had this morning or throughout uh, the conference since we began yesterday, uh, we have not said much about Kenya. And uh, in my presentation, I'll give a bit background of um, the debt situation that has not been mentioned. Then uh, I'm going to go into the details of uh, the social policy. Then in the conclusion, I'll talk about the implications for both social policy and gender. Uh, Kenya is not any different uh, from any of uh, African countries in terms of the debt situation. The accumulation of uh, debt stock has been increasing. And um, uh, apart from the many sources that uh, are there for um, public data, this one unique uh, product that I want to mention, the last one on the internal sources, that's the the mobile. So what the government of Kenya has done has become very innovative to reach out to the uh, 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 households and uh, small investors in the country to borrow from them. So I think uh, uh, this is quite unique uh, in Kenya. And uh, it's a show of uh, um, um, that the, the fact that uh, this desperation of trying to raise more resources to fight uh, its uh, programs. In terms of borrowing, uh, we have an office for the public debt management, and they have a, uh, a trend, uh, the purposes of borrowing the debt. I don't have to go through that because uh, it has been mentioned before. Uh, at times of uh, expenditure, or why, why the, uh, the government uses this money, is um, in uh, uh, both expenditure and uh, that's the recurrent expenditure and the development. So we can see, uh, I've given a few examples of uh, where the debt money is invested by the government. Uh, I want to uh, put more emphasis on this uh, inform information on this slide because it shows uh, the post-colonial Kenya and the debt trajectories. And what you can see in the period just after the independence in 1963, um, the government uh, came up with a plan to try to address the social issues uh, that were left behind by the colonialists. But, and that was the, in the years after the independence between 1963 and 1970. Then after that, uh, the decade of 71 to 1980, uh, the government uh, was also the accumulating debt because of um, addressing some of the shocks, like oil shocks, there was also the collapse of the East African community. So they, that uh, meant that the government had to stabilize the economy with the, with the debt. Uh, in the 1980s and uh, part of 1990s, there was uh, political instability, there was there were droughts, there was also the introduction of the SAPs. Again, um, another case where the government was hard pressed to go for debt. 1992, the turn of the Century that is uh, 2002, uh, the, the, the debt uh, um, trajectory was also going up because of um, changing the political system from a single party state to multi party state. There was a uh, mega corruption, there was the depreciation of currency, there were also um, decline in the donor funding of the social sectors like health, uh, education, social protection, and the other uh, allied uh, sectors. 2000, 2000, 2002 to 2007, uh, it was um, a phase of recovery and we started seeing the debt going down. But uh, in the subsequent years, especially 2008, um, the, um, Vision 2030, the blueprint for social and economic development was um, implemented and it was split into four phases. The first phase ran from 2008 to 2012. That's what I'm referring to as MTP1, medium term plan, plan one. And there was um, um, the new constitution that came in 2010 uh, that came along the implementation 
and PT run. There was also the new presidency uh, that is change of regime in 2013. And that's when there's a, a new, um, that made the second phase, not uh, the second phase of uh, medium term plans. Uh, there was continuation of that. And uh, we can see that uh, the kind of um, uh, 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 debts that we have accumulated over the time periods. Of course, every period, these are, uh, uh, a reason or an occurrence that is associated with it. Uh, going, uh, looking at the, the debt stock in the last few years and going forward, there's some projections. Uh, we don't expect our debt situation to change in the next uh, few years. It's going to remain relatively at around 68 to 72% of the GDP, uh, but it go down much that it was 2027. 20, to, to and 2028. So that's about the debt situation in Kenya. But uh, I want to turn now my focus on social policy because I'm here to talk about social policy. Part of the project that we're doing in the Get Up project, and um, what we're looking at is uh, the vehicles that the government has used uh, in the financing of uh, social policy. One is uh, uh, the uh, these different programs are the social uh, uh, protection framework. We have the urban food su subsidy for the urban poor. We have the cash transfer for the older persons. We have another cash transfer for uh, people with a severe disability. We also have another cash transfer for uh, orphans and the uh, vulnerable children and uh, the hunger safety uh, uh, net for uh, mostly the semi arid yes, that is the northern part of the country. Uh, again, to extend the social policy regime, the government is in the process of introducing two programs, that's the uh, social health insurance and uh, social housing. Those are new legislations that are being implemented. And there's also the expanding the existing social security, uh, it's a, which is a social insurance program through uh, meeting an existing uh, act. This, uh, a few subsidies here and there. Uh, I have two examples here, the agricultural subsidies and farm inputs. This also um, subsidies for connection to uh, water and sewerage services. Uh, looking back since the independence, there have been some efforts to implement social policy. And the, the first post-colonial uh, or post-independence Kenya instrument for social policy was session paper number 10 of 1965, which focused on uh, a few areas on um, medical and hospital services, it was older, uh, older persons, uh, free, free premium education and employment benefits, and also uh, financial aid to access higher education because these were some of the ills that uh, the country was recovering from, the colonialism. Uh, there have been ex uh, extension of the same to health insurance, me to health income and uh, education, and uh, these have been continual uh, legal reforms on social protection and social welfare. So, um, in terms of debt or in terms of uh, expenditure on uh, social welfare programs, the data that is available shows that. Uh, for the last uh, eight years, the proportion of um, expenditure on um, social assistance has been quite marginal at uh, about 0.3% of the GDP. That's quite low. This is uh, far below from uh, the average for the Sub-Saharan Africa. So we are not doing very well on that. Uh, so, this is not the turning point of my conversation because uh, it's about the implication of uh, debt and uh, gender and social policy. Uh, one of the things that we have seen, and uh, uh, Professor Georgie has uh, told us this is a very preliminary, it's a project that we have just started working on, uh, is that uh, this has been a very low investment in social protection. Donor funding for social welfare has been declining there have been a, a lot of challenges, both uh, uh, policy and uh, legislative, on, for onboarding new 
uh, welfare programs and also uh, complicated or compounded by the issue of um, limited financial resources. Again, um, low priority on um, social protection or social assistance. Why? Because of the debt situation. Again, uh, we see that uh, the implication is that uh, the situation is going to affect children and women more, and more so women-headed households. And the situation of um, household debt is also likely to continue growing because there are no mechanisms to contain it or to cushion it. So way forward, uh, we have a number of suggestions of going forward. And this is what uh, we hope that uh, this project is going to be able to reinforce, is uh, to seek alternative ways of funding social welfare and social assistance. We can consider both having a uh, in kite. Uh, this also corruption is a big issue. It has been mentioned so many times in this podium. So we are not any exceptional. And uh, this is more endemic when it comes to uh, 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 disbursement of social protection or social welfare benefits. This also needs to subsidize uh, productivity and uh, encourage rural industrialization. And that is going to uh, create employment, which consequently is likely to reduce this dependency uh, among the most vulnerable populations. This also promotion of uh, exports and uh, small enterprises. Again, it will have the same effect to create employment opportunities. Uh, this uh, needs to strengthen an existing framework, which is called Kenya Social uh, and Economic Inclusion Project. So it was initiated in 2013, but uh, uh, the government can uh, take it up and uh, see that uh, what was aspired in that program can take effect. Lastly, uh, no, no, I have a few more to go, address inflation and uh, uh, made efforts to stabilize the um, foreign currency exchange. This also uh, trying to encourage family responsibility in providing some of um, some of those needs for the vulnerable people. Structuring the debt so that uh, they can save money for social expenditure. There's also the need to have a centralized way of uh, coordinating social assistance and social welfare programs because they are quite fragmented in many sectors. So if they can all be brought at the one um, center, and this is what I'm suggesting the next uh, point, is that we have um, institutional reforms in terms of uh, establishing an authority that will be responsible for social assistance. Otherwise, um, uh, this is work uh, that is in progress, but uh, I, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samuel, for, for your useful presentation. So I'd now like to call on Professor Michael Pesa White, who's a co PI of the GetSPA project, to, to make a submission to discuss some of the um, presentations that we've had. Mike, can you hear us? Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. So I, I will be very brief. I noticed that time is already far spent. Um, let me, I mean, let me comment the four um, researchers from the other researchers from the four different countries that have um, presented on this particular panel so far. I think there have been a lot of food for thought um, as far as this issue of debts debt restructuring is concerned for social policy and uh, gender equity. Um, since yesterday, a lot of the presentations have focused on debt and debt restructuring. And we have been exposed to the magnitude and the escalating nature of the debt uh, challenges, particularly to socioeconomic progress. Um, behind this conversation and the concept of debt and debt crisis and debt restructuring are actually human lives. They are hopes that have been dashed, aspirations that have been dimmed, 
and human beings that are suffering, or lack of supplies to hospitals, poor educational infrastructures, and poor housing conditions. And as if that is not enough, debt servicing is, in my view, competing with social spending on education, health, housing, social security, among others. So for the most part, um, the accumulation of large debt stocks um, indirectly transfers wealth from many of our poor African taxpayers to domestic and international bondholders. Usually the pains imposed by debt crisis and the debt exchange programs that have, we have seen in, in our various countries uh, have also been accompanied by um, imposition of draconian taxes and hikes in utilities, as I've been mentioned in some cases. Generally, within the competition of debt servicing and spending on social services, debt servicing appears to be given priority by policymakers because of the punitive measures that are associated with inability to pay or non-compliance. And anytime that happens, we can be sure that it manifests in um, job losses, families having to adjust their um, living standards or income or the household well-being. And so as we think through and listening to all this presentation, one is forced to ask what are the implications of the debt crisis, the debt restructuring for incomes, for instance, for education, for housing, for health, for human mobility and for labor market and as well as the, the care economy. And this really leads us to begin to pay closer attention to trends in social policy orientation and design before the debt crisis, attempts to unravel the nature and dimensions of cost imposed on social spending by debt crisis and restructuring efforts, and what new measures, if any, have been deployed to ameliorate the effects of debt crisis on ordinary people. More importantly, how transformative or otherwise, in terms of design, our policies- We are losing been... you. Mike, we are losing you. Okay, is it is it better now? Hello? I can hear you. Okay, if you can hear me, that's great. So, so, and of course also how gender sensitive are policies and policy discourses and deliberations targeted at addressing the debt problem, especially in our debt reading countries and other countries that are on the league table, uh, on the debt league table. Overall, um, before yesterday and, and yesterday till now, the narratives about debts in Africa have often been confined to issues of economic policy with less attention to social policy. Social policy therefore appears to have been consigned to the margins. Even worse has been the fact that economic crisis, in economic crisis or in debt crisis, the fall is often taken by social policy, uh, which often witnesses less commitment and reduced spending. But central to the efforts and the deliberations uh, around debt restructuring remains the question of the ramifications of policy choices and designs for commitment to education, housing, income, human mobility, labor market, activities, employment, and so on and so forth. But we must come to the table, perhaps now, especially given that we are thinking about alternatives, we must come to the table with a new orientation that begins to accept that the dichotomy between the social and the economic is fictitious and artificial, and that whatever happens to the social has ramifications to the economic, and whatever happens to the economic has ramifications for the social. It takes a good training in, let's say, educational institutions to produce the best human qualities that you need to promote or to work in the economic sector to promote the kind of growth that is needed to expand the frontiers of the economy and create more jobs for people. To that extent, the economic and the social are co-joined twins, and we should treat them as such. The economy is not an end in itself. It is a means to improving human well-being. So any debt restructuring program intended to save the economy must, that imposes social costs on the people will be counterproductive and it will undermine the economy itself. In other words, the social and the economic have symbiotic relations, which are mutually constitutive and often reinforcing uh, of each other. Therefore, a good economic policy should translate into better social outcomes and a good social policy should set the stage for high economic performance. The debt crisis and its ramifications, as we have witnessed in the countries um, that have, um, have been discussed so far, 
Um, it's a call to revisit the functional utility of social policy for economic development. The narrow focus and fixation on social protection that has accompanied the neoliberal paradigm has not been very helpful. Finally, as this conference discusses the alternative um, solutions or templates for addressing the debt crisis, um, particularly tomorrow, it is hoped uh, it is my prayer that social policy should not be seen as a victim or sacrifice, sacrificial lamb. Rather, social policy should be considered as a nebular of economic growth in the manner that gives full attention to the functional utility as expressed in the role of social policy as instruments for enhancing production, reproduction, political inclusion, redistribution, protection for equitable development outcomes. So a few things for us to reflect on as we go forward. What are the trends in social policy spending before the current crisis? And how have the debt restructuring efforts been shaping those expenditures? Which specific social programs or domains have received the most attention in terms of budgetary supports and why? Why does social spendingness, does, sorry, does, social, does high social spendingness really lead or translate to better social policy program design and efficiency in delivery of social programs? And in what ways are social expenditures affected by changes in public debt ratios. Do debts, do different types of social expenditure behave in the same way in response to changes in debt ratios or debt service payments? I believe these and many other uh, questions when given serious consideration will bring us to a closer realization or perhaps to a much more appreciation of the fact that we cannot focus or deal with the economic without necessarily giving the social equal attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike, for, for, for that intervention and for underlining very sharply the co-constitutive nature of social and economic policy. So I'd now like to turn to you and to um, ask if anybody has questions or comments or concerns. Um, so, there are three people around that table. It starts from you and then in the two of them. I'll come to the middle and then we'll do it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to ask the question, but also many thanks to our presenters. Uh, my name is Betha Lipipa Piri. I'm the executive director for Malawi Economic Justice Network, Majin. But I also sit in the board of Tax Justice Network Africa. So my question really goes to the academicians, those that have spoken about gender, uh, date, and social protection or social policy, particularly to the lecturer from, from Zambia, Mr. Hudu to say that, so do, do we think that debt restructuring is the fit for all purpose mechanism in this context then? That given the macro picture, the analysis that we have listened to, which is almost similar to the Malawi case, the risk factors. My question is now then, are we not trying to uh, escalate or prolong the problem now to the future by actually restructuring date, uh, can we actually come up with a tangible mechanism beyond debt restructuring? If the exchange rate keeps changing, if the inflation is there, and then we are saying we want to pay given a longer period of time, are we not shifting the problem in the future? That's my, my question and the concern. Thank you. Please be brief so that um, we can hear um, from others as well. Thank you. My name is Sofa Sanmati from University of Ghana. My question goes to um, Mr. Kofi Asante and Emmanuel Kujo, I think. Um, you mentioned um, among your transformative policies, I was surprised to see LEAP over there. But I think it's uh, more responsive or sensitive at least. Why do you say it's transformative? And then the second question, you also talked about choiceless democracy. Um, I think that's where we are now as a country. If you had to recommend another system of government, what would it be? Thank you. 
Hi, thank you. Um, my question is for anyone who wants to take it up. Um, but as I was thinking about the uh, last uh, professor's comments about this divide between the social and economic, one thing I wanted to ask is, what role is there, for example, for a public distribution system, especially in terms of food? Because in the case of Sri Lanka, there used to be a food subsidy, actually, but that was uh, eliminated uh, during the liberalization process in the 1980s. And so now when we think of social policy, we generally only think of like health and education, but actually the, the demand for the food subsidy is what promoted uh, Sri Lanka's efforts to try and achieve self-sufficiency in rice. Now, I understand there are different staples in different countries, but I was just wondering if there is a role for public distribution of food as well. Thank you. So the table is Okay, thank you so much. My name is Jennifer and I'm from um, Christian Aid um, Charity. And I'm currently writing a report on the um, debt crisis um, across Africa for a UK um, policy and public um, audience with the aim of persuading the UK government to introduce legislation on private creditors to compel them to come to the table when it comes to debt restructuring. So I found this conference incredibly helpful and insightful. So thank you um, to everyone. I have to say I found this session the most um, illuminating because it has help to translate um, the debt crisis figures to what it means for people on the ground across African um, countries. Um, so with that, I think that it's really important that the debt crisis debate does go into more depth on what the debt crisis means for the everyday experience for um, African um, people. So my question to the panelists, and anyone can pick this up, is how do we really build up the um, bank of knowledge and expertise on the impact of the debt crisis on particularly on social protection um, measures. And I particularly appreciated the last um, presentation um, on the impact in Kenya, because he was able to talk about how social protection measures have been um, take, rolled back over the last um, decade. And I think that kind of data analysis is really, really critical to persuade decision makers in Western governments, for example, to actually see and understand the impact of the debt crisis. So how do we build up that bank of knowledge and expertise? Thank you. Um, my name is Isaac Adongo. I, I represent the parliament of Ghana. Um, I recognize that you don't seem to be very happy or comfortable with finance because we have created most of those debts. Uh, but have you done some work, particularly in academia, to look at the, the taxation of our countries? How socially responsive are they? Uh, is it not the case that we are already overburdening the poor? Uh, and I can see that most of the the taxes that we're imposing are on consumption taxes. They are regressive, and the poor is basically funding the rich. Uh, have you taken some look at how we develop socially responsive tax regimes that really reward the poor and, and punish the rich? Uh, in terms of the fiscal adjustment that come out of this uh, debt crisis, what is the quality of the adjustments? Uh, invariably, we ask the poor to bear a lot of the burden uh, in the hope that the economy will grow, but you cannot kill the poor in order to grow the, the rich. And I want to see what are the considerations in some of those adjustments. Why will you say that you want to adjust almost a decade old problem within three years? And the IMF consistently used a three-year instrument to try and address decades uh, of, of challenges. And I think that that further burdens the poor as opposed to spreading it out and, and making it more easy to take. And for burden sharing, where do the poor stand when it comes to shouldering the burden of that crisis? Today, thank you very much yeah, you so, know we, we are running out of time so and there are other thank you uh, honorable there was somebody on your table who wanted to say something yes please yeah 
Um, thank you very much. My name is Chennai. Um, really enjoyed this this panel as well. Just one comment and one quick question. Um, I think as we've been trying to think about this um, reform of the international financial architecture, I think this session actually speaks to why we need to shift um, the governance of the debt crisis to, for example, the UN, um, because we need to have a platform that's able to take into consideration these very same um, impacts that you've been discussing, right, when thinking through mm -hmm. restructuring. So I think it, it, it further makes the case for this. Um, the, the one question I had, and this was um, noted that there is going to be a, a reduction, I think, in the labor force that the, the, the government is going to be paying for, um, as well as, I think, a, a freeze on the public sector wage bill. Um, in, in some countries, you actually find that the public sector wage bill consists of salaries to teachers and nurses and doctors. Um, for me, I, I actually kind of see that as a way of further um, negatively impacting our social sectors, right? Um, and so I just had a question with regards to how you deal with that tension, um, because it may look like a corrective measure that the government is taking, but on the other hand, actually further exacerbate some of the social uh, policies we want to address. Hello. Once again, my name is Bismarck Adungayonko. I, my concern is, uh, in Ghana, before 2023, uh, we're told that 6 million people were in the poverty line. 2023, we're told by World Bank report that 850,000 more people joined the poverty line. And with the debt crisis, and the implementation of the IMF program, which certainly uh, has implications on social spending or investment in social policy or program delivery. Are there projections on how many more will be joining the poverty line in 2024 and beyond? And whether there is something strategic that can be done to avert it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a quick question about definition. Uh, is it an agreed definition as to what is social and non-social? Why is education and uh, agricultural extension being taken as social when they are rather, you know, uh, human capital formation and also productivity enhancing? And uh, the second part, the impression is being given, or maybe I heard wrongly, that debt restructuring is freeing some resources that can be used for social spending. The restructuring going on now is very different from HIPAA. We said, if you have the money that would, you should, would have paid to settle your debt, use it for social expenditure. This is not the same. So why am I getting the impression that debt restructuring is being assumed there are additional resources that can go for social spending? Thank you. My name is Kwame Pien from Ghana. Uh, Taufik, Abdallah. Je pense qu'il faut... Dans ces situations-là, il faut toujours essayer d'avoir une perspective historique. Qu'est-ce que l'histoire nous dit de ces 30 dernières années Nous avons connu une première crise de la dette dans les années 90 et il y a eu des politiques d'ajustement structurel. Il y a eu la mondialisation qui a totalement euh, affaibli les États au détriment des secteurs sociaux et... Maintenant, on a encore une crise de la dette et il ne faudra pas s'étonner que l'ajustement, ça va se faire par les pauvres. Les pauvres vont être le facteur d'ajustement, comme d'habitude, la variable d'ajustement. Et l'histoire se répète 
euh, on va agir sur les dépenses publiques, on va agir sur les dépenses sociales, on va agir sur l'emploi, on va agir sur, sur les revenus des pauvres, l'économie va être encore plus informelle et, et je pense qu'il faut, euh, ce qui a manqué dans certaines interventions sur la dimension sociale, c'est ce rappel historique euh, qui nous permet de, de, euh, de mieux envisager les solutions futures. Time now. So please be brief. Oui, c'est pourquoi j'avais suggéré qu'il faut accorder plus de temps au débat. Ça, c'est très, très, très important. Alors, le camarade qui s'est présenté dit qu'il est du Parlement ghanaien. Je lui pose la question comment se passe la ratification des accords de prêt au sein du Parlement ghanaien. Ça, c'est très important en tant que parlementaire dans cette salle. Alors, le camarade qui a fait la présentation sur euh, la dette du Kenya, le sociologue, j'aimerais qu'il nous dise quel est l'impact de l'endettement extérieur et intérieur public du Kenya sur les droits humains. Et ça, c'est très important. Voilà. Et également... Euh, celle qui a parlé de l'Égypte a bien parlé de la dette coloniale. Effectivement, tous les pays africains sont nés avec une dette. Le colonisateur nous a légué une grande dette. Ça, c'est important qu'il faut reconnaître aujourd'hui et au pays. Euh, on a parlé beaucoup de la Zambie. Mais ce que la Zambie est en train de faire, ça ne va pas permettre à la Zambie de sortir dans la crise. Parce qu'on a dit la restructuration, le rechelonnement, L'allègement, le moratoire, ça ne va pas résoudre le problème de la crise de la dette en Afrique. Pas du tout. C'est la suspension du remboursement de la dette qui crée les rapports de force avec les créanciers. Vous avez parlé du FMI. Le FMI, seul a 7,66% des droits de vote au sein du FMI, au sein du FMI. les États-Unis plutôt. Si vous prenez les États-Unis, ils ont 16,66% et quelques pourcents des droits de vote au sein du Fonds monétaire international. Toute l'Afrique n'a que 2,75% des voix. Et le FMI, s'il doit accorder une dette à un pays, il y a une lettre qu'on appelle lettre d'intention, qui est soumise à la scientifique du gouvernement débiteur et qui n'a pas le droit de modifier une phrase dans la lettre. Mais comment voulez-vous que la dette soit utile. Comment voulez-vous que la dette puisse lutter contre la pauvreté Le camarade du Kenya a également parlé de l'industrialisation, créer des unités industrielles. Mais vous n'aurez jamais l'argent du FMI pour créer une unité industrielle. D'après Thomas Sangra, si la dette ne sert pas à un pays de se passer de la dette, à quoi sert alors l'utilité de la dette C'est ce que Thomas Sangra a dit. Donc nous devons travailler sur les causes structurelles de l'endettement et non les conséquences créées. Merci. Thank you. Once again, my name is Sandra. So um, during the presentation in Kenya's case, the solutions preferred were in-kind donor support, subsidizing productivity and rural industrialization, promoting exports and small, um, small uh, entrepreneurs or SMEs. All of these solutions cannot be successful if the domestic market is not improved. So I would like to find out if there has been, um, if I can borrow Michael's word, draconian measures that has been instituted to protect the local market or domestic markets in order to achieve all of these outcomes? And if there has been any, what were the, the outcomes or the backlash? Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have um, some people online who wanted to say something? I can't see um, the people online because, because, he can hear. Are there some people online who want to say something?
Pardon? Nothing. Okay. All right. So in that case, I'll just turn back to uh, the, the 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 panel in the order in which you presented. So to Ghana, you have a few questions, but you have only two minutes. No, that's fine. Yeah, the discussion was um, well, I'll, I'll probably give a take on the choiceless um, democracy bit. Um, I think the, the way out is to move towards more accountable democracy, where there is greater transparency as well as more accountability to the people, particularly where the people demand these from leaders at whatever level, such as to ensure at least some um, level of openness in the discourse regarding their finances, but also the choices that lead to the sometimes adverse consequences we find ourselves in. Obviously, we can't then be thinking having drunk from the bowl of democracy that we want to just turn up the taps and then move on to something which probably might not give us the best outcome. Um, I'll turn to my colleague to talk about the, the leap question. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, you are very right. Leap is not transformative social policy. Like I said, it's one of the most stigmatizing, uh, you know, uh, social protection schemes for the poor because it's, um, conditional tax, uh, conditional cash transfer. What we want to do uh, going forward is to look at the range of uh, social policies in place from LEAP, from the conditional cash transfer to the universal transfers. Uh, the free SHS has been emblematic of the new universal transfer, but then we also have the Ghana uh, health insurance uh, scheme. Um, maybe something little on the choiceless democracy. It's becoming clearer that the electoral system in place is totally irrelevant to accountability. And it's not just in Ghana. You can see what's happening in the US, right? Um, Biden and Trump are universally hated, yet they are the only options. Interestingly, they are not the only uh, candidates, right? But uh, they are the only ones who kind of consume all the airtime. What this points to is the need for a groundswell, a social movement. Uh, during the Sri Lankan crisis, you know, the revolution which ho hosted the president, the, I was following the uh, press secretary of the Bernie Sanders campaign. And she was saying, you know, leftists in the US were looking at Sri Lanka with envy because they were doing something which Americans had wanted to do all along because they are so dissatisfied with their system but there seem to be no other options. In Ghana, we've seen some groundswell, right? Um, what we haven't really seen is the a coherent ideological content and a linkage with the various issues. Uh, but what's really clear is that uh, people have become ever more dissatisfied with the electoral system. We saw a similar thing in Kenya, right? Um, and Interestingly, last year and this year, you know, we've seen two different ways in which uh, the demand for choiceless accountability could lead to change. In Niger, we saw a military coup d'etat and a, 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 resist, a rejection of the French, you know, continuance of the French colonial relationship. In Senegal, it's gone in a democratic direction. They were able to overcome the president's um, uh, desire to hold on to power. And the newly elected president actually has some progressive ideas. So um, of course the situation is very, um, can be despairing, but then there are flickers of hope. And it actually uh, indicates the need for joint action and for social movement. I think I'll end here. Can we hear from Charles, please? Yes, uh, that was a great, 
there was a question around um, the debt restructuring process that uh, are we not postponing the problem? Is it not going to be costly? Um, in my view, uh, indeed, the two options that are there for this debt restructuring process are too costly for developing countries. Why do I say so? The options given are either you extend your maturity period, you pay your full amount, or they are willing to take a cut, like for the uh, uh, private creditors, they are willing to take a cut, but they want their money uh, paid in the shortest possible time. Given the exchange rate risks that developing countries are facing, uh, this is a costly process because uh, they will need to pay more in terms of uh, the local currency amounts when they convert them to the US dollar. So the only solution in this case, of course, this debt, the challenge is debt cancellation can be the solution, but unfortunately, this debt can't be cancelled. The only solution that might be need to be pursued is to curb illicit financial flows that happen in uh, these countries because there's a lot of uh, money that is lost through illicit financial uh, flows. So that would be my response to, 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 to this. Thank you very much. Ama Amira. Hi, Amira, are you still online? Yes, hello. There was just a power cut, so I did not uh, hear the question or remarks. So I will have to trouble you with it. Repeat it possible. All right. It's Muna Ben Osman online. Hi. She's not. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to bring this session to a close. I'm sorry it took longer than. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. No, I understand. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm also going to be very brief. I know there are some questions, but we can extend uh, the conversations beyond this session. There was a question from Sri Lanka about the food subsidy or food distribution program. And uh, I think, according to my understanding, it's uh, more impactful if uh, we look at the production instead of consumption. So if we go the direction of uh, subsiding production, that will have much more benefits. And that's what uh, we, we are trying to do in King. Uh, those question about um, what we're doing in terms of building a bank of knowledge and expertise. And I, I think in part of uh, this gets per project, uh, we are going to see more resources, more commitments about the uh, knowledge on social protection, social policy ac uh, across uh, African countries. There was uh, that question about um, human rights and the debt uh, independence. So my response to it is that uh, there have been many attempts to use rights-based approach to address some of these social issues. But uh, maybe it's a framework that needs to be given time to see if uh, people can be given the entitlement based on uh, uh, the, the, that approach. There was also that last question on um, uh, the suggestions that I made, including the uh, in-kite social assistance. And uh, this is just uh, one of the ways that can be explored. It's not something that is being tested. But all these other suggestions, like um, uh, encouraging the enterprise, rural industrialization, uh, it's something that has been tested in the past. But uh, the government can um, upscale it. Um, the creation of uh, devolution in Kenya had one of the goals of trying to make uh, the, the counties agents of development. And one of the aspirations was to create rural industries. But uh, again, uh, it's an area that can be strengthened. Uh, the last question was uh, on the definition of um, social policy. And uh, 
I believe our approach here is looking at what savings can come or how many how resources can be have uh, uh, harnessed from other sources, including debts. But again, uh, uh, we can take this conversation uh, outside this um, session because of uh, time. Thank you. Thank you very much for picking up all those questions that we missed out because of time. I, I want to bring this session to a close. I really want to thank you for your active participation. It's been longer than it should have been, but I think it's been fruitful. And, and Taufik, I want to assure you that we do have um, a historical dimension to our work. If you look on our website, the GetSpa website, we have the findings from 31 African countries on the trajectories of, of social policy, which takes a historical um, ap approach. And Dr. C, you asked the Honorable MP a question. I think the two of you could, could um, discuss it outside the, 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 the meeting since we've run out of time. So thank you very much. And, and please have a short break and come back for the last session. Bye-bye. Don't even applaud us for all the hard work. <laughs>
Thank you. Good evening, participants. It's time to reconvene for the final session. We respectfully ask those of you in the lobby to come back in if you had your snack. And those of you inside, if you could take your seats. Thank you. I enjoyed your session. I'm glad. I enjoyed your session. <laughs> it's working. So we are looking for Definitely. To, to save time, we want to ask that the ashes please call those in the lobby to come in. And let's be quick about that. If you could help us, please. There are some empty seats in front. Those of you at the back, if you could move forward, I suspect the room will be emptier. Professor Augustine Fosu and Professor Godfrey Bokping kindly approached the stage. Also want to call Mr. Emmanuel Mensah from PP, Mr. Fusein Issa from the NPP, and Professor Lord Mensa for the NDC. To join us. All right. Yes, please. Professor Lord Mensa. If you are around, kindly join us here. So good evening once again. My name is Bernard Avle. I am a radio and television journalist based here in Accra, Ghana. And my task is to steer a conversation uh, on the topic, how did Ghana come to the cup crisis and how to get out of it? Um, the plan is to break the panel discussion into three. The first 15 minutes, we would ask our academics to do two quick presentations, which will offer two perspective case studies on the topic. Then we would interact with three politicians and then would invite a statesman and economist to share his views on the subject at the end. So that's the proposed plan. I see more people are entering. We'll give a couple of minutes for more of you to come in and then we start. Thank you.
Did you get the one you called me? All right, so we're going to start. Um, good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our final session for today. And our conversation tonight is a policy panel on Ghana, how Ghana came to the current economic crisis and how to get out of it. I'm sure most of us know that Ghana defaulted on its debts December 2022. And it's been a difficult period of restructuring, starting with the domestic, and we are still in the throes of the restructuring. We have um, three groups of panelists. The first two are economists. They will give two quick case study presentations on the matter. Um, I suspect the politicians were invited to tell us how they will take us out of the crisis. So I suspect the politicians would answer the second part of the question. So how did Ghana come to the current crisis? The professors will tell us, and I'm sure they will say it's because of the politicians. So the politicians will say how they will get us out. And then our statesman economists would, would summarize and tell us whether he's happy with the solutions or not. Is, is that a good plan? Wonderful. So let me just quickly invite the first two. Professor August Ten Fosu is an economist. And I'll just mention a few quick things about him, and then we will be off with this presentation. He is a professor at the Institute of Social Statistical and Economic Research, ISA, at the University of Ghana here in Ghana. He's also a distinguished visiting professor at the College of Business and Economics of University of Johannesburg, South Africa. He also serves as an extraordinary professor at the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences of Pretoria, and then he's also an associate at the University of Oxford's Center for the Study of African Economies. He will take us on a quick journey on how we got here. Professor Augustine Fosu, thank you. If you want to use the rostrum, you are welcome. Please put your hands together for Prof. Thank you very much. I have prepared a short presentation and uh, I would like that uh, shown. Technical person. Okay. Yeah, okay, all right. I'm supposed to give myself here. Uh, yes, yes, I'm fine. I need to uh, show you close this one. Okay, uh, go ahead. And then we need to. You want to make it full screen? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Full screen, full screen. It's okay. Okay. Very good. Um, I would like to thank the organizers and also, particularly, Professor Bofkin for allowing me to share the stage with him. I promise that uh, my presentation will be for only five minutes. Uh, so let me keep the time here. So this is me. And the idea will be to try to give a little bit of historical uh, background as to the factors and causes of the debt uh, crisis. Um, I gave a presentation like this earlier last year, and I haven't had a chance to go over it again. So uh, uh, if I fall down, I'm sure you can understand. You have to forgive me. All right, so here we are. And um, let me... Uh, Well, you know, as you see, it's this elaborate outline, right? This is supposed to elaborate outline, and it's supposed to uh, put fears in the hearts and of students. So I'm going to skip that. Why are we interested in debt at all? Why should we care? Debt can be good or it can be bad. It depends upon what is used for and how much of it we have. So, you know, but the Guinean situation has gotten to a point whereby the debt is bad in terms of reducing growth. And it may also shift expenditure away from the social sector. 
So in that sense, that at this point is probably bad. There are other things that Professor Bobkin will talk about. Okay, this is it. This is a beautiful picture that shows the debt. If you go all the way back, uh, you find that uh, to 1990, for example, the deficit proportion of GDP is quite low, isn't it? But what, 20% or so? Then it increased, it kept increasing. And then Ghana got into the so-called HIPIC around 2000 or so, and the debt was written down, so it came down. And also the multilateral debt uh, initiative, right? Reduction initiative 2005 also helped further. But it's mostly a HIPIC. But since 2005, the debt has been increasing and increasing, as you can tell. And so currently, it's around maybe 100% or so. So that's where we are. OK. Now, obviously, we have the external debt, and we have the domestic debt. This is the external one. And it's fairly similar. If you go all the way back to 1970, for example, it was quite low. It increased quite a bit, as I indicated, uh, until about 2000 or so, it fell and has begun to increase again. Oh, by the way, yes. All right, so now we can take a look in terms of the external debt versus the domestic debt. The total debt is in red, and the blue one is external debt, so the difference is the domestic debt. And what is quite clear here is that domestic proportion of the debt has been increasing over time. That's the difference between the two. Well, we do not live in a vacuum, Ghana and the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. So the question becomes, how does Ghana's debt compare with Sub-Saharan Africans' debt on average? And that's what the picture shows. Uh, the blue one is Ghana, the red is Sub-Saharan Africa. And again, you, you can tell that they are fairly similar until fairly recently, although Ghana's debt has been above the average Sub-Saharan Africa's. And look at what happens. In 2020, it shot up. The difference became really great in 2020. I'm gonna skip the numbers. What it shows is what pretty much what the diagram showed earlier, and that is the fact that there has been increasing difference between Ghana's debt and Sub-Saharan African average debt. Well, we don't just create debt out of a vacuum, do you? We don't. We run fiscal deficit, and then we have to go and borrow to pay those deficit. If we spend more than we can raise in revenues, the difference has to be taken care of somehow, right? That's because of it. And that is borrowing. And so if you borrow, you create the debt. So here we are with the deficit. The diagram is very clear. Now, the further down that the graph is, then the higher is the deficit. And look at what happened. Compare 2020 with every year, every other year before that. It's extraordinary in 2020. But the deficit, you have to have revenue, right, and expenditure. The red is the expenditure, the blue is the revenue. And the revenue has been increasing steadily over time, although gradually, deficit has also, excuse me, expenditure has also been increasing also fairly steadily until 2020. There is something magical about 2020. And look at the difference between the two in 2020. Again, Ghana does not live in a vacuum, Southern Africa also. So again, we can compare the deficit here. The blue is Ghana, the red Southern Africa average, we find that the deficit has been higher 
in Ghana than South Southern Africa on average. Or pretty much, except uh, probably sometime maybe 2017 or so, where it looked as if about the same, they coincided, but then Ghana took off. And it really took off in 2020. Well, what explains that, the difference? How about expenditure? Ghana versus Sub-Saharan Africa? Ghana is in blue, Sub-Saharan Africa is in red. And we can tell that expenditure in Ghana historically has been less than that in Sub-Saharan Africa on average. Again, until 2020, when Ghana took off. How about revenue? Well, revenue, red Sub-Saharan Africa, blue Ghana, and Ghana in the past, you can tell that the shortfall between Ghana and Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of revenue was quite large. So revenue seemed to be the problem in terms of relative comparison. But look at what happens. Over time, Ghana began to catch up in revenues as well. And you're very close, as a matter of fact, about 2019 or so. Okay. So, what I've observed. Now, I haven't shown the picture going back all the way to the 1980s, but what is clear is that in the 1980s, and I can show you a picture in terms of age and so on, that there was increase in debt, and if you don't mind, maybe I can go there very quickly, here, aid and debt increasing in the 1980s, right? I didn't show that earlier, so I want to show that now, okay? And the debt was supposed to support the, the reforms, the economic reforms of the 80s. Then, as I indicated earlier, in the early 2000s, Ghana joined HIPEC, and the debt was written off and also multidimensional debt relief initiative from 2005. So we observed the reduction in debt as of that time. But since that time, indeed, there have been consistent increase in the fiscal deficit trend and therefore increase in the debt. And we've identified expenditure as the main culprit. I repeat, expenditure being the main culprit, especially recently. In 2020, we had what? The perfect storm. The perfect storm in terms of COVID-19 and election year. So that may actually help us resolve the enigma that we have. So when you're unable to service a standing debt and you're binding domestic constraints, then you get crisis. And that's pretty much what happened after 2020. So as a conjectural solution, perhaps we need to be concerned about executive constraint, executive constraint, constraint of executive part of the government as a way of controlling both the cyclical, electoral cyclical and circular deficits. This is the debt on our back right now. And we are barely surviving, it looks. So now we begin to think, what next? Which way do you go? And I think that's what the politicians, commentators, political commentators will be here to tell us which direction you ought to take. So that's it. Wow. Thank you very much for my brief. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Augustine Fosu, please put your hands together one more time. They say, a picture is worth a thousand words. A graph is worth a thousand equations. That was wonderful. You enjoyed it. Professor Bokwin. So he said he was going to take five minutes. He took 10. But since he's your senior, you wanted to Can take you 10. You would take five. Slide? Are we in agreement? Because um, Professor Bokwin, when we were both in the university, yes, Professor Fosu was already teaching. So he's many years our senior. Professor Godfrey Bokwin is an economist of an an economist and professor of finance, decade and a half and counting industry, combines three disciplines, 
accounting, finance, and economics, studied in both spheres, Ghana, Japan, and other places, quite um, articulate on media platforms as well. Provoking, thank you. I'm sure you're going to move off from where he stopped. Yes. He, for example, Bopin, whilst you're getting yourself ready, he told us that domestic components is rising. He didn't say much about the type, commercial versus concessionary. So if you could do that for us, then it gives us a more comprehensive picture. Thank you. So, so while we, um, you know, Professor Fosu, your presentation, it was like, if somebody had told me the world would have ended in 2020, watching this back, I would have believed it because like everything went wrong in 2020 and I like your perfect storm and the comprising to SSA helped us a lot. So it's a good place to build from, right? Um, the only point I didn't see was the type of debt. You, you did the domestic versus external, but I've heard you say in other platforms because you had a short time that the type of debt has also changed multilateral, bilateral to now euro bonds, more commercial type, which which I believe, I'm not sure whether it's 2020 that that started though. I think that started a bit earlier, but it sort of went into overdrive within that period as well. So join the discussion. I'm sure you can comment on that uh, as, as well. Yeah. We, by the way, we're supposed to have three politicians. The governing New Patriotic Party has yeah. a former member of parliament yeah. for Okain yeah. Queen North. That's the constituency my office is located, so I have to be careful. If I don't, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm too careless, we may be moved. So that's Issa Fuseni, and then Mr. Kwabna Mensa from the CPP. CPP is a party of Kwame Nkrumah. So at some point, they were the dominant political force. They are doing well these days, but it's not been easy for them. The main opposition party, the National Democratic Congress, is absent. The the person was here yesterday. I'm not sure if it was a communication problem, but he's not here. So if there's an NDC person who wants to save the NDC, you can come and sit next to me. Otherwise, so we, we are lucky to have the ranking member of the finance committee in parliament and the member of parliament for Bogatanga Central, Isaac Adongo. Please put your hands together for him. He wasn't told to be on this panel, but he, he will not let NDC sink. So he will come and save his party, even without any prepared notes. So Mr. Adongo, thank you. Put your hands together for Mr. Adongo. He's the ranking member of the Finance Committee in Parliament. And so he will come from both a parliamentary and an NDC perspective. Thank you for being on this panel. Uh, Professor Bokwin, if your presentation ready, they are trying to sort it out. Yeah, but whilst the other I can, I think yes. I can start. Yes, go ahead. Start. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And it's really a privilege to hear a stage with Professor Augustine Fosu. When I was straying from accounting and finance to economics, his papers helped me a lot. So I'm here to acknowledge what you, 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 what you put in us through your papers. And also Mr. Kwam Pieni is also here. Um, he's one person where you know that economics doesn't grow with age, you know. And it gets better like wine. Yes, it gets better. Okay, so my presentation is on uh, Ghana's debt crisis, looking back to look forward. Um, and um, I'll give a little bit of context and then um, why we are here. I don't know whether if we are able to solve Ghana's debt crisis today, there will be anything else for the country to do again because it has, it has been public debt crisis since independence. And in all of Ghana's IMF program engagements, public debt unsustainability has been a key feature. 
right from 1965, when Dr. Kwame Nkuma first approached the IMF. And after the program was approved and Dr. Kwame Nkuma rejected it, he among the program objectives was restoring public debt sustainability. And even though Nkuma rejected that program, we, we couldn't tell how he would have survived because we know it wasn't long and his government was overthrown. So the first major economic decision Ghana took essentially was to go to the IMF in 1966, which also occasioned our first known debt restructuring. So even though we are in 20, we're in 2023 and talking about debt restructuring, Ghana has restructured our debt more than six times. The good news is that all of that have been largely external debt. And therefore, the domestic debt is the first time we are seeing something like this. So if you see what I have on the board here, they are not people's date of birth. These are, these are dates that Ghana went to the IMF and when we exited. In the late 80s, we went there twice in a single year. In all of them, you will see debt, public debt unsustainability. And in all the IMF program objectives, since 1966 to the latest one, which was approved on May 17th for the 17th IMF program, again, has debt sustainability as one of the objectives. Even though the concept of public debt sustainability came into the discussion from the late 80s, you can see that public debt has been an issue over the years since independence. It looks as though it was part of the handing over note from our colonial master. When you do the, 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 the variance analysis of the drivers of the debt, Professor Fusu has spoken largely about that. You will see the primary deficits, which Professor Fusu spoke about, largely leading the, the drivers of the public debt. Then you can also talk about the exchange rates. So the depreciation of the CD manifests explicitly in public debt formation. So for instance, in 2019 alone, the depreciation added more than 12 billion CDs to the debt stock. And then actually our debt stock went up by more than 15% in 2022, simply because there was a run on the CD. So these are the two major drivers of the, of the, of the public debt. The primary deficits, of course, the fiscal unsustainability is intricately linked to debt unsustainability. So Professor Fuzu has spoken about that. Then the exchange rates. So if you want to manage your public debt, then you should be also, you should be thinking about maintaining a stable exchange rate because of the composition of our debt stock. We have commercial external. So anytime we market to market, then the external debt, once the city depreciates, then it shows up in debt, uh, 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 public debt going up. So that is what we, we have seen in the literature. So the exchange rates and then also the primary deficit plays a key role. Then in terms of the deficit, Professor Fusu has spoken about that, so I can skip that. Then you will see the rate of borrowing after we're given a respite. So from 2010 to 2022, running to 20, yeah, 2022 largely, developing countries, including Ghana, has the rate at which they have borrowed from the market is actually higher than advanced countries. And then also you will see that, Bernard, as, as you said, you can see that right after HIPIC, and especially, when we wake up one day and then we said that Ghana, we have become rich simply because we use a different calculator called that one rebasing, right? We rebase the national account. That is a bit premature. That meant that we could be on our own, go to the international capital market, borrow and spend it the way we wanted to spend it. That was all. And that flat gate is what has brought us here. It wasn't only Ghana. You will see it running across a number of African countries. So it got to a point, in fact, from 2006, 2007, when Ghana did the first Euro bond, right after that, the most competitive league in the world was not the Premiership, was not La Liga. It was the road to the international capital market. So African governments go to the market, and then once they're able to mobilize 3 billion, more especially when it was highly oversubscribed, then they come here and tell us that this was confidence in our economy. But the yields played a role. And let's see how that played out. So we saw that with after HIPIC and the multilateral debt relief initiative, we saw bilateral debt coming down. We saw multilateral debt coming down. Then how did we explain the difference through commercial debt? And that doesn't come cheaply. So 
what is the price then? So going to the international capital market, you can see, I think throughout the, the conference, we've seen this a number of times. So you see that the average, weighted average interest score at which Germany borrows from the market is just 1.5%. US is 3.1%. Asia is 6.5%. Latin America is 7.7%. Africa, including Ghana, is 11.6%. So the interest rate or the coupon rate at which Africa borrows from the same market that U.S. borrows, Germany and the rest of them, is almost more than five times that of Germany, more than four times that of the U.S. But we know that the interest rate at which you borrow has implication for productivity growth. So one would have thought that for African countries that borrow at that higher interest cost would have invested it productively and, and sought higher for value for money. But that didn't happen. In fact, at some point, one country was having kinky party, okay, for, for that. Now, then we also need to look at the political economy of the debt accumulation. When, when Africa goes to China, usually because they don't do budgetary support, you need to submit a bankable project and the rest of them. The idea of moral hazard post-transaction used to be lower with a tra Chinese transaction because every loan China gives you typically the underlying projects and the rest of them, but guess what? And then the monitoring is very strict. But when African countries go to the Eurobond market, the Eurobond investors have no means of monitoring how those funds are actually what? Utilized. Okay, so they go do roadshow, present, we have 31 million people, in case of trouble, you can arrest all of them, they will pay. We have gold, we have this in the roadshow. And then they got them excited. And then when they take the money and they arrive, there are no post-transaction monitoring mechanism. Then check our laws. Our laws are stronger when it comes to the process of acquiring the loan. But the law is not that strong when it comes to post-acquisition monitoring mechanism. Okay, so once the money arrives, we have the leverage. Then you can also check the, the, the path from here to the international capital market and see the issue of the political economy, including ministers who have financial institutions who play a role in that value chain, right? So we need to look at all of that. Then, Bernard, quickly. So Professor Fosu spoke about the domestic debt. So we realized that in the case of Ghana, the domestic debt has been rising faster than the external debt. And more so, even though we have criticized the credit rating agencies and then also blamed the international financial market for our trouble, you will see that for Ghana, the domestic investors actually penalize the government for a higher risk than the external. So the weighted average interest cost at which Ghana was borrowing at the end of the day ended up to be higher for the domestic debt compared to what? The external debt. Then it got to a point by, by the middle of 2022, the domestic debt company was taking more than 50% of the total interest allocation cost at some point taking more than 60%. So what that means is that there was no way Ghana could restore their sustainability without restructuring the domestic debt. Unlike the case of Zambia and the rest of them, because if you look at Zambia with the external debt with China and the rest of them, in the case of Ghana, the fiscal cost imposed on the budgetary allocation was higher with, the, with respect to the domestic debt and therefore we needed to restructure the domestic debt. And of course, we needed to also do so as a testimony that we are willing to get the IMF supported program, right? So restructuring the domestic debt was a prior action, right, to, to getting the fund. Then when all these things started, of course, this was what happened. Ghana lost market assets effectively the third quarter of 2021. By that time, in the, in the secondary market, the spread in, with Ghana government bonds was trading in excess of 2,000 basis points. Okay, one basis point is 1% 1 of 100. So 2,000 basis points is more than 20%. So it means that if Ghana wanted to borrow at that rate, would have borrowed at 20% plus something else and means that that is certainly not unsustainable. So the proactive thing that Ghana should have done was that when we lost market assets in the third quarter of 2021, we should have reached out to the IMF. Okay, so the optimal time for Ghana to have reached out to the IMF was actually the third quarter of 2021. Failure to do so is what has brought us here this evening, probably. And the difference between Ghana and Kenya exiting COVID-19 was the fact that Kenya proactively reached out to the IMF in 2021 and got $3 billion, and Ghana chose E-Levy, which actually didn't work, and I'm happy it didn't work. So the first July call is what has brought us here. 
So first July call ensure that their sustainability has to be done. And Bernard, one of the things we have to also talk about is the general approach to accounting for our public debt. Until the IMF came to town, Ghana's public debt was a matter of public cho uh, multiple choice. The NDC had one figure. The Central Bank of Ghana had one figure. Ministry of Finance had another figure because there were some debt that were treated as off balance sheets. Even though all of this imposed fiscal costs, the cocoa board debt, Dachi, get fund and all of that. So when the IMF came to town and they shine light on all of that, our debt to public, our debt to GDP ratio went beyond 100%. Actually, it was 105%. That is what you see here. To GDP in present value terms, even though the difference is not that much because the IMF uses a discount rate of 5%. So the debt to GDP ratio in present value terms came to 105%. To get a facility from the IMF, your debt to GDP ratio in present value terms should not be more than 55%. And we're doing 105%. As at the end of September, between September ending and then December, with a run on the CD, the present value of debt to GDP ratio had gone to 112% of GDP. So that meant that we didn't qualify, right? So if your debt to GDP ratio is more than 100% and you want to re reduce it to 55%, then you should be doing a primary surplus of no less than 12% per annum. No other, no African country has been able to do that. In fact, to even deliver a primary surplus of 5% of GDP on an annual basis, the level of taxes and the fiscal adjustment you have to do will be unbearable. And that is how can we talk about the triangle. You are familiar with this already. So the way to do it is to look at fiscal adjustment, structural reform, Form and then debt restructuring. Fiscal adjustment did very small, and therefore the whole issue came to debt restructuring. This is how the distribution is done. So reducing it from 105% to 55% by 2028, fiscal adjustment through the budget was supposed to reduce the debt to GDP ratio in present value terms from 109.5% to about 81%. And then the domestic debt restructuring Oh, they want me to slow down because they are translating. Well, well, the truth is that we've, we've run out of time. Yes. So if you can come to a quick, slow close. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. In crisis moment, I struggle to keep my comfort. <laughs> Thank you. So you can see that the fiscal adjustment alone cannot bring the debt to a more sustainable level. Okay, so we can only bring it to about 81%. Then the domestic debt will also bring it from 81% to about 72%. From 72% to 55% must come from external debt restructuring. And that is why the IMF is saying that Ghana must push hard to make progress with the external debt restructuring. Thank you. So uh, way out, we've proposed some reasons here, uh, which also includes cutting down the size of government, but revenue reform. The, you are answering the questions yes. for the politicians. Yes. The last... That's yes. not right. No, no, no. I'll just, I'm, I'm just exiting. The last way of managing our public debt is this slide. All right. Solve the Galamse crisis. That is the biggest threat to Ghana's public debt sustainability. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, for, the, for those of you who are not familiar, so Galamse is illegal small-scale mining, and it happens in a number of regions. It affects gold output pollutes rivers, affects our ability to process water is a major uh, issue to give you some local context. So really the organizers wanted this to be the political panel, right? So, but the economists have taken half of the time, but it's good to have context because the way politics works in Ghana, if you don't have context, it can go anywhere. I I've gleaned five things from the two presentations. So I'll just summarize the five. Then I'll invite the politician
administrated territories that we now call Ghana, that delivered independence to Ghana in 1960, true independence. Um, but since, uh, I can certainly say since 2017, the CPP has had no representation in parliament. All right. Now, the good thing about that in these circumstances is that it means no CPP member of parliament has voted for any of the loans that, that got us into this mess. But uh, we, we, being out of power completely has given us the luxury of being able to rethink and to re-strategize um, because you know, in the first one man, one vote election in 1951, the CPP won 34 out of 38 legislative assembly seats. So we've gone from landslide to no representation. It's an opportunity for us to rethink everything. And we have that luxury, which admittedly the NPP and the NDC probably don't, um, to think freely. And so I want to modify the question slightly. Uh, I'm not going to try and answer the question, how do we get out of this crisis? I want us to look for a second at how come we have got into repeated crises, why this is a recurring phenomenon, why we're on the 18th uh, rescue um, plan with the IMF just since the 1980s. Um, uh, and the professors have actually saved me from having to speak in technical terms. So I wanted to talk in terms of ideas and policies and principles. And I want to take advantage of uh, a number of comments that I've heard. The one that struck me most forcefully was uh, Professor um, Jomo Kwame Sundaram yesterday, who highlighted the fact that the debt crisis, this is certainly true of Ghana, is as much, if not more, a political problem than an economic problem. So we, we uh, the professors have identified um, fiscal uh, uh, unsustainability, budget deficits, government spending more uh, on whatever than it collects in taxes. And they've also identified uh, currency depreciation. And I'm glad uh, a professor is here to say it because if I had said it, someone would have said I was lying. Since we abandoned the fixed exchange rate mechanism, we, the country, not, not my party, in 1983, December 19, sorry, December 1982, the city has lost a cumulative total of 99.998% of its value. So Professor Bopin, I'll give you another decimal place there. Um, that's got to be some kind of world record for a currency that has been so totally devalued as a matter of policy um, that has not simply been withdrawn from circulation. So those are, those are two uh, 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 pauses which have been cited. Uh, I, I would like to add another, which is a, a much bigger question, but what leads into it is uh, the, the other macroeconomic statistic, which is not mentioned by the professors, is that Ghana has essentially been trading at a loss. I use that phrase. What I mean is Ghana has recorded persistent trade deficits, did so for the best part of 50 years. It's only in recent years that we've begun to see small surpluses. But I'm not yet persuaded that Ghana has shifted from being a trade deficit country to being any kind of consistent trade surplus country. I think the surpluses are probably accounted for by oil receipts, which are still a fairly new phenomenon and which are not stable anyway. In fact, they are sort of at the risk of declining. Um, so budget governments not collecting, I don't want to say spending too much because that's a value judgment. Governments not collecting enough revenue to cover their proposed expenditure. Um, the, the fact that we have assumed that our currency must be allowed to just bounce around as it does. And the fact that um, how I see the trade issue is that, to be fair, Going way back to the beginning of this country's independent self-government, 
I don't think we have uh, asked and answered successfully or productively the question, how does Ghana earn its living in the world? What is it that, how do we intend to, to pay our way? Because sooner or later, trade deficits will show up as debt of one kind or another, if only via the currency depreciation uh, route. So that's a question that's outstanding. And I'll pause a moment before I, 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 I start giving prescriptions. Um, still looking at the background and as to how come we, are, we have experienced recurrent crises. Uh, the political question is important. I, I want to highlight a difference between two broad phases in Ghana's uh, history, uh, economic history. There's 1951 until I would say 1982. And then there's 1983 to the present. Although the CVV was ejected from power in 1966, uh, was re-elected the first time, re-elected to power the first time it was uh, uh, unbanned uh, uh, following a period of military rule, but under a different name, the People's National Party, but then was overthrown again two years later. Um, the Although that period of, what is it, um, 31 years, um, was a period during which Ghana experienced different types of regimes. We experienced uh, a, a parliamentary democracy under the CVP. We experienced a one-party state under the CPP. We experienced uh, a, a military government, transitional military government. We experienced uh, a, a parliamentary democracy under the predecessor of the NPP. Uh, for a few years. Then we experienced institutional military government yeah. for a good decade. All of those different configurations of political system did not really change the basis of the what I call the incremised consensus as to how we should run the country. And since there's limited time, I, I, I would have loved to say a bit more about what the Nkrumahist model of development consisted of, but it was based on the original principles that the party espoused at the time of its foundation. Anti-imperialism, in today's terms, that would be called black emancipation. Um, uh, Pan-Africanism, which again, in today's terms, would be African unity, or African integration. Um, and, um, well, in the old days, we just used to call it socialism. Uh, in practice, it manifests as a leading role for the state in development. And that's really, really important. Um, that is what has changed most dramatically since 1982. Uh, I, I would love to quote... Um, uh, text from, you know, some of you may know of the seven-year development plan, the foreword written by the chairman of the national, the planning commission at the time, the president himself, um, and, and contrast what it says uh, with, um, maybe I will in a minute, with what the 1993 constitution says, which more or less formalized and in some ways legitimized what had gone on since Ghana turned, uh, I, I should say, the, uh, the precursor of the NDC uh, administration, the PNDC, embraced uh, enthusiastically the neoliberal model is what we call it now. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I hope that will not be disputed uh, because otherwise... So are, those points are clear now. So what I wanted you to do, so not to hurry you, was to now give us in bullet points the way out. Well, the the, the way out uh, in, in the largest possible bullet of all is what we call a paradigm shift, a change of the development model. We are convinced that as long as um, governments led by the NPP and the NDC 
which are in total agreement uh, as to the neoliberal formula being the way to prosperity, the way to avoid, uh, uh, the way to development. We are the party that is on the other side of that. We, we take the opposite view. We think that at the root of the immediate economic causes of debt is the fact that the model that we are trying to apply will not work. For this country, under these circumstances, given its, uh, its gifts, its advantages, its liabilities, et cetera, et cetera, mm. it, would, it was not going to work. There was a, a vigorous debate at the time of the, uh, the, 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 the switch from uh, in the late 1970s and, and early 1980s, because we will be honest enough to admit it's not like the Nkrumahist consensus was without its own problems. Uh, as Professor Bopin has said, Ghana ran into a balance of payments crisis in 1965, another one in 1971, uh, all the while under governments that generally, whatever they said, accepted that development did not happen by accident. It required planning. Yeah. It required interventionism. Um, I also don't want to miss the opportunity to say something that I heard earlier on in the, the previous panel that encouraged me greatly. It allows me to fast track to an answer, a bullet point answer. So what's our alternative? Our alternative is we think that we should formally set aside the, the, the idea, the notion that development is synonymous with business and that simply promoting the growth of business, private business, and the accumulation of yeah. private wealth results in development. It does not, it's never done, it never will. Wow. Our alternative is now, um, I think helpfully, this is terminology that was not in use at some point in the past, but uh, I was very pleased to hear the in the presentation by Dr. Kujo and uh, Dr. Asante, um, a reference to the phrase developmental state. And since there's no time to go into great details, uh, that is the model that right. we would offer as the Wonderful. alternative. I only want to add that, uh, you know, we can't do these things by half measures. Mm. Um, uh, not all the prerequisites uh, are met in Ghana now for the Pabna um, Mensa. I, I don't want to summarize, you said a lot of things, but I think just for structure, I, I, I'd like to pick out what I've heard so that if we're wrong, you said a lot of things, but Profoundly, the debt crisis is more a political problem than an economic one. And then, yes, second point, you, you think that the fix, the floating exchange rate regime has not helped. It's worsened the situation. And then you have also spoken about ideological issues, anti-imperialism, pan-Africanism, socialism, and all of that. And then you give us three bullet points, a paradigm shift in the way we see the economy, and then you've also spoken about business progress is not necessarily economic progress. We shouldn't conflate the two. And then you agree with the developmental state. I'm sure I missed a couple other things, but thank you. So we are so behind time. So since he came last, and since he wasn't supposed to be on the panel, let me come to you. Since your party is in government, and you have nine months to election. Tell us what you do to bring us out of this mess. Thank you, Bernard. Um, it was instructive because um, the UGCC preceded a CPP. So I was thinking that I, in that scheme of things, I probably should have been the oldest political um, institution in Ghana. Um, having said that, I think we all agree that the debt situation today is a result of our physical policy over time. 
And for me, the fiscal policy has three components. It has its revenue bit, expenditure bit, and the deficit or surplus, which is a balancing act. So if we all agree that the problem is um, our fiscal policy, the attempt will be to address each of these three arms of the fiscal policy. Um, the New Patriotic Party, um, we've been in power since 2017. If you look at the situation before COVID and post COVID, um, it's not been too bad. As a, as a Ghanaian, I wouldn't be too proud of some of the figures we have churned out in recent times. But if you look at um, a year like 2019, we run a fiscal deficit of 4.8% of our GDP. Our economy was growing at about 6.5%. And we had a debt to GDP of about 58%. This, this, those figures, if you transpose them to the COVID year, and the post-COVID years, you will really feel the impact of COVID and what COVID has done to our economy. But you see, prior to COVID, there were attempts by government to address some of these problems. You recollect that in 2018, the Minister of Finance had gone to Parliament to pass an act, the Physical Responsibility Act. That act was supposed to peg our deficit every year at 5%. And if that 5% was exceeded, there were penalties for the finance minister. Unfortunately, unfortunately, when COVID hit, given the fiscal policy that we have been running, if you look at uh, the historical budgets that we've run in this country, we are spending maybe over 30% of our revenues to service our debts. Another, probably another 30% to pay public sector wages. And then the other component is transfers to statutory funds. After that, there is actually no space within our budget. And this is one of the drivers of the persistent deficits that we have been running in this country. So once we took a decision to enact a law that will peg the annual deficit at about 5%, no, at 5%, it meant that um, if we had gone down that route, I'm sure that would have had a hang on the problem. Um, one of the problems Professor Buckpin did diagnose is that uh, it's also the debt problem is also as much a political problem. And then the timing of our decision to engage the fund is also one of the problems uh, as to where we are. You recollect that the government in its attempt, the government had recognized that at a point we needed to shore up our revenues. Government had taken a policy to parliament to enhance our revenue generation. And in fact, it's, it's very obvious if you look at our revenue generation in Ghana, we, relative to our GDP, we are in the ranges of about 14, 15%. And the literature will tell you a country like South Africa is doing close to about 30%. And, and this gap, even within the sub-region, Ghana is not doing too well. It meant that we also had to look at our revenue handles and be able to show out our revenues. And when we show up our revenues and we have enough to spend then we won't be running into this deficit will require, which will require us to go borrowing. Also, prior to 2020, the government had made significant investments into our social um, um, policies. We have run a free senior high school policy for the first time in this country. Government also had had to contend with the cleanup of our financial sector which also cost us in the ranges of almost 22 billion Ghana cities. All of these things were very necessary expenses to keep the economy afloat. And so in, in every particular time in time, when you're in the saddle as a government, you have to deal with some of these issues. 
not to even mention our energy situation. We've also required to do significant investment. And today, we are having traces of uh, what we had a couple of years ago, which we all have been complaining about. And so our sector needs more investment, and the money will have to come from somewhere. It is proven that we cannot run this economy by running to uh, creditors every time to borrow to resolve our own issues. And some of the issues are so present that there is no way we could postpone them. As much as it was a political decision, government had a way, government had proposed something. Unfortunately for us, that policy, when it went to parliament, it dragged to close to six months and the economy could not wait. It resulted into a very, <laughs> a very chaotic 2022 where our city was depreciating and we had lost access to the euro market, which had been part of our traditional fiscal policy for a while. And our public debt was growing, even when government had not borrowed a dime. Just by the currency depreciating, the rate of um, <laughs> growth of the public fund was very worrying. And so government had to do something. All of this went into the decision to engage the fund on the, I think, 1st of July, 2022. Those are some of the things that uh, we are doing to resolve this. But then again, the, the, the arena has changed significantly. Either two countries had to deal with uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, and creditors. This time, we have two new additions, which is the euro market. Ghana has been on the euro market since 2007. And since then, um, every year when we had gone, we had gotten some foreign, ex foreign exchange to support our currency. We've gotten something to show out our reserves and also to refinance uh, our debt on the euro market. And so when we lost access to funding from the euro market, it was a, a big shift and a big surprise that we had to deal with within a short time. And so we had to turn back to domestic um, revenue mobilization to be able to yeah. seal the hole that was created. Much as it was a political decision, I um, mean, this country, if you had followed the news, were to, I wouldn't say proud, but we really wanted to explore all the options. And we thought the fund should be the last one. In any case, mm. Ghana has been to the fund 17, 18 times, and it's become a cycle. Right. which can also be linked to our political cycles. Is, Every... let, me, let me, sorry to interrupt. What, so what you've explained your approach, or you've explained how we got here. Revenue lower than our peers, expenditure, free SHS, and other spending necessary for social support. You've also spoken about the currency. I think what we want to hear is if we continue on this path, we come out? Because I think the, the question for the part two is how do we get out? So are you saying that the program that the IMF has uh, been running with us on its own will get us out? How soon? Or what do we need to do to get out? Because the IMF program seems like a cycle. So basically it's going to give us a reprieve for a couple of years and then we go back. So I think the value we want is, are you sure that this approach will bring us out? Or is this government doing what it believes will permanently solve the problem? I think that's what I want your part two in two minutes to address. What, what, what the government has said, I already mentioned the Fiscal Responsibility Act. That is also to put on ourselves a level of discipline to ensure that we spend within our means. And that is a game changer. We are imposing um, penalties on ourselves to ensure that our sp we remain within the, 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 the revenues that we are able to generate. Moving on, um, maybe there are a few other things that we can do as a people. One of the issues that uh, has been said time and again from yesterday is responsible borrowing and lending. And that is real. I had the privilege of being in parliament between 2017 and 2021 with Isaac Adongo uh, seated here on the panel. And um, as members of parliament, we had the responsibility to approve all international transactions. This is constitutional. 
but sometimes the way this it's it's not unique to the government of the new patriotic party thankfully parliament itself is finding a resolution to this problem by introducing new ways of going by some of this approval by creating new committees ensuring that they have the capacity and the right um, um, evaluation is done before some of this approval and post post approval uh, monitoring of some of these um, uh, facilities when they are approved by parliament. So these are some of the things that we can do as a people. As to the lenders, I think that um, we always tell a story. And no matter how difficult our situation is, we can always find some light within it, sell it out. And for any lender who is interested, um, they, will, they will find a way to lend to us. So in our own way, we need to bring that discipline, spend within our means. Wonderful. Thank you, Pochansi Gadda, for Isa Fuseni, former member of parliament for Okain Kwe North. 2017, 2021. So I'll give the last word for this round to you. And thank you for agreeing to do this, even though you were not given the prior notice. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, as a member of parliament, I'm paid to talk. So <laughs> uh, I, I think the presentations were were spot on. Uh, as a member of the, the National Democratic Congress, we are watching very closely uh, how our debt restructuring program and its concomitant uh, rollout of the IMF program would define for the future of our country. But we are quite certain that uh, we need to have a handle on the productive capacity of our country. We think that we must be able to address the infrastructure bottlenecks that are making our businessmen and productive units uncompetitive. So we will seek to eliminate most of that. Uh, we would seek to ensure that we give the opportunity for economic units to be very active in generating growth, employment, and jobs, as well as incomes for our people. But we want to do that within three key uh, what do you call it, thematic areas. We want to do that by ensuring that we are fiscally responsible and sustainable. We want to do that by ensuring that our activities address the external vulnerabilities of our country. But we want to do that also by ensuring that our debt is sustainable and responsible. If you take fiscal responsibility, everybody who is watched our fiscal space would realize that we need very important reforms. We pretend to budget, but we have very serious budget credibility. Uh, revenues are just optimistically stated, very high revenues. Uh, expenditures are stated very low. We show very artificially modest deficit numbered and primary balance. But the end year results show that we didn't even have a budget in the first place. We want to be able to nip that in the bud. And we want to be able to do that by major reforms in both the legal and regulatory environment in order to anchor budget credibility. The era where you just have to tell Ghanaians what they want to hear and after they have given you the approval, you go and spend as though you are the master of all, will be long gone. So fiscal sustainability will be very key. We have to try and improve revenue generation. And we try to find very innovative ways to generate the revenue. We believe that we have imposed too many tax handles on our people and that there is a lot of opportunity to maximize the yield from the current tax handles. And we think that technology will play a very key role. So we would like to digitalize and provide transformation in the way that we administer taxes, simplify the tax regime, make sure that the tax regime are affordable, but then to encourage people to pay their taxes. 
But we also want to ensure that we are a lot more transparent in working with Ghanaians to identify the areas where we should spend their money and be very accountable to them in the expenditure framework. So that will be with the fiscal side. External vulnerability. We've been talking a lot about our exchange rates. We've been talking a lot about our debt. But we all know that debts reflect in external vulnerability. Uh, anybody who has looked at our numbers will know that by 2019, we were spending almost 91% of our tax revenue, okay, just to service debt. 50% of that debt were sitting on foreign books. You cannot externalize cities if you don't have the forex. Even if we are granted the permission to print currency at the Bank of Ghana, we can only print cities. So we need to be very cautious about that. And that is why we think that in trying to improve productive capacity, we must have a handle on external vulnerability. Deal with the debt sustainability. I'll come to that. But let me give you one key area. If you look at inflation in Ghana, okay, about 40% of this is driven by food. If you look at exchange rate uh, depreciation, about 40, 50% of that is driven by food. What does that tell you? You put your money where your mouth is. Agriculture, 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 and agro processing will help address the external vulnerability. And we are going to be very deliberate about it. We are not going to leave that to, to chance we would be very deliberate about it. Now, debt sustainability. If you remember, in 2019, he was in parliament. They had exhausted every single avenue of borrowing in our country and outside. Then they started, that was the first time I heard that there was a, a bond called Panda Bond. They brought Panda Bond. They went to China looking to issue Panda Bonds. You remember you had Sumerai born, Samurai born, these people, Kangaroo born, these people. And our vice president landed in China and came back with a jackpot of $15 billion. You remember that? That is irresponsibility. I mean, and so we've, how we, we've identified how that because of time. our whole uh, arrangement for managing our public debt is flawed. Uh, for instance, you cannot go to the capital market and borrow money and put it into a basket. You do not know where that money is going. It is in the basket. When the people are crying for salary, you go and fetch and give it to them. When the people are crying for stationery, you go and pick it and give it to them. No. We will bring serious reforms to anchor how public debt is accrued and be able to track where it goes we would find very efficient ways of delivering public services. We have come to understand that the central government is not efficient in delivering infrastructure. And so we will empower agencies such as the Ghana Infrastructure Fund, EMAC specific funds, so that when we are going to the market, we know we are borrowing for an agency that has a bankable project right. that we can trace. Thank you. We would want to bring back to Ghana the reforms that will anchor irreversibility for so many years to come. Thank you. Let's put our together for Isaac Adongo. Thank you so much. And sorry, I'm hiring you. That, that we were very ambitious with the program, but luckily we have Mr. Kwame Pienim, who's been an economist for many years. He will, uh, Mr. Kwame, if you can come to the the stage, give me the mic. So you 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 summarize for us and give us the way forward. Unfortunately, in just five minutes. But thank you. Put your hands up, Mr. Kwame Pienim. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, let me thank Ideas for this timely conference and for bringing and for bringing high-powered thinkers about foreign debt crisis to Ghana. Because any problem, once you are discussing it, that is 50% of the solution. Debt 
is not a flu. You don't catch it. It is a deliberate action that you take and say, I'm going to borrow money to build a bridge. I'm going to borrow money to sort out the problem that I, I have. And I'd like to uh, continue from where the NDC representative left off. When we went to the Eurobond in 2007, the idea was to create a risk-free sovereign debt for Ghana so that if the Ghana government was borrowing on euro bonds for say 3%, then we know that the big companies in Ghana could go and then you add the risk adjusted interest rate for them to pay. Then the low domestic savings of about 15% below will be left for the small scale Ghanaian businesses to use to transform the economy. So if we are borrowing, we should be borrowing to reduce our external vulnerabilities. Somebody said we inherited our debt from the colonial powers. It isn't so. Ghana became independent with a lot of reserves. That's what we use to fight for independence for other African countries. So we started with a lot of reserves. The borrowing that we are doing in 2007 was not to create another avenue for the public to spend on salaries and for garbage collection. It was that we were opening up that avenue for the companies to go and borrow. And at the public sector, we've always had this structural imbalance between expenditure and revenue. And anybody who tells you that the Ghana problem can be resolved by increasing revenue is not thinking correctly. It's expenditure we have to take a look at and decide. We also have to rethink the public sector. What responsibility do we want the government to assume? Education, health, feeding ourselves. If we have put some of the money in agriculture, Ukraine, Russia, and war should have nothing to do with us. Except for people like me who eat bread for breakfast. Most Ghanaians don't need bread. It's kinky maize and a little bit of fish and pepper. So I think what I heard is that we defined the problem. We've been talking here about collective arrangements for facing the creditors once we get there. Nobody in parliament ever as the Minister for Finance, when he comes and says, oh, I was looking for half a billion. They gave me 1.5 billion and I took it with a matter of pride. What are you going to use the money for? Let's go back to practical economics. When you are going to borrow, use your revenue, your tax revenue, the grants that you get from others to look after your security, health, education, and paying your salaries and wages. And then for transforming your economy to reduce your external vulnerabilities, agricultural transformation, value addition, industrialization, power generation. These are the things that we have to use loans for, not for current expenditure. Any head of family who goes to borrow for chop money today is sinking the family into debt. But if you borrow to create assets, then that's where you are going. So all of us, and I'm happy that we have parliamentarians, we are politicians and academics. And you academics, make your research to as an input into political decision-making. Invariably, you sit behind 
and then later on you are coming uh, to criticize instead of being an input. When did anybody at the universities ever point out that the, the risk that these lenders are adding to us, 11% for Africa because we live in a bad environment. Is it fair? And then we should be telling our people, it is not, if you say that it is due to indiscipline, that's why you got into this debt. Why should anybody support you? But if you say that there are other external factors that have always bedeviled us, COVID, we didn't bring it, the financial crisis, we didn't bring it. Did anybody compensate Africa for the financial crisis of Europe and the US? So let us get together, not as political parties, as a country collective. And then from there, we do the African collaboration, collaborate with our friends from Latin America, Asia, and then be able to say, if we are going to get access to the capital market, it has to be fair. The risk that they are to us has to be fair. We, we started one, uh, uh, one of these uh, credit rating companies, and then it was bought over. Why? And also we talk about domestic, raising money internally. Insurance premiums are the best for infrastructure development. We are raising in Africa probably less than 2% of GDP. If we can improve it to 3%, other countries are doing 6%. That's a lot of capital for development, which means that we should own our insurance company, not use insurance companies from outside who then expatriate these long-term savings that we need for uh, developing ourselves. So basically, let's get together to fight the creditors. We can fight among ourselves, but only to make sure that when we borrow, we are allowed to borrow at a fair risk adjusted rate of uh, interest. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, sir. I think that's a befitting close for a very long day. Please do better for Mr. Kwame Pianim. We really appreciate the way you've ended. Two quick announcements. We are so happy you stayed to the end. And we want to announce that to help you unwind, we have a fantastic cocktail reception and music by the all-female lipstick queens. That's happening at the Ghana Village right after here. We really want you to join us for that. Cocktail reception by the all-female lipstick queens at the Ghana Village right after here. We also want to remind you that tomorrow's sessions start at 9 a.m. here in this building. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you for joining us for day two. We'll see you next time. My name is Ben Aravla, your moderator. Thank you for being with us. Bye-bye. I'm not going to